Hey, how you doing, everybody? This is me, Waddles, and welcome to the Minecraft Guide Movie, Part 2. Look, look, I'll admit it, I never meant for it to be such a long hiatus in between Movie Part 1 and Part 2, but it is what it is. Part 2 of the movie picks up where we left off in the last part. We'll start out with some easy farms and end up finishing the entire starter base forever. If you end up enjoying this movie and you want more of the series, great news. I've got even more episodes out for you right now, including a bunch of episodes at a brand new base. So check out the playlist next, and patrons get early access to every episode, channel members get world downloads, and now friends, it's about time you grab your favorite cup of tea, your best coziest chairs, and back and relax. Minecraft Guide the Movie, Part 2. Let's do this. Attention, channel, members, there is a world download out for this world right now. More on that later in this episode. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Minecraft Guide. In today's episode, we're going to progress the world even more with some simple farms that we, we kind of overlooked here. Each and every one of the four farms we're going to build today is a farm I recommend you build in your world, too. Ah, <sighs> the beautiful morning back inside of the Minecraft Guide world. Oh, it feels good. In today's guide episode, right at the beginning, I got a, I got a question for you. While we wander around in the forest and inconspicuously look for any single blade of grass, oh my god, where did all the grass go? <laughs> I want to collect some seeds. I don't want to break the beautiful ferns. I can't get them back. There's no grass. What? Anyways, this is now episode number 10. Earlier on in the series, if you remember, we set a goal to take on the dragon by episode 25. But there's like a lot of beautiful new things. Genuinely, friends, I'm, I'm wondering what you're thinking here. Would it be cool with you if we push the dragon go back so we could check out some of the new stuff, like sniff for trail ruins and maybe even more? Or other options, should we still focus on the dragon nice and early and then maybe do, like, all that cool new stuff later on? Let me know what you think down below, and at dawn, our farm extravaganza begins. All right, guys, you're probably wondering why I'm not looking you in the eyes directly right now, and uh, it's because I'm embarrassed. I'm, I'm really sorry. A topic, farming, a basic farming. Yes, a topic that we have not talked about at all <laughs> in the Minecraft Guide. Whoops. The Minecraft Guide series is a series all about Minecraft. It's a series all about tips, tricks, cool adventures, nice lore, and even more. And I, I skipped over, like, the ultimate basic thing. Farm. Now, to my credit, we do have this beautiful, wonderful farm that I think is way better early game. But still, admittedly, probably not the best look. Let's rewind a little bit and talk about some basic farming. First things first, we're going to want to pick a spot for our brand new, wonderful, kind of improved farm. I was thinking maybe, like, we got the starter cabin right over there. Maybe we set a small farm over here. Look, it's not going to be much, but it'll be something. We set a small farm up over here. What we're going to do is we're going to go two, then we're going to go one right there, then we're going to go two more right there. Then this is going to be the very corner of my farm. Then I, I, I think to maybe give this farm a little bit of breathing room, we'll do a little bit more terraforming. Little side note here, as I continue to add more and more builds to World Swan, I get more and more attached to this place. Ah, the end goal was never to live over at World Spawn. I want to move out and find something more beautiful later on, but <laughs> I'm getting way too attached. Somebody stop now you're all Minecraft veterans around here, I'm sure you know, but just in case you're that one brand new person, we're going to pick a spot for the farm. We're going to go ahead and build a nice outline for the farm, but uh, technically you don't have to do this. You can just throw the farm right in the ground. With our quaintly beautiful little starter box set up over here, and a tiny bit of terraforming done right in front of it, we're basically good to go. I'm going to move inside of this farm and start filling it back in with a little bit of extra dirt. After you pick a spot for your starter farm, you're going to want to make sure you have the right kind of blocks around here. Right kind of blocks, 100% of the time, it's going to be dirt. For a basic food farm, if I use a hoe on sand, I get nothing. But that would be really cool, wouldn't it? And once you have dirt, you're going to need a little bit of water near the dirt. Specifically within four blocks of the block of dirt that you're going to farm on. So like that block, definitely within four. That block, within four as well. But all the way over here, this one, if I till this. Well, terrible news. If I till this block all the way over here, it's always going to stay light. And actually then break. When you're farming, if you have a farmland block that is staying light, that means it's not close enough to the water. And eventually it's going to decay. And after that, you're going to pick your favorite seed of choice and then just plant the seeds. After you plant the seeds on the soil, as long as they're hydrated, it's basically good to go. At this point, all it is is a waiting game. There's nothing that I can do. The different crops are going to go through different growth stages. Right now, I'm trying to grow a little bit of wheat for today's episode. 
Now two uh, slightly more advanced farming pro tips for you. Your crops are gonna grow a little bit faster if you plant them in lines. Your crops will also grow a little bit faster if you give them a decent supply of light. Without enough light, your crops will not grow or even on life. Farm number one, check done. All I need to do at this point is wait around. Enjoy. Okay, you know what? On second thought, maybe that's kind of boring. I got a better idea. It was but a couple episodes ago. A very pressing matter entered into play dramatically. Our friend right over here. It needs a name. I did something that I thought was really fun. I always love to see the ideas, and now the results are in. The number one winner name, this camel's name, for the rest of the series, forever, is Camelotl. <laughs> Camelotl. Oh my god, Camelotl. I would have never thought of that. This is beautiful. I would have thought like Jim, uh, did Tom. Mark or something, but Camelotl is beautiful. With like 500 likes at the time of recording this episode, Camelotl is the winning comment. To oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What do we have here? We have a visitor. Oh, it's a day of first, first farm, first camel name, and even a first raider. Hmm, pillager, pillager, what are you doing here? Hey, you want to leave me alone? You want to not embarrass me right in front of my house? You gotta get out of here. No. Why was there a pillager here? Hmm, good question. And to maybe, actually more importantly, they're looking like Abraham Lincoln here. Where was the, oh, you're over there. Where are the other patrollers? <laughs> My friends, you better be careful. Your friend is right behind you. Oh no. In Minecraft, on any difficulty that is not peaceful, give it a little bit of time and some pillagers, some patrollers will patrol your world and come visit you, seeping your health away. This little uh, situation, the visitors that we have going on here, this is called a patrol. A patrol consists of some evil, dehydrated, villager-like mobs called pillagers. And typically, there will be like three to four pillagers, including a pillager with a banner on its head. And that's the one I can't find. All of the pillagers are a problem, but the pillager with the banner on its head, that's called the pillager captain. It'll give you an effect for a raid. These patrols will usually spawn within a couple chunks of you and walk around, usually towards your direction. If you're busy, like you go inside or something, then they can walk right past you. They didn't even see you. But but if you're outside under the great blue and the yellow square in the middle of it, they could have wander up to your project, your farm or something, and find you. I can't find the, the captain anywhere. That means we definitely have a pillager just wandering around somewhere. <laughs> uh, hi, that's great. I feel so comfortable. Anyways, I was going to say, before we were so rudely interrupted, the runner-up names, Nuts and at, -AT or All-Terrain, Awesome Transport. Oh, those are some beautiful names. Thank you all so much. So my farm currently is still set up, ready to go. I've been near the farm, so it is slowly growing, but the problem is here, uh, slowly. The farm is slowly growing. We can see over here, we have a piece of wheat that is getting close here, but it's not quite there. By taking a slab and dropping it in the water right there and then placing a composter on that slab. Because there's a slab inside of the water, the composter won't go into the water. Instead, it'll sit right on top of the water. In the composter, I can throw something like sweet berries right here. If I throw enough sweet berries inside of the composter, eventually, it will fill up all the way, just like that. Then I can harvest it for bone meal. If we're tight for time, we can use bone meal to speed up the farm. If this farm right here is on growth stage number one, like it's just getting started. After that, it'll grow up to that stage right there. After that stage, I believe it's this stage, then we have this stage, and then finally, if I bone meal this, we get a final product right there. When your wheat is golden, it's ready to be harvested. To harvest it, all you need to do is hit it. You'll get a piece of wheat and you'll get some seeds. It's smart to replant the seeds and then we'll go and get some more sweet berries. Bone meal time. <laughs> Just like that, two pieces of wheat done, cooked up and ready to go. And almost a third one. And now that we have two pieces of wheat inside of our inventory, we can move on to the next step and that's gonna be mobs sweet mobs one final tip that i got for you before you wander off and collect mobs bring them back to your house is consider where you're going to actually be locating those mobs what kind of situation do you want to have them in i think for this first mob that we're going to find correction i know for this first mob that we're going to find here and bring back over to home sweet home i want a pen built out of fences and fence gates i would like a pen built out of fences and fence gates and before i can do any of that my friend tree chopples has made his way into this episode
And well, 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 would you take a look at that? Just as I rejoined my world after kicking Tree Chobbles out, the farm is ready to go again. Now that our first two rows of the farm are fully filled up and we have a little bit of wheat, we're going to expand the farm by planting just next to it. Technically speaking, these crops will grow a little bit slower, but it's not that big of a deal. It's not that noticeable. Now, I'm going to be honest with you here. I don't judge me too much, but I kind of don't know what I want to do with this farm. I, I mean, I know that I want to have like a basic pen square here, but I, I couldn't decide where I want to position it. I was thinking maybe over here next to the farm because, you know, farm and farm. But then I was also thinking maybe expand and put it under the beautiful cherry tree, a little romantic. I might just have to add more cherry trees around the base. Should I do it? You dare me? Animal pen, animal pen. For this animal pen, because there are mobs out there in the wild that do not like this animal, we're going to want to make sure we don't have any blocks immediately next to it where something could jump over. I think this gap should be fine. And typically, mobs will not pathfind like that. Only me. Goodbye, sweet cave that I feel emotionally attached to because I found my very first piece of lava inside of that cave. You will be dearly missed. Goodbye. So we had to talk a little bit about some basic food farms, specifically wheat, because if we want to go out into the world and bring some friends back home with us, specifically sheep. If I want to go out into the world to find mobs to bring back home with me, sheep, cow, chicken, oh my. If I want to give these mobs a much better life, then I gotta have to find the food that these mobs like. In Minecraft, almost every single mob, at least passive mobs, have a food that is called their tempting food. For the sheep and for the cow, it's going to be wheat, which means whenever you hold a piece of wheat in your hand, if you get close enough to these mobs and hold their attention, or in other words, stay close enough to them, they will lock onto you and follow you. On Java, this is even going to work if it's on the offhand too. It's pretty amazing. That means we can throw the wheat in our offhand and free up our main hand for like making a path or something like that, maybe placing torches or maybe even eating. Now, every single mob in this wonderful game is going to be different. For example, if I hold wheat over here, our friend, the Camelette, does not care. It just buries its head in the dirt, in fact. It doesn't like wheat. I think this one wants, like, cactus instead. Anyways, mob, 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 you're gonna wander with me all the way back over to here. Now, uh, mobs, they're interesting in Minecraft. Some mobs can despawn if they're not contained properly. To properly contain the sheep over here... Oh, man, it's raining. Is that a bad omen? Are you bad luck for my base? Oh, no. To properly contain a sheep, we're going to go ahead and locate it inside of a relatively small pen. Once that sheep over there is inside of that small pen, it's safe from despawning. It can't wander off and go away forever. But what if you want to keep a mob, but you don't have the item that you need to be able to, like, make sure it doesn't despawn or move around or anything like that? Well, my friend, then we got boats. Boats are one of the most powerful things in the game. Not only can you use them to explore early on, like we talked all about, but you can put almost any mob. Typically, the rule here is if the mob is smaller than the boat, it can go inside of it. Now, there are some exceptions, like, for example, the panda. But yeah, usually if a mob is smaller than the boat, it can go inside of the boat. Then you don't even need that tempting food, item, thing, whatever it is to move the mob. Just get in the boat and move the boat. Or leave the boat down. If I were to have found this sheep and I wanted to make sure it didn't go anywhere too far, didn't despawn or anything like that, I could have just dropped the boat down right next to it, like this right here, move the mob into the boat, and then leave it in the boat. If a mob is in a boat, almost any mob in the game, then it will never despawn, no matter how far you get away from it. Anyways, back to the wonderful new friend, the sheep. Sheep, sheep, you're gonna follow me. I got a wonderful friend for you over here from a foreign distant land. You two are going to live the most happy, romantic, and joyful life together. You're gonna live free, you're gonna roam free, and you're gonna eat lots and lots of grass. When farming sheep, the number one thing to have is grass for these things. If you have grass block inside of a sheep pen, then the sheep can regrow its wool. Sheep can regrow its wool. It's something I think we maybe talked about a little bit, but with a pair of shears, we can go ahead and snip the wool off the sheep. When the sheep's body looks like this, or on bedrock edition, the speckles are colored if it's dyed. Well, when a body looks like that, it is completely useless to us. All it'll do is walk around, look cross-eyed, and make noise. We gotta wait for it to regrow. And wait for it to regrow? You did it! I'm so proud of you. Every single time, a sheep eats a grass block, and unfortunately, there's no way to force it to do it. But every time it eats a piece of grass, the grass turns into dirt, and the wool regrows. It's kind of funny, because the sheep is one of the oldest mobs in Minecraft. Like, it's been here for a long time, but it's kind of actually a relatively complex mechanic. But the cow doesn't do this, it's just cross sign. Now, just like it is for our farm over here, it's all a waiting game. The sheep is going to wander around aimlessly until eventually it's going to decide to eat again. Now, once our sheep friend has decided they've had enough, they want their wool back. They will eat the ground, the wool will regrow, and then they're ready to go. When we use a pair of shears on a sheep, we'll get anywhere from one to three pieces of wool. 
every single time. So those are sheep. We'll come back to them in a minute, but now it's time to move on. To move on, we'll harvest this farm, replant one seed, but make sure we keep some seeds. Next up, it's time for the chicken. Ah, uh, chicken, chicken. I remember seeing a chicken inside of this wonderful world that you can now officially download somewhere over here. Channel members, legend tier and higher, there is a world download for this very world out right now. I think my long-term plan here for this world is to try and frequently release world downloads. It's episode number 10 right now, which means in the world download, like the newest one, there is going to be every single thing that we did in today's episode. It's going to be up to date as to now. Chicken, chicken, oh my gosh, there's so many chickens. I did not expect such a party. Uh, I need only one of you right now. I'll come back for the other in a minute. You're with me. To check out a world download for this world, if you're interested, as soon as you become a channel member, check out the member tab of this channel. There will be a link to the download right over there. Drop our humble little world into your Minecraft folder, and then you should be basically good to go. Chicken, chicken, oh, chicken, where did you go? Oh, going for a bath in the sauna. I see, I see. Well, actually, go for a bath inside of my... No, go for a bath, in, bath inside of my boat. By the way, to tempt a chicken around, it's seeds. Instead of wheat this time, it's like just a straight up... It's like just a straight up thing that actually makes the seeds. Chicken are another absolutely amazing mob to farm early game for a couple different reasons. Now, believe it or not, I kind of can't believe it, but it's actually redstone time. It's time we make our very first redstone related thing in the world, a hopper. Now I got a warning here. This chicken farm, look, it's really not gonna be much. This will not be the most beautiful thing in the world. In fact, this is gonna be the ugliest thing in our entire world. Oh, no way. <laughs> oh, no way. I imported two exotic chickens. They're over at the beach right now, but there's another one just standing over here. What? You should have told me you're just here. Uh, anyways, this is gonna be the ugliest build in the entire world. I'm not even gonna try and hide it or trick you. It's, it's not gonna be pretty looking, but it will work and it's gonna be so easy too. To get this little thing started here, we're gonna put a hopper in the ground and put a chest going into it. We're gonna build two blocks up all around it, then we're gonna find a chicken, maybe nearby, maybe far away. We're gonna carefully push that chicken into this thing. With two blocks up high like that, that chicken's not gonna go anywhere. It's trapped forever. After that, back over at the beach with the seeds in the offhand, we go ahead and open this book for you, chicken friend, and open this boat for you, chicken friend. Now, chicken friend, chicken friend, you follow me, both of you. You fly, you fly. Yes, yes, come this way. Chicken are great for their food that they produce, but also the eggs. You could use the eggs in a couple different crafting recipes to make other foods. Also, another wonderful drop that the chicken has, I always forget about it, is the feather. If you wanted to, you can harvest the chicken for their feathers. This little farm that we're going to build over here with a chest and a hopper and a couple of chickens. Well, this little thing right here is going to get us eggs fully automatically. That's the number one thing I'm worried about from the chicken right now. So check this out. With one chicken or two chicken inside of this thing, we'll feed one of you a seed, feed you a seed, and you're going to jump right in nice and easy. Then they look at each other. They breed. That's the first mob we bred. There's a new baby chicken in there. And also, over time, the chicken will lay the egg because we have a hopper right there, an item that, by the way, picks up anything that lands on top of it. It will automatically move those things into the chest. Well, just like that, just like that. The chicken lays an egg and, and it picks it up. Now we have free, easy, automatic eggs. And another one. Wow, it, it's going crazy. Now, another way to get chicken, if you could only find one, is you could take eggs and throw the egg. When you throw an egg, the egg has a chance to spawn a baby chicken. No luck there. Now, just like that farm, there are mobs out there that don't like the chicken and it'll take it out. So to make it nice and safe, we'll put a trap door in and then break that. Now, anytime I want to add eggs to it, I open the trap door and throw chicken in. No big deal. Tell me this thing is so beautiful, please. And so finally, here we are. Weed farm going crazy. Two other mob farms set up and good to go. For today's basic mob farming extravaganza, there is one final mob that we need to get to. But there's no chance that I can do this next mob so dirty and make something horrendous like that. See, I'm thinking it's sad because this mob is a very, very special mob to me. Very important, especially later on in the world. We will give this mob a little bit more of a luxurious life with a small little gazebo. All right, so it's not much, so don't judge it too harshly, but it's a small gazebo right in the middle of the situation that we got going on here. Starter house, farms, little smeltery. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's small, but it'll do the job perfectly. If you know me, then you know this next farm oh, is one of my classics. This is one of my favorite farms of all time, and absolutely, 100%, it's a must-have titan. So look, 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 all you're going to need to build this farm is one more hopper, a chest, uh, some stairs, and then some building blocks. 
Pick a spot for your farm. This mod could literally be anywhere in the world. Then we're gonna dig down to the ground. We're gonna put a chest right there. Then we're gonna slap a hopper, like, practically right on top of it. Oh, like that. It's beautiful. Now it's time for some solid building blocks. We're gonna go ahead and start filling this thing in and also building it up a little bit. On second thought, I think I want this corner to be a little bit lower, so we'll chop that out. We'll go ahead and fill that in, fill that in. Now we're gonna need a combination of stairs. On Java, if we place a stair above a chest, we can still open a chest. It's magic. Then I was thinking, just to make sure my gazebo feels consistent and whole here, I'll fill that in with uh, planks, and I'll leave it open like that. So anytime I want to access the chest, I just, like, jump right up here and open the chest. Next up, to basically finish this farm, we're gonna put another block right there. We're gonna jump up here and drop some water inside of the farm. Now, my friends, this mob time. Hey, and you know what? Actually, 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 uh, let me make some small adjustments aesthetically. There we go. That looks a little bit better. Take it a step back from this thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It should be different than the rest of the build. Anyways, this mob time. I don't know about you, but look, I've been, I've been feeling a little bit lonely in this world. And we live by like a bunch of forests. I should be able to find this mob in any of the forests. Uh-huh, uh-huh, another sheep. Oh, you're beautiful. You gotta watch out for what I'm looking for. You gotta be careful. A chicken, oh my. A chicken, oh my. They're all over the place, every mob, except what I'm needing. There is one mob, a very loyal, trusty mob. The mob that will make your world feel a million times less lonely. A mob that hates basically everything we've been talking about today. It'll spawn in all these forest bombs. Sometimes. Terrible news, always sad, it's all black and white. I've scavenged, scoured the entire forest or what feels like it and not a single one of my friends that I was looking for. But great news, there are cows all over the place and the cow is what I need for today. You come with me, you're tempted with wheat. Oh, well, 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 look who's coming out of every single tree, apparently. I have more cows. I brought a cow back in a, in a boat. I mean, I guess the more the merrier. I really only needed two though. <laughs> you all come with me. Let's go. Ah, yeah, well, that lost one. This guy I got probably got too far. Two is fine. Back over at home sweet home with these two cows. It's time to put them inside of the farm. Now, this wonderful farm right here, the cow crusher, is one of my favorites. I like to make this in every single world. This farm relies off of a mechanic called entity cramming. Entity crushing. Oh, no, you're supposed to jump in. Yeah, you know what? Let me just, uh, no. Yeah, I don't want the milk. I don't want the milk. Let me please just get the, uh, no, I don't want the milk. No. Yeah, you know what? Fine, fine. One wild cow does fine. It, it's cool. Now we put a fence on top of the farm, and it's basically good to go. This little beauty right here, the cow crusher, it's amazing. This works off of a mechanic called entity cramming. Essentially, when we have more than 24 entities, or in other words, mobs, basically, inside of a block, the game will automatically take some out. This thing will take a while to get started up, but I'll repeatedly breed the cows. Eventually, there'll be so many cows that they'll just be crushed out of the world. The drops will be thrown into this bottom spot right here. Unfortunately, this one is Java only. The Cow Crusher is an absolutely beautiful contraption that I'll show you exactly how it works once I get it up and running. For now, to get this thing actually ready to go, I'm just gonna have to repeatedly, continuously breed these cows. When it comes to breeding mobs, when you breed two, you're gonna get one baby. If you continue this process, breeding mobs up as your farm expands and expands and expands, well, of course, logically, that process will only get faster. When starting up any mob-based mob farm, whether it be sheep, whether it's chicken, whether it's cows, this process will always start out a little bit slow, but as you get more mobs, it'll pick up. Now, there are two final things I'd like to get done in today's episode. Camelotl, you're gonna move with me. Now that we have a little bit more going on at the base over here, I would like to move the camel into a, a better temporary pen. We're gonna put it right over here inside of the fences. Oh, you know what? I forgot about that because the camel is so tall. It'll just walk right over the fence. Aw, oh, dang it. All right, well, change of plans. If I walk you into this and you got a hole now, I <laughs> try and get out of that camel model. Bad camel, behave. Last and not least, I got a tree growing hack for you. Now that I kind of know what I have going on over here and what's going to actually stay where I have buildings, I want to come back in and fill it in with some nice tall trees. Let's say I wanted a tall tree sitting right there in the middle. To get a nice tall tree, you're going to start with an oak sapling. You're going to pillar up with two random blocks, doesn't matter. Then we're going to take some cobblestone and build a small brace. Then we remove these temporary blocks and give it a little bit of time. If you pay close attention to what I did when I was building the sweet berry farm, then you would know that I did this right along the river. I like the tall, beautiful, giant oak trees. I feel like they fit with builds a whole lot better. It won't work every single time, but it's a better method than just planting a sapling down and hoping it grows into something big. By planting a couple of these trees over here and putting the braces, hopefully eventually, like a couple episodes time, we'll come back and have more mobs than ever because I keep breeding them and also more tall trees than ever too.
To show it off for you a little bit, right over here is exactly what I'm talking about. Check this out. This brace, it finally grew after a lot of time. But I planted a sapling, put that brace right there, and then we get this beautiful giant oak tree. These tall trees right along the river right here next to the beautiful merch stand. Berry merch out now. Farms and mob farms. Not only are they one of my favorite things to do in Minecraft, but also they're one of the most important things to have. Your three basic mobs, sheep, cow, and chicken, that's how you farm them. That's also an intro to crop farming. We'll be talking a whole lot more about this stuff and then specific better farms later on in the series. Subscribe so you don't miss it. Check out a world download for channel members. Thank you all so much for watching. Smash like, subscribe. Let me know down in the comments what you think about 1.20 stuff, and I will see you all tomorrow. This has been me, Waddles. Goodbye. Good morning, my friends, and welcome to day 68 of the guide. And, um, well, welcome to the next banger of an episode. Today's episode is all about villages, villages, and even a little villagers. Today, we'll be setting out in our world, exploring a little bit more, and talking specifically the best way to find a village in your world. Sincerely and deeply, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I've been enjoying making them. So today, we kick things off with a little bit of a base tour. A lot has changed. We got a new farm. We got a new farm. We got a camelot. <clears throat> camelot. I always said camelot. We got a chicken. And we got oh, the mighty titan. But of course, of course, you would never miss an episode of the series. No, 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 no. That would be the worst. You recognize all of this stuff. The big reason I wanted to kick off today's episode is over here. The cow extraordinaire 3000. Oh, it's ready to go. To use the cow crusher. I said I'd talk about it. We're going to feed wheat to both of the cows. They're going to look at each other somehow really closely. And then we get a brand new baby. In order to get that cow farm up and running, we're going to have to give it a little bit of time. Now, thankfully, I think every single one of these farms is close enough to world spawn in this world, which means they'll actually be loaded in the whole time, even when I'm not at the base. Villages, villages, smillages, smillages. Today, we're going to go out into our great big blue wonderful world and find some villages. I don't exactly know where this journey is going to send us, but we'll bring the map just in case. And then actually, I think we're going to bring the supplies to make a new map, too. One thing that I would like to try and be a, a little bit better about inside of this world here is mapping out what I've explored, what I've done and what I've seen. It'll help us tell a story in the end. Aww. Not technically necessary, but consider bringing a map. Also, definitely maybe technically necessary, not at all, is a spyglass. That's gonna come in handy big time too. To conserve on a little bit of inventory space right now, we can prime up our next map, but definitely not open the map yet. As soon as we open the map, it's loaded in. And we already have this one. I'm sure somewhere out in the wild, we'll be able to find more sugarcane for extra paper. So I'm not really worried about it. A map, a spyglass, the very final thing that we're going to need to have on hand before we explore is, of course, a brand new Berry Merch collection. No, oh, it's on now. The Berry Merch is the very first new Waddles Merch drop that has dropped in like over a year at least. If you're a fan of me, this series, or just sweet berries in general and you want summer vibes, check it out. Link down below. Anyways, finally, we need some extra food. I don't know how long we'll be gone. Next stop is over to our most trusty steed, and by steed I mean boat. And so now we're off. Flashback rewind. If currently you feel like you're having visions, you may be hallucinating a little bit. Well then medically, I think you should go get that checked out. That sounds bad. You're not in a daze, a haze or any kind of dream. Earlier on inside of this world, we have found not one, but actually two villages. Today we're gonna up the difficulty a little bit and set a goal of finding at least one more village by the end of the episode. With the help of you, my dear friend, by tapping like on this video right here, you'll not only let me know that you're enjoying the series, but you'll also let YouTube know that the series is pretty all right, at least, and it should recommend it to more people. But additionally, by tapping like on this video, you'll help me find not only all the other supplies that we're looking for while exploring today, but you'll also help me find one extra brand new village that we've never seen before. So when it comes to villages and trying to locate one for the very first time in your world, there is one specific spot that we should start. And by one specific spot, I mean like eight spots. For the absolute basics, a village inside of Minecraft, <laughs> if you if you happen to be watching this video and have absolutely no clue at all as to what a village actually is, well, a village in Minecraft is a specific type of structure, or in other words, essentially a cluster of buildings that you'll find generating in around your Minecraft world. Every single Minecraft world is different. Villages are gonna be located in different spots, but they'll always be located in the same spots. Hey, yo, 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 by the way, I've seen a couple questions about it. In this series, when I flip over to a different world and I'm flying around all of a sudden, it's never the same world. I have a bunch of extra random worlds that I keep making. <laughs> my, my folder is filling up. 
To find a village inside of your world, it's good to start by knowing the absolute basics. In Minecraft, there are biomes. These biomes have different characteristics. This is a birch forest biome. I hate him. It's terrible. If I was looking for a village, it would 100% not be a very smart idea to go over to my local ocean and swim around and get angry. And not only get angry, but inevitably my rage grows and grows and grows to take monster pour it all over my Razer keyboard and it gets really sticky and messy and sparks start flying out. Then I get angry, smash the monitor. Then maybe I would like get my cat or something and have the cat bite the monitor because I'm really angry about it all. And yeah, yeah, basically just like destroy things. That's not a great idea. <clears throat> Instead, what I'm saying here is it's much smarter to look in the specific biomes that villages can actually generate in. Specific biomes that villages can generate in? Nowadays, we've got a lot of different options. The default biome, kind of like the most basic one, is going to be the plains biome. You could also find a village inside of a desert biome, inside of the taiga biome, the snowy tundra biome, the savanna, and the meadow biome too. Now, every single time you find a plains biome, you're not 100% guaranteed a village. Like, sometimes it just doesn't happen. But you're way more likely to find a village inside of a plains or a meadow biome than you are inside of a forest biome. Because that would be literally impossible. Back inside of our world, oh boy, do you know what's next? <laughs> Think back to the beginning of the episode, oh, <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so happy. Brand new day, same old village. Now when it comes to our different village types, say plains village, desert village, they're different, but they're also the same. Well, I, uh, I guess this episode is an entire contradiction in itself. The plains village, the desert village, they definitely look different, but like functionally, they're basically exactly the same. You might find different structures, or in fact, you'll definitely find different structures, but you will always find, or 90% of the time, you'll find a same old, big nosed, wonderful being. They may be dressed in different drip, but they are still the same old, wonderful, big nosed, questioning beings. Now let's rewind a little bit, because in today's journey, I'm trying to set us up nice and perfectly for something that I like to do next, which is upgrade my tools with magical enchantments. To upgrade the tools with those magical enchantments, I'm gonna need a little bit of books. <laughs> the ethics and morals of finding a village and taking everything from it, including villagers. Class, we will avoid that topic today. All that I know is I need to look out for a couple different things on our exploration trip today. But once we find more villages, I need to find bookshelves inside of those villages and maybe even eradicate the cows nearby. So village, sweet village number one. I just want to take a quick poke around this place and just see. Maybe we have a couple more books, but I, I kind of doubt it. I feel like the village's local library was over there and the rest of this place is just going to be smaller houses. Beautiful, quite quaint, but definitely not full of knowledge and books. An extra map though. Haha, <laughs> I'll take that. And hey, you know what? Actually, speaking of maps, I kind of completely forgot about it. All this information has gotten me completely off of that map. Yeah, I, I kind of figured. To kick off your village journey in your world, begin by locating one of the biomes in which a village could actually spawn. After that, if you've got any kind of high, ooh, a high, precious, valuable vantage point, climb up to that vantage point and with a spyglass, look around. If your render distance isn't already raised for this process, I recommend bearing with the lag a little bit and raising it up. A little render distance life hack for you? If you're lagging out, try lowering your simulation distance a little bit. That should make things run smoother while still letting you see far. With our render distance raised from this high vantage point, hopefully near the biome that you're looking for, you might be able to use a spyglass, scan around inside of the biome like I did in episode 2, and actually locate a village just like that. If you're having a hard time locating the right biomes in the first place though, then it's still up to a high vantage point. Up at a high spot like this right here, I can now clearly see that, oh my god, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't plan on that. It's not scripted. The series is like, it's not script. Um, <laughs> okay, well, that's our next village. Um, <laughs> nice. Just like I did right there, you find a high vantage point. What I was going to say is now I can clearly see there's a new plains biome off in the distance over there. That would then be able to carefully and slowly make my way over to the plains biome and <laughs> scan it on foot, look around for a village. Uh, oh, ooh, don't look at that thing. All right, now next up, before we head over to that village and check that thing out, we're going to go back over to home sweet home and <laughs> look at this thing. I mean, obviously, you can see the cherry trees. That sticks out a lot, but you can see the base of the nether sword portal, too. Oh, that's awesome. This is a survival series, which means we're talking all about how to find a village in survival. There is technically an easier way, but this is 100% cheating. Built into Minecraft to Java and Bedrock Edition, there are a whole lot of wonderful commands. There are some differences between the commands of both versions of the game, but one common thing is the fact that many of these commands are locked behind creative mode. In 100% survival, if you're looking for a village, you cannot use the locate structure command. But in creative, if you want to find a village really quick, use this command and say, locate village desert, 
run the command give it a second and poof just like that you got your local village found this command is a really really useful command for finding villages but uh, obviously maybe not ideal for your world this village right here that we just found is a desert village like i mentioned earlier each village is the same in the sense that it has buildings and villagers but the blocks that make up the buildings are very different and sometimes the things found inside of a village they're going to be different too like we found out earlier on in the series we find camel at the desert village back over at home sweet home now that we're on our original map i can actually remember to like stop as soon as i move off of this map and make a new one. Oh, whoa, and actually, check this out. It looks like as soon as I cross the river over here and go to, like, the the sweet berry thing, I'm off the map. Brand new map with sweet berry farm. Oh, it's cool. And then we'll go ahead and zoom this map out all the way, real quick. Every single village generates a little bit differently. One thing that will make the Taiga village potentially a whole lot easier to find is the campfire smoke. Depending on how your world actually generated here, if you have a Taiga biome, you could be in luck. Not only is the taiga biome a biome that could potentially have a village inside of it, but if you can get high enough up inside of a taiga biome, using a spyglass again, we can look around for campfire smoke. Inside of the... My luck is insane. My luck is literally insane. Okay. All right. <laughs> inside of the taiga biome campfires will generate and usually the campfires are out in the open that means you're gonna have smoke rising from the campfire going high up into the air i want that long campfires are kind of like a dead giveaway a great way to find a village inside of a taiga biome i'm sailing down the river and then i see campfire smoke popping up past the trees like it usually does <laughs> well if i was sailing around and oh my gosh oh my god finally i found it there, there's a fox it's beautiful no don't hurt the fox no dog no i have no option it's a race against the clock of don't hurt the fox support dog it was you wasn't it you stop no no you're you're my friend you're my sweet friend <laughs> not only did i save a fox's life today but you're my friend bonzo bonzo i love you Bonzo, you come with me. We're fighting a village. Bonzo, come over here. Come over here. Follow me. We go for a swim. Oh, listen, I need you to get into the Cadillac. The Ferrari. The Ferrari. You get into the Ferrari with me. You stay in the boat, Bonzo. Just when I thought this day wouldn't get any more beautiful, it gets uh, five times more beautiful. I was trying to say. <clears throat> Anyways, I was trying to say before this dog so rudely interrupted me. If you're sailing, say, down a river or moving around inside of a taiga biome and you see campfire smoke billowing above the trees like it usually does, well, once you spot that campfire smoke, it's a sure sign that you've got a village nearby, my friend. Bones, oh, wait there. Campfire smoke, campfire smoke. I know for sure. I saw what I definitely saw from up high in that pillar. Hmm. Over here, we got a swamp biome. And I remember what was past the swamp biome, a plains biome. But where is that other thing that I saw? From the distance where is that other thing ah, ha, ha, ha. you thought you could hide from me that other thing with the campfire smoke rising up a village start by locating the biomes that could actually have a village after that get up high and using a spyglass and higher render distance look around if you're in a biome that tends to be relatively open you might not even have to get up high say a savanna biome a desert biome or maybe a plains if you're in a crowded biome, like say the taiga biome, tower up past the trees and using your spyglass, look for campfire smoke or unnatural blocks like the things that are making up the buildings here. Spruce house, spruce house, you got bookshelves in here. Oh, you got bookshelves in here. In total, to pull off enchanting magic that I want to pull off, we need like 45 books. I think I have five back at home and now I'm a proud owner of 18. <laughs> I'm halfway there. Now, uh, now that we have found all of this insane village luck, I think we're kind of like good for today when it comes to... Ooh, Ooh, iron chest blade for free for free so when it comes to a finding a village i got the craziest luck but how about what's actually inside of a village so each biome that a village can generate in aside from the meadow biome has its own type of village meaning like the village is built out of different blocks usually the blocks and the loot kind of tie in with the surrounding of the village for example obviously this is the taiga village so we're gonna have spruce trees all around the village is built out of spruce. Even more so, though, every single biome has its own unique type of diamond. Oh, it's beautiful. And iron, too. Can't forget that. Yeah, you're all coming back home with me. Beautiful. Each biome has its own type of village, but then there are two types of village within that. Sometimes, if you're unlucky or lucky, depending on how things go, you'll be able to find an abandoned village. An abandoned village is basically characterized with zombified villagers and ruined buildings. 
It's quite scary. Our village is not ruined, so we got beautiful villagers all over the place. Now, villagers are a very complex topic. Originally, I was going to talk all about these guys in this episode, but I, I feel like they're more important than that. They should get their own episodes. For our absolute basics of villagers today, these are villagers. They have cool looking outfits on. Their outfits correspond to their jobs. The pirate over there, I think it works at like the grindstone, the workstation. The farmer hat over there, it works at the composter. Now farmers are one of the most advanced type of villager, but every single villager kind of works the same. If you interact with a villager when it has a job, you get trades. If I had 15 coal, well then I could sell the coal for one emerald. Terrible idea. If I had 11 emeralds, I could buy this sword right there. Absolutely terrible idea. Now at nighttime, kind of like this guy just did right there, it's gonna wander off to its home. There's kind of a lot to a villager's home location, but long story short, it's basically where its bed is. The villager goes inside at nighttime and sleeps in a bed, unless I kick it out and I sleep there. Once you sleep through the nighttime, something you should definitely do near a village because zombies hate these guys. Eventually, they're gonna wake up and go back to work. Now, villagers have a very complex day schedule with time built into the day for gossiping, time built into the day for walking, and time built into the day for working. All of that's a little advanced for this episode though, so we'll come back to it later. Now, uh, this village right here, it's a taiga village, but it kind of spills over into the swamp bio. So as we can see here, we kind of have a swamp village, but not really. It is technically possible for villages to pop up into biomes they shouldn't pop up into, but that is only going to happen if the village generates in a biome and the other biome is like right next door to it. All over the village, you'll find buildings, and then typically inside of the building, sometimes outside, you'll find blocks called workstations. There are a lot of different blocks that fall under the workstation category. All of them control the villager's profession and the day-night cycle a little bit. If I place this down next to a villager, that villager will become whatever job it gets when it, when it works at a cauldron. I don't remember. When you eventually find a village like me, one of the best things to do is check every single building, because that's where the loot is usually going to be. Oh my gosh, diamonds, diamonds, and diamonds. I got three diamonds today. Two brand new villages I didn't plan on, and three wonderful diamonds. Yeah, villages are great. They got a lot of nice loot, including diamonds. Well, 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 a dog and cat bin. Two cats trapped with a dog friend. Oh, I wish I had, uh, I wish I had, like, fish. Maybe we would do fishing episode, but if I had fish, I, I would tame all of you right now. You better believe it. I would name you P and e, I would name you Cash, because you look like my cat, Cash. Oh, it's wonderful. We'll come back. Uh, actually, you know what? Matter of fact, we will come back. I'll just block them in like that. They should stay there forever. They're trapped. So all over a village, you got buildings. Cool things inside of the buildings and villagers all over the place. Another key point of the village is the village center. A village center is typically marked by a bell. Here we've got a bell in the middle, an uncraftable item that you should definitely consider a borrowing from the village if you want. The center point of every village is significant during a day-night cycle, but also during a raid. Another thing we'll talk about later. All right, so after this village right here, building, I think we've checked out just about every single building in the town. I got all the loot that I needed. I found the village. Honestly, villages, villagers as a whole, all of it is so complex. Like, there's so much to it. But there is one more thing I like to touch on today. And that's that other village somewhere over there. And that beautiful thing, too. Well, 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 my, 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 what do we have here? The contraption, a strange construction, a strange being that somebody was being, doing in a past bygone era. And a village over there. Mm -hmm. This is quite peculiar, very strange. It almost looks as if somebody was watching the Nether Portal episode of the series and tried to construct it inside of my world. Only they got it a little bit wrong. So this structure is one of the most common structures in Minecraft. It's the Ruin Portal. This thing can generate in almost every single biome in the entire game. At every single Ruin Portal structure, you're going to find a lot of obsidian, some very interesting crying obsidian block, and loot. Unfortunately, that time, when it comes to loot, I didn't get too hot here. I got a sword, I got some boots, and a little bit of iron. But I mean, after all, I can't complain. Loot is loot. Free extra loot. Sometimes a golden apple or something crazy from it. Yeah, 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 it's great. When exploring your world, maybe searching for a village, a ruined portal is an amazing thing to keep your eyes out for. Careful though, there's lava around them. It'll cause fire. And so, as we slowly move through this swamp biome right over here, very interesting. I wonder if we have a witch hunt near spawn too. It definitely feels like with the luck that I'm having in this world, <laughs> a witch hunt over at spawn is not out of the question at all. But, but anyways, as I slowly move through the swamp here, we're going to walk ourselves into what I think is another plains biome village. See, every village and every biome has its own unique aesthetic other than the meadow village. The meadow village, which is definitely not what this is, is just a copy of the plains biome village. 
It's actually pretty lame. Like, I talk about it quite a bit, and I never understand it. It just blows my mind that the devs spend a whole update focused on revamping the villages, making them even better and fresher. Then, like, literally four updates later, only a couple years, uh, they come back in and slap another village in and don't even care to make it special or unique. It makes no sense. Anyways, inside of this village, we're gonna find even more cool workstations, but I, I think we'll just go ahead and let the villagers keep doing their thing. I don't really need all the workstations. Specifically and specifically here, I'm looking for books, books, books. Uh, any librarian villagers around here want to show me the way to the local library? Ah, ha, ha. I got a big one too with a balcony inside. Oh, this should push us over the top. That's three, that's three, that's three, that's three. That's 12 right there. This is 24 total plus whatever I had in my inventory. Oh, 42. I could definitely find myself a couple pieces of the leather. Ah, it's time to enchant. And you know what? While we're at it, I think I will go ahead and borrow one lecture. I feel like I could add that to the enchanting setup and make a cool aesthetic. One of my favorite flowers in the game is found in the swamp. Complete side note, but this thing is beautiful. I want you for back at home too. Maybe three. And so as nighttime begins to encroach in on this village, with the villagers running around panicking, running quickly back to their houses, I should make their life a little bit more enjoyable. We sleep. Every time we find a village, you sleep. Now this village actually here that we found over in a plains biome, swamp biome, whatever, it's like very sprawling. This is a really, really big village. Sometimes, depending on how a village generates, it can get a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. Little village pro tip, life hack for you here. If you find a village early game, these hay bales are absolutely overpowered. Bread is a really, hey, well, it's not a bad option early game. If you take the hay bales and generate all over and break them down, it's nine wheat per hay bale. That's going to be three pieces of bread per hay bale. Hay bales are also pretty nice looking. Like, I mean, we could take these and decorate these back over at the base to make it feel a little bit more lived in. They're cool, and they're all mine. Once you find a village, all over the thing, you'll find buildings. Usually inside of the buildings, you'll find beds for the villagers and maybe chests and workstations too. Somewhere inside of your village, typically a little bit closer to the center of all the buildings, you'll find the center spot, usually with a bell generated. If you ring the bell, the villagers will panic and actually run back into their houses or walk. Connecting all of the houses, you will find paths to try and generate. Now, sometimes, depending on the terrain, the paths can get a little bit broken here, but the paths kind of lead you around the village. Inside of a village, sometimes, you'll even be able to find enclosed animal enclosures with animals inside of it. And finally, in one of the most beautiful things you can find inside of a village, because of the mechanics of villagers, everything like that, you're also able to find cats inside of the village. Now, today, we won't really be taming a cat. I think one pet at a time is probably good enough for us, but cats. Oh, well, 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 uh, hopping around a swamp over here. I mean, logically, it would make sense we have a swamp. Oh, the frog, the frog. I love these things. They're so cool. Oh, man, if I brought a lead or like slime ball, I don't have them. But if I brought a lead, I would have been bringing you back home too. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, that's great. Now, while I slowly make my way back over to Bonzo, I'd like to tackle today's comment of the day. If you remember, in the last episode, I asked you guys what you thought I should do about the dragon fight. For today's comment of the day, instead of picking just one comment, I like to pick all of the comments that address the question. So, thank you, everybody. <laughs> After seeing all the feedback, well, I'm nothing short of enlightened. I think the new plan is going to be still try and take on the dragon by episode 25, but if it doesn't happen because we want to check out the new stuff, it's no big deal. My plan here is to just go with it. If we feel like taking on the new stuff, we'll do it, but otherwise, we'll try and get the dragon done, dusted, and out of the way. After all, it's uh, <laughs> not like the dragon fight actually changes much anyways. Also, I'd like to take the dragon on so then we could like move to a new spot. It's not that I don't love this spot and what we have going for us over here. It's actually the opposite. It's just that I feel that we could find it even more inspiring and maybe cherry build spot to build. So anyways, let me know what you think about that. And finally, our final village hunting tip of the day. Oh my. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Is that a... Is that a condition? Bonzo, my dear friend, we just met and you're not feeling too well. You're scooting all over the brown, the ground, leaving, leaving brown. Um, what? <laughs> Stop scooting everywhere. No, not inside. Don't do that in the house. The final wonderful village finding tip of the day that I have for you involves this beautiful place called Chunk Base. Chunk Base is an amazing Minecraft database, essentially, where you can take a look at your world. On Chunk Base, and I'll drop a link to it down in the description, we got a villager finder. Using the seed of your world, whatever it is, you can put it in right here, select your version, Java or Bedrock even, and then you get a map of your world with dots all over it. These dots are going to correspond to where Chunkface thinks the village is. 
For my testing, I found that this thing is accurate, like 95% of the time. In my opinion, using chunk face to find things is a nice cross between using commands and wandering around aimlessly inside of your world. It's not up to me to tell you if it's cheating or not, you make your own decision on that. But it is up to me to tell you that we got 47 books. Oh, it's beautiful. 47 books, a brand new doorbell for the house. A couple of villages found, but most importantly, a brand new friend. Everybody, meet Bones up. And so those are my tips for finding a village. If you got another amazing tip, drop that down in the comments below. Smash like on the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Today, big thank you to my patrons, Archangel, Grand Crazy May, Medical Boomsticks, Whoopy Louvers, Noodle Pork, and Bill W. You're the best. It's been me, Waddles, and I will see you all tomorrow. Goodbye. Hi, how you doing, my beautiful laddies? Welcome back to the Minecraft Guide. This episode, oh, it's gonna be enchanted. At this point in our world, we got a lot of levels. And I think it's about time we finally shake it off in some kind of cool, purple, magical lavender haze. Today, in a rush of pure happiness, it may be nothing new, but it's time we talk enchanted. This mechanic is so clean. Ah, <sighs> it feels so good to be back inside of the guide world as always. I love this place. Today, we begin with a challenge. It was Bonzo's idea. Minecraft must have something like 40 or so enchantments, but there is one single best enchantment. Down below, name the best one. In my opinion, there is only one correct answer when it comes to the best enchantment in the entire game. <sighs> Day number 73. It's never too late to talk about enchanting. If we're going to talk about enchanting, there is one very specific fancy block that we're going to need to get. To get this block is kind of a lot of supplies. We're going to need obsidian, and diamonds, and one single book. With these supplies on the table, like this, we can craft an enchanting with an ING table. Ooh, enchanting. It's an ancient mechanic, initially added in Minecraft 1.0.0. But enchanting hasn't always been the same. It's actually undergone a couple of changes to get to the form where we're at right now. In order to enchant, we will need the enchanting table. But if we're going to talk about enchanting, we should probably talk about disenchanting too. I mean, after all, maybe you get something you don't want. If you want to disenchant your tool right after you enchanted it, or like hours later, it's all done at the grindstone. Now the enchanting table block, it's definitely an interesting one. Not only does it give off a little bit of light, this was a parody update with Minecraft Bedrock Edition, but it's also made out of pure obsidian. With that logic, you would think that you can't mine it with an iron pick. This game, I hate it. It makes no sense. Oh, but it's actually like perfect timing. Yes, because this thing gives off light, it is technically possible to light up your base with just enchantment tables. This thing only gives off a light level of like eight though, so it might take a lot. The grindstone on the other hand, this is a different block. It doesn't give off any light at all. You got a very, very interesting and complex model. It's also a villager workstation and it looks like this inside of it. That's all I have to say about it. It's the middle of the night. I should probably sleep. Now for the absolute basics of enchanting, if we take this table and drop it down on the ground and then go inside of it, we will put a tool right there, then we're offered up some enchantments. Efficiency 1. Ooh, efficiency 1, very enticing. Or, drum roll, efficiency 1. Yeah, that's right, we got three options. And we got three options to pay for it too. Three levels, two levels, or one level, your call. But let's say I wasn't very happy with those options. I pick it up, I place it back down somewhere else. Well, thanks to something called the enchantment seed of the world. We're going to have the exact same enchantment offers here. Even if I pick this up and place it back down one more time, the offers will still be the exact same. Until I actually interact with this table and basically like buy something from it, or until I add something essential to my enchanting setup, the enchantments offered will be the same. And uh, for this next one, you're just going to have to trust me, not exactly in a position to make a bunch of tables, but if I made a second table and placed it down over there, even though it's two separate tables, we're going to have the same exact enchantments. Now all this happens thanks to the enchantment seed of your world. It's sort of like the world seed in a way, except like for enchantments and a number you can't really see. Enchanting in every single Minecraft world is exactly the same, but it's also very different. The order at which enchantments are offered is going to change from world to world. Now I don't remember the tool I put in here a second ago. Let's say it was the pickaxe though. When I put the pickaxe here, I get efficiency, I get efficiency and efficiency. Some enchantments are unique to certain tools. The efficiency enchantment can go on all of the working tools, but not the combat tools. That means if I put a sword in here, I'm offered up different enchantments altogether. Sharpness 1, Sweeping Edge 1, and finally, a Sharpness 1 as well. But it's not all only tools, and actually, it's not every single tool as well. Some tools can only be enchanted in a different block. 
But it's not only tools, you can also actually enchant books, a great way to save enchantments for later. If I put a book inside of the enchantment table right there, I'm going to get an option of three different enchantments from any enchantment in the game that isn't a curse or a treasure enchantment. All right, hey, so it's a lot of information, but let's say it's finally time. I liked what I was seeing with this book. I put the book in the table right here. Efficiency 1, Impaling 1, a Trident Enchantment, or Sharpness 1. I think for some mysterious reason, maybe I'm insane, deranged or something, but I like the looks of Efficiency 1. Oh, that's beautiful. But if I tap on this, it's just playing an error sound. It, it did a goofy sound, too. It, it doesn't work. That's because we have only met one of the requirements. In here, we have to put something to enchant. Over here, we have to put payment. But there is also more payment, too. To enchant in Minecraft, you basically need three things. Something to enchant, a little bit of lapis to pay for. Either one lapis, two lapis, or three lapis. And you're also going to need levels, indicated by this thing right here. If you take the top enchantment every time, it'll take one lapis and one level from you. The middle one will always be two, no matter what it is. And the bottom one, it'll always be three. So if we go ahead and take this, the very first enchantment of the world is Efficiency 1. Just like that, we're now down one lapis and unfortunately down one level as well. But you know what, lads? Now I've changed my mind. I'm an indecisive lad and now I've decided decisively that I don't want Efficiency 1. Over inside of the grindstone, I can put my enchanted tool or book and actually disenchant it. I'll get a little bit of levels back, not as many as I used up before, and I get no lapis. But the thing is disenchanted. I could do it all again now. And so, for the absolute, absolute basics, that's like basically it. All you do is you walk over to the table, you throw something in it, you get some enchantments offered. Maybe you like one of the enchantments, you pick it, and you move on. But believe it or not, this table is offering very pathetic enchantments right now. There is a way that we could go ahead and take that table and level it up. And actually get things that I want to use. Flashback rewind. In the last episode, we went looting and pillaging all over our world. In that episode, we found like a bunch of villages. And from those villages, I found like a bunch of books. If you want to talk about improving your enchantment setup big time, then it all comes down to bookshelves. And to make bookshelves, you're going to need books. To make books, you're going to need a lot of materials. First up, we're going to need a lot of leather. Specifically, in total for all of the bookshelves, 45 pieces of leather. If you want to include the enchantment table, that's one more book, which means 46 pieces of leather. Now, each book costs three paper. Do a little bit of quick maths for you. Three times 45, that is 135. 135 paper is needed. Now, I'm some kind of privileged kid. I started out with all of the supplies needed, so we don't need to worry about it. However, if you did have to worry about it, a couple of tips for the sugarcane. Go out into your world and run around and break the sugarcane. Maybe bring some back over to your base, plant it, and let it grow. Continue the harvesting process for a while. When it comes to leather, build one of these beautiful contraptions that we talked about in this episode right here. This magical being is called a cow crusher. We let it run a little while, and then eventually we get a million cows inside of this thing. The other beautiful option that you got when it comes to actually stocking that thing up, oh, is wonderful. Go out into your world, find some villages, break the bookshelves inside of the village. Villagers don't care anyways, and bring them back over home to your base. Now, the bookshelf is kind of an expensive block. Once you craft a bookshelf like that inside of the crafting table and place it down, it's there wherever you put it. Unless you break it with silk touch, when you break it, the books pop back out, but the wood is gone. So it's best you be a little bit decisive with where you're going to put the bookshelf. Hi, Bonzo Bonzo. Listen, my friend, your condition seems to be solved, which is good, because I can't really name you Scooter, considering the fact that somebody evil, pure evil hatred is named Scooter as well, so... Hey, anyways, Bonzo, I task you with an important task. I need you to watch over the base over here while I'm gone. Make sure the cows don't go anywhere, because I'm going down. We're gonna go make an enchanting setup somewhere much better. Oh, it was but just a couple episodes ago now, but it feels like a million that we were setting up this wonderful little contraption over here. This thing, this sweet build over here, it is the Zombie Slayer 3000. And over at this thing, just like that, I'm back up to level 30. It's a great idea to set an enchanting setup up over where you have a source of experience, like my zombie spawner farm. Setting our enchantment setup over here, oh, it's genius. By setting this thing up over here, we're going to have a continuous supply of experience flooding into my room freely. It's like literally perfect. The only thing I'm going to need to consider here is space. A full level 30 enchantment setup, this is going to take a little bit of room. All that means said, I think it's time to carve out a little bit of this room to make even more room. Let's do this. Hey 
Big time. Hey, excuse me. Excuse me. I, I'm trying to work a little bit here, and you're getting really noisy. Are you not? Not in this series. We haven't talked too much about building quite yet, but when it comes to building, it's a great idea to start out with a basic vision. Like, I kind of know that I want to have a deep slate floor in here and then probably like wooden walls or something. That could be cool. Start by putting some of the blocks in and then like take a look at it. See if you like it. Okay, okay, okay. That's enough of that. That's it. Hostile creatures, I'm sorry. You're going to have to like go way down. You're, you're way too noisy. I got other things to talk about and do here. Do you know what on second thought? <laughs> I'm not too sure if I love the floor like this, but it's hard to tell with the walls like this. Anyways, I'm starting to rack up levels, which means we should probably move back to talking a little bit more about enchanting. 33 levels. So technically speaking, you can pile up as many levels as you want. They'll just keep going. However, the more levels that you pile up, the longer it takes to go from level to level to level. Meaning like level 33 is way longer than level 3. Level 66 is way longer than 33. If you're worried about wasting experience on longer levels, consider enchanting right when you hit about level 30. It's the most efficient. So now check this out. I added a bookshelf over here to our setup. If I put this sword in here, then I get some new enchantments. And actually, the enchantments are getting a little bit better, but it's hard to tell right now. By adding bookshelves around your enchantment table spaced out one block, just like I'm doing here, including on the corner, you're actually going to buff up the enchantments that are offered from the enchanting table. Over here, we can see a two now, then we can see a three, and then we can see a six. This is basically like the level of the enchantment, or in other words, how good it is. If I add maybe two more bookshelves to the setup right here, well, then that six is now bumped up to a ten. Then we got a three and a three. If we add, say, maybe like the rest of the bookshelves I have in my inventory and check it, then yet again, we are bumped up, getting even better. If you're looking for a fully maxed out enchantment setup, a setup that offers you the best enchantments possible, it's 15 bookshelves total. With 15 bookshelves around this enchantment table somewhere, I'm now offered a level 30 enchantment. Oh yes. These 15 bookshelves can be placed anywhere around the enchantment table on the same layer or one higher. That means if I didn't say, like, want this spilling out into the room, I could move these. I could expensively recraft these. Then I could take them and put them there and say maybe right there. If I were to come in here and get a little bit more crafty with this setup, maybe uh, abstract or something, put a bookshelf up there, or even put a bookshelf down here in the ground, it will have no effect on this enchantment table at all. If I start coming in here and putting blocks in here, I don't know, maybe I'm like, I'm an impressionist, I don't know. Well, by decorating my setup with the blocks in between the table and the bookshelves, I actually cut them off. There needs to be nothing, or basically nothing, in between the table and the bookshelves to actually work here. Now, enchantments, enchantments. Let's take another look at this thing. With this thing being beefed up now, we're going to be offered better enchantments. Typically, this one is going to be the worst option. This one's going to be a little bit better, and then this one will be the best one. If your number is at 30, that's the best possible option. Unbreaking 3. It's a beautiful enchantment. We haven't actually really specifically talked about it, but every single tool has durability. The durability is symbolized by that bar right there, or with more tooltips shown, you get the specific number. On Minecraft to Java, F3 and H at the same time will turn on or turn off advanced tooltips, so you can see that number. If I were to enchant my diamond pickaxe with Unbreaking 3, that's a genius decision. The best pickaxe definitely has Unbreaking 3 on it. With Unbreaking 3, we have the chance to use zero durability sometimes when we use a pickaxe. But you can only have to enchant diamond things. You can enchant iron as well, which is pretty cool. Or again, books. I like to take it a look. Ooh, protection four. That's kind of potentially beautiful for a set of armor. But instead, what I think I will do is I will put this pickaxe in here because I like the looks of Unbreaking 3 and that dot dot dot. And we'll go ahead and enchant it. Now, when I take that enchantment, my levels are gone. The lapis is gone. And I got enchantments. Sometimes if I'm unlucky, I only get one. Oh! <laughs> Sometimes if I'm lucky, oh, I'm beautifully lucky. You can get even more enchantments on the pickaxe. Efficiency 4, oh, baby. On ranking 3, oh, yes. And fortune 3, that was the one I was looking for today. Spoiler alert. But this is the end of the episode. Smash like and subscribe. By leaving a like on these videos, you do a huge favor for me. It helps like YouTube know to send these guide episodes to more people. Early access to all these episodes it is on Patreon, my friends. And a world download, it's out for channel members right now. Thank you for watching, and I will... Oh, wait, 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 what's that? What's that? We have more to do? Oh, yeah, this room looks terrible. You're right. With this brand new, handy, speedy, amazing pickaxe that I have right here, I can now go ahead and dig out all this deep slate because I... I guess I, I kind of changed my mind guys. I think I hate the display floor and I can redo it all. Maybe the walls too this time.
Just a little bit of time later, back inside of a room with a floor that I think I like way more. Let's talk a little bit about getting up into this room and getting down from this room, or whichever way it goes. And hey, <laughs> potato. So clearly, we're way at the bottom of the world. Going up and down from the staircase that I built earlier on, I mean, technically does work, but very slow. A much quicker way to get up and down from these deep builds is with bubble columns and... Yeah, bubble columns. To get down, which is gonna be this side, we're gonna go ahead and put a magma block right there. I, we'll fix that problem in a minute. <laughs> to, to, to get up, we're gonna put a soul sand block right there. Now the walls inside of this room, I've been thinking quite a bit about what I want to do with them. I, I think Deep Slate. I, I'm kind of leaning towards Deep Slate on the walls in here. Another thing that in my opinion, every spawner room is going to need to have is somewhere to put all of the drops from the spawner. Otherwise, you're going to have chests sitting around and just like, you're going to clog them up with all the drops. A dedicated storage spot. I think I'm going to put my dedicated storage spot over here. What I want to have is a spot for rod and flesh. I want to have a spot for armor and things like that. And then maybe like one more spot for something else and one more because I have extra room. Then what I think I'm going to do is maybe make it like a little bit taller too. Now when it comes to your chest, you got some options here. You could have them facing out like that or if you want to conserve space, you make your storage wall a little bit deeper. This is a storage room hack. We'll talk about rooms later. But you make your room a little bit deeper here and you have the chest go long way reaching back like that as long as you don't have a solid block above it you'll still be able to open the chest just like that and from the front you'll only take up one space on our way back up to the surface i think it's time we talk about the other enchantments that we got on this pickaxe here so we got unbreaking which will conserve its durability we have efficiency as well efficiency is going to make this pickaxe work a little bit faster you see that's like pretty quick efficiency is an enchantment that has five levels total but it's only possible to get up to efficiency four from the enchanting table and then finally, Fortune. Oh my gosh, this stuff is beautiful. Fortune has three levels to it. We got the max level right now. Check this out. I got 26 lapis in the inventory. Usually, if I mine this with a normal pickaxe, I would get anywhere between four to nine lapis. If I mine this lapis with a Fortune 3 pickaxe, I can receive up to 36 lapis from one single spot right there. So we go ahead and mine like four of these things right there. And all of a sudden, I've got over a stack <laughs> and half of another one. Oh, it's beautiful. And that's going to work for every single ore in the game. With copper, you mine it with Fortune, you're going to get way more than normal. Coal, iron, diamonds. Oh, yes, diamonds. That's why we're holding off on diamonds. When it comes to mining, stocking up on materials, resources, anything like that, Fortune 3 is such a beautiful, useful, amazing enchantment. Absolute must have on your pickaxe. All right, so back up on the surface here, we're gonna need to be careful. This is the dead of nighttime. There could be creepers, skeletons, zombies, all. There's nothing. Hey, the first spider eye. With water dumped inside of our elevators going all the way down to the bottom of the world, the next thing we're going to want to do is move into the elevator. Now right now, as you can kind of see, it's not really doing anything. I have to interact with the elevator. You gotta be careful in these elevators when setting them up for the first time. You could definitely drown. But go down to the bottom of the thing. Then, just like we did with this elevator, it's time to activate it by using kelp. However, depending on how you place stuff in your room, water might spill out. One of the best ways to stop the water from spilling out into your room and causing a mess is something like fence gates. If you place fence gates and open, it'll hold the water in. Now, if I had bone meal, this process would be so much safer, but unfortunately, no bone meal here, which means I'm gonna need to jump into this elevator and place kelp all the way to the top. Well, not drowning. We place kelp all the way to the top. Well, not to drowning. Okay, I don't wanna do this twice. Magma column things. They're great for getting down to the bottom of the world, but there is an easier way Back down here at the bottom of the world I removed the water bucket from the surface if I dig that magma block out and put water right there I can now safely jump from the top all the way down to this thing. and It'll take no damage Enchanting enchanting. I'm starting to have the levels pile up a little bit. Not great The next thing that I like to take a look at enchanting the next things I like to take a look at enchanting is gonna be a bow a diamond axe and actually maybe some boots Oh, brand new advancement. You call me Diamond Man. All right, so uh, we got amazing luck with the pickaxe, but it will not always happen. With this axe, we got efficiency four. I like it. With the bow, we got a uh, breaking three. It's okay. With the boots, we got depth strider three. Ooh, oh, that's so hard. That's amazing for water. All right, so now we have to make a decision because unfortunately, as soon as I enchant one thing, the other enchantments are reset. We're going to get different offers. So, so if I take depth strider, that means, uh, certainly, Unbreaking 3 is gone. When enchanting, it's a very good idea to try and enchant multiple things at the same time. That way, you're not, like, looking for one specific enchantment. If you don't like what you see on the bow, no big deal. You put a book in there, and then Efficiency 3, that's terrible. 
<sighs> boots, um, the boots are axe, boots are axe, boots are axe. What do I do? Efficiency four or death strider. Thinking about the rarity here and what I want on the axe, efficiency four, 100%. But I think death strider, depending on the other enchantments that I get here, oh disappointment. I get disappointed. So sometimes, unfortunately, enchanting doesn't work out for you. I could definitely keep these Death Strider boots. However, if I put these back in here, I cannot re-enchant these with enchantments on. That means if I want more enchantments on my boots, I need to build them up with, like, combining diamond boots. I think here because just Death Strider 3 isn't good enough for me, I will disenchant the boots, get a tiny bit of experience back, and go back over to the table. Looking in the table, power 4, that's a whole lot better. That's a good bow. Over here, Fortune 3, that's a very, very nice axe. Or, Feather Falling? Fire protection. Right. And then finally, we'll check the book. What do we have? Protection 4. Mm. Uh, well, for me, I think this time, it's got to be this axe. Let's go ahead and enchant the axe with Forge. Well, actually, I wish it had Silk Touch. Let's try the bow. Power 4 on the bow and... Ah, not bad. That's not bad at all. It just needs infinity. Bow check done. Down, good to go. Now, unfortunately, I'm below level 30, which means it's back over right behind me for this. And, and to now, you start to see exactly why it's an amazing idea to set enchanting setup over at spawner setup too. Just like that, I'm back above level 30. I can check this out again. Feather falling. No, I want feather falling. No. <laughs> Diamond axe. If I could get so touched, that would be beautiful. Or infinity. We're looking for infinity anywhere. Aqua infinity. That's very nice. I think I'll actually take that. I don't remember for sure. I guess I got to look it up and touch up my knowledge a little bit. But I thought there was only one layer of Aqua Affinity. That's a keeper. So next up, below level 30. I can't take whatever I get here. But Blast Protection form, okay. Or Efficiency form, okay. Back over to the zombies for a quick second. By the way, also up to the ceiling for a quick second. Got to replace this stuff. I think I want to do Cobblestone and Mossy Cobblestone all over. Now it's back over to this thing again. And right up to level 30. No big deal. Nice and easy. And it's thundering. It's definitely thundering. That's potentially dangerous. It's time to sleep. <laughs> I definitely don't want to be awake and let lightning hit my house, burn it down. Or even worse, let skeleton horse spawn. We'll clear that out and jump into bed. Anyways, back over here at the elevator. With Kel placed all the way up to the surface, we can now jump down into this hole. We got water way at the bottom of it. I say centered, I'm good. Then back over here, all I need to do to activate this thing for good is break the Kel. Now, if I jump into this column, I'm going to be rocketing it up to the top. Along the way, somewhere, I should catch all of the kelp or find it at the top. Mm, just like that. Now, I got all my kelp back and I got a way up and down. Nice and easy. Inside of this room, I want to make it cool, my friends. I want to make it so I can see the elevator. So, oh, whoops. Oh, that's my bad. That's my bad. Excuse me. I would like to put tinted glass all up this elevator in here so that I can look into the elevator and see my subjects coming to visit me. Over here on this side, kind of the same thing. I would like to be able to see and to see the zombies a little bit more. To pull that off. Whoa, 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 whoa. No. To pull it off. I put that back right there. I put that right there. If I put slabs stacked on top of each other, no babies can jump out. No grown-ups can either. Next up, it's the walls of this room. We got to finish this whole place up today. I was thinking maybe for the walls, I could do something pretty simple. See, I was thinking here, plain old deep slate and come in and mix a little bit of cracked deep slate too. On this wall, however, seeing as it is something a little bit different, we will do something a little bit different. Quickly, we break that and swap it out. Oh, much more beautiful. And then I, uh, I got a little bit of extra glass here. What if we come back in and add some of that so we can see them even more? Cool wall torch place you think. Cool wall torch place things. Wall torch down low. Floor torch right there. Organize a little bit here. Got a lot of extra armor and drops. And now it's time for our final enchanting run of the day. So in today's episode, we beautified this room. It looks a little bit better. Still simple, but much nicer. And then we did a lot of great enchanting. Over here with this book. Oh, feather falling four. We did it. We did it. Oh, it's beautiful. I need that enchantment so bad, but maybe... Ah, no, it's so sad. But this, ah, no, it's so sad. Feather falling for. This right here, my friends, is why you should always bring books with you when enchanting in the table. We go ahead and roll that enchantment over, and we got feather falling for. We'll talk about putting that on the boots in a second. Unbreaking three, ooh, potentially great. This thing right here, oh, so touch, oh, so touch. I told you, we're taking so touch. We got so touch, and oh, oh, that's terrible. That is so bad. That is really, really horrendous. We need more diamonds. 
Oh. Anyways, we'll take a look at that on breaking three right there. Uh, let's go ahead and get all the way back up to level 30. It's gonna be such a painful grind. I know, I know. Uh, it takes so much time. And just like that, level 30, not a big deal. We walk over here and let's see. Please, give me something good. Give me something good. Give me something great. Now, let's wrap things up today by talking about combining. Oh, and uh, by the way, if you set your enchantment set up at like a spotter or whatever, you're going to get a lot of like enchanted equipment right here. For example, Respiration 2 Helmet on Breaking 3 Gold Chestplate. I probably will never use this chestplate, so for a little bit of extra levels, you can always disenchant that stuff. Then if you wanted to, I don't think I want to, but I could throw this in the furnace and smelt it down into nuggets. Then I could use the nuggets to make ingots or something. You know what I think this room needs? What it definitely 100% needs is just a little bit of iron bars. We're deep down in the bottom of the world after all. What if this is like inside of some kind of dungeon or jail or something terrifying? Ooh, <laughs> that's it. It's nice and open and clean looking. I mean, maybe I need to do a little bit of like cleaning up, touch it up over there. Maybe get a bit different bed in here or something, but... Oh, it's beautiful. And the levels? <laughs> Absolutely amazing. I love it so much. So as you could probably tell, when it comes to enchanting, there's kind of a lot to it. The very final piece to it, or major piece to it, at least for today, is going to come into play when we get ourselves an anvil. Now, an anvil is going to be pretty expensive. When I was digging down over there for our elevator and entrance, I actually hit a pretty big patch of fire. So over here, inside of the trusty smeltery, let's throw some of that iron in the furnace and let it cook up. Who took my stone cutter? In Minecraft, anvils could be used for a lot of different things, including throwing a name onto your tool. But more specifically, for today's episode on enchanting, if we have something with enchantments already on it, we can't enchant it again. But we can add specific enchantments to it. For example, if I want Frostwalker on these boots, no big deal. Frostwalker book right there, plus the boots, plus the levels, and all of a sudden I got it. But I, I don't think I want that. Instead, what I'm looking for is Feather Falling Forward. If you're adding enchantments to anything, in slot 1, you put what you want to add it to. In slot number 2, you put the enchantment that you're trying to add, and then in slot number 3, the output is going to be right there. It will cost me 4 levels to do this, but honestly, for that boot right there, oh, it's no big deal. I would do that every single day. Diamond boots, we look good. And so, everybody, we have now reached the proper end of Minecraft Guide, episode number 12, the enchanting basics episode. Hey, you know what? I almost forgot how could I. There's so much to enchanting. Rerolling enchantments. Let's say I was trying to enchant this book and I wanted something good, but I didn't like sharpness 3. To reroll an enchantment, you basically just take the cheapest possible thing, so that thing right there, it'll cost a little bit, but then you move over to the grindstone and you find that enchantment. Inside of the grindstone, you put whatever you just enchanted. Usually, it's a good idea to do it with books, just in case you find something good in that bottom one. And then you just try it all again. Every single time you enchant something inside of the enchanting table, all of your enchantment offers are rerolled. Today's comment of the day is a quick and simple question. Is it true that when you alternate rows of food when farming, they will grow faster? 100% absolutely, yes it is. You know how it goes down below in the comments. Drop the single best enchantment in all of Minecraft. Smash like and subscribe. Huge, huge thank you to my patrons. Nick C, Tanner B, Austin B, Andrew H, Gabriel Y, and FireDragon19. Goodbye, everybody. Day number 80. Check done. I'll see you tomorrow. So look, I know I'm going to sound crazy by saying this, but I'm cursed. More on that after the intro, though, because diamonds, diamonds, and diamonds. In the last episode, we built this beautiful enchanting setup. Today, we're going to put it to good use by talking one of the best ways to find diamonds in Minecraft 1.20. But guys, I, I got to be honest with you. I desperately need you to do me a favor. In order to certify our return to level 30, in order to ensure great luck finding diamonds, and in order to save the rest of this episode, delete that like button for me. Please. Right now. Ha! <sighs> so it was off to a beautiful start. In the original beginning of episode number 13 of the guide series, I went over to the enchanting table and did a tiny bit of enchanting. I even showed off some small upgrades that I did to the setup. After enchanting for a little while, I rocketed back up to the surface, made a quick stop at Bonezo, talked a little bit about submarines, and then actually used the cow crusher for the very first time. I got the cow crusher all the way up and got leather from the thing. It was kind of beautiful. Then it was back down to the enchanting setup for me. Over the enchanting setup, I had some of the worst luck that I had ever enchanted. I couldn't find the enchantment that I wanted at all. Until eventually, I could find the enchantment that I wanted at all. <laughs> it's all black and white and sad and quite miserable, to be honest, because Devstrider 3. We need it for what we're going to do today, but I desperately wanted to find it on a book and put it on our beautiful boots from the last episode. 
But I couldn't do it. I tried and I tried and I tried and I just couldn't find any Death Stranding 3 on one specific book. Moral of the story, Ooh. don't look for one specific enchantment on an enchanted book. Anyways here, sometimes I edit the episodes partially while I'm making them. This was one of those times, and thankfully I did that because the audio was missing. Like, 100% and fully. I saw it recording, but, but all the audio from the first chunk of the episode is gone. And I don't know where it went. <laughs> I, I wish I could say that I was joking when I was saying this, but, like, it literally is missing. Combine that with the terrible luck and the episode number, and I, I, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Anyways, the other enchantments that I'm gonna need for today, Aqua Affinity, Respiration 3, and Looting, uh, the Fortune 3 as, as well. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. But I guess I can't say it was all bad luck though, because over here, this, this one good thing did come out of our enchanting run. You already know, later on, this is going right on that bow. That's beautiful. In today's guide episode, we're gonna talk one of the best ways to find diamonds inside of Minecraft 1.20. And oh god, who are you and why are you here? The bad luck is terrible today. Leave me alone. I don't even have the time for you today. I don't even want to touch you. I don't know what's gonna happen. I need to get far away from you, as, as far away from that thing as possible. That is terrifying. Bonzo, oh sweet Bonzo. I wish that I could bring you on an adventure today, but uh, the, the fate has not been very good so far. Instead, you come with me to the smithing building, the smeltery. Over inside of the smeltery here, we need to build ourselves a diver's helmet. This diver's helmet is gonna be an iron helmet because, um, I promise I have more diamonds, okay? Listen, listen, I really, I, I have more diamonds, they're, they're somewhere. We're gonna build our diver's helmet that'll help us find diamonds with this iron helmet. We're gonna have aqua affinity on the helmet, and we're also gonna have respiration three on this helmet. This beautiful helmet that Bonzo is staring at right now is going to be our ticket for clean, easy diamonds. So in the last episode, I think I said somewhere, we'd talk about new enchantments when we get the new enchantments. And oh boy, we got three of them. Let's talk. Diamond diving enchantment number one, Dev Strider. Ideally, Dev Strider 3. Check this out. I swap my normal boots and all of a sudden I'm slow. Dev Strider 3 goes back on and I can move way, 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 way quicker. It's actually kind of beautiful and it's going to be super useful because today we'll be going deep. This helmet has aqua affinity and respiration on it. Check out my bubbles. With Respiration 3 at my helmet right here, I can breathe for so long under the water, it's actually insane. Now let's say I stop swimming around and I land right here. Then I want to mine something, say this block of sand. Well, with Aqua Affinity on my helmet, I mine things just as quick as I do up on land. All right, now Bonzo, Bonzo, come over here. Bonzo wanted to, to propose a little bit of a game. This helmet right here, that's gonna be our diver's helmet. Bonzo. Would like you to name this helmet down below. You guys did not let me down with Camelotl over here. It was a beautiful name. We're gonna do the exact same thing. Most liked comment, best name down below, names the diver's helmet forever inside of this world. Diamond diving, diamond diving has a nice uh, ring to it, you know? The other supplies that we need for diamond diving today, doors. We're gonna wanna have like a decent amount of doors on hand. Alternatively, if you don't really wanna do doors and you're a little bit more cautious, you could bring a lot of magma blocks as well. Let's talk a little bit about waterlogging, a mechanic that was added to Minecraft in the 1.13 update. Before Minecraft 1.13, if you put anything that wasn't a solid block under the water, it would look really, really weird. Then when waterlogging was added to the game, you could put like a slab under the water, and the water basically just fills it in. And now for the most part, a lot of solid full things when placed under the water get water inside of them, They're like slabs and fences. However, doors are one of the remaining things. You can't waterlog a door, which means when you place it under the water, you create an air pocket. If you move into that air pocket, you can breathe. That's gonna be really important for what we're gonna do today. So for diamond diving, you get yourself the four enchantments on screen, you get yourself something to create air under the water, and then optionally, if you wanted to, you get yourself a couple potions as well. You could get water breathing potions, not really necessary with the enchantments that we have, but night vision, check this out. If you drink a night vision potion, you're dealing with water, it becomes invisible, like, like the water is clear. You can see clean through. But the small thing, we haven't really found a brewing stand yet, or blaze rod, or, or even talked about potions at all. So for today, we're just gonna go ahead and skip the potions. Another kind of fire thing that might help out big time is gonna be a spyglass. And with a spyglass, we could take this thing and zoom in, look at the bottom of the water for holes. And so with that, my friends, we're off. Like some kind of explorer inside of a boat, we set out into the watery parts of our world and scan the bottom. Once we find something that looks like it gets a little bit deep, we'll double check it, and then we get a little bit closer with this water gear right here. Sometimes you'll find caves at the bottom of rivers and oceans that go deep. And then when they go deep, they keep going deep. Except this time it didn't work out like that. We find a cave that is a very, very wet flooded cave. 
If we dig around, swim around inside of that cave, and if we don't leave that cave, we stay there until we find lots and lots of sweet, sweet profit. So that's the condensed version of this method, my friends. And now there are two ways you could kick this thing off. Big cave. In an earlier episode of this series, I told you a little bit about my Minecraft guide diary that is absolutely not a diary, don't call it that. It's a journal, a, a notebook, where I take note of things that I find in this world. Inside of that cool little notebook, I have note of something very, very interesting that I remember finding inside of this deep cave here. The only problem is I don't remember the way. I, I don't know which way it is. And it's dangerous in here. Just like we did in the other episode, if we want to find diamonds, we need to get deep. Like, below Y16, deep. Eventually, as we find our way deeper down into our world, the slate starts to get a whole lot deeper. We find deep slate block. We find other wonderful ores that now, with Fortune 3, we can mine and actually multiply. Fortune 3, <laughs> we found it last episode? Oh, that was absolutely clutch. If we mine copper with this stuff, it's like, I think it's like absurd. Like, look at that. One stack of copper, almost, from that small pit. Ah, yes, yes, yes. This is starting to look a whole lot more familiar. As we start to move a little bit deeper, we find a geo. We found this geode, and there's water right here. There's also a lot of suspicious-looking gravel, and it sounds like if you listen closely. Now, by the way, if you're checking caves for this method, the subtitles might help out huge time. Turn those things on. So we're caving inside of our cave, and it's now gotten pretty deep here. I see water flowing in the subtitles, and my ears are telling me water is flowing as well. When you see water flowing inside of a cave, then especially if you saw water particles, I don't have any of those here, but water flowing could potentially mean some kind of buried aquifer, or in other words, a buried body of water, a flooded cave. It's not a terrible idea when looking for diamonds using this water method, when deep, if you see water flowing out of anything, maybe try digging around that thing just to see if maybe there is like even more water. If you can find a flooded cave, oh, my friend. Well, if you can find a flooded cave and that flooded cave is a deep flooded cave, then you could potentially be golden. Now with water over there and gravel all over the place, it's not gonna hurt for me to break this gravel out and just see if, oh, and just see if there's more water. It's definitely not an always for certain guaranteed thing. Like sometimes water will generate and it'll just be one single block of water. But typically when I find a little bit of water somewhere like a waterfall or something, that means there might be a flooded cave nearby and it's not a bad idea to dig around. Flooded cave, flooded cave. Hmm, are you flooded? Oh, you're definitely flooded. Oh, 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 wonderful, I like it. Now this is the part of the episode where things start to get a little bit dangerous. But if you're deep and we are negative six, ideally we would be deeper, but we're still deep enough. We move into the flooded cave. With these enchantments, hopefully we'll be able to breathe for a little while. You're gonna wanna move around your flooded cave, dig out some blocks maybe, and look around for diamonds. Because, oh, yeah, like kinda like that. Kinda just like that. Look around for diamonds. Diamond generation, it's not a 1.18 and higher, is interesting. You see diamonds generate more commonly the deeper you go, but also less commonly when exposed to air. If a diamond generates, say, inside of a body of water, you know, kind of like this room right over here, when a diamond generates in a body of water, well, there is no air around until you create the air. Look, long story short here, friends, what I'm saying is diamonds, they actually generate a little bit more commonly when submerged in water. Now listen, sweet, ooh, <laughs> at least three, sweet fortune pickaxe. You need to do the work this time. Give me luck. By the end of today's episode, I'm looking for 10 or more diamonds. Fortune three, you're gonna carry me through this, let's go. Give me as many diamonds as possible. Give me 25 right there. Oh, or eight. Ha <laughs> ha, or eight. Oh, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Door, you're coming with me. Step number one, move into your world and go deep inside of the caves. Step number two, run around in the caves and look for signs of water. Whether that's water pouring out somewhere or maybe water particles, find the water. Then go ahead and maybe break out near the particles. Hopefully that'll lead you into a flooded cave. Ah, it's the same one. Now once you've made your way into that flooded cave, it's time to look around. Look up high, look down low. It's diamond time. Hopefully. Now if memory serves me correctly, this should go down to, to the deeper part of the caves that I was in, and also part of the cave that I just made probably absurdly dark. Aha, uh -huh, yes, yes, it does definitely go deeper. I remember finding some kind of big open room, maybe it was this way or something, and that inside of that big open room, uh, maybe over here? I remember hearing more water. Side note, uh, when I was doing the caving episode, did I really, like, not look around down here at all? I just, like, kind of cut through? I, I mean, I guess it kind of goes up. I see why I would skip it, but, like, come on. <laughs> Who caved down here? It's terrible. So let's see. We'll go ahead and use this water to get down a little bit deeper real quick. Drop some more torches all around us and see what we can find. 
I swear, I remember it being like a corner. Like, I don't know if it was this corner or, or somewhere else, but I definitely remember seeing water drip out. And now let's pause for a minute right here, because here we have another sign of water. Except me, knowing how caves generate. I don't think this is going to be an aquifer. You see, there is no rule as to how aquifers will generate, but typically, when they do generate, they're not going to be in, like, a pillar formation right here. You can kind of see that this is a random pillar sticking up in the middle of the cave. It might have diamonds inside of it, you never know, but it's probably not going to have, like, a giant body of water inside of the cave, buried deep. So we could probably skip it. So I'm having a uh, problem here. I <laughs> can't really seem to find wherever that cave was. I found my spotter room. I swear, in one of these caves, I remember, ooh, maybe it was this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember in one of these caves finding water on the wall. If you find a wall that is really, really flat looking, like suspiciously flat, that might be the sign of an aquifer cutting in. It's a great idea. See it to mine into the wall and maybe you'll find more. Aha. All right, now, uh, seriously, what is going on with me inside of the other episode? Would I, like, not like... Was I not lighting things up because I was going to potentially miss things? Oh, and I hear a glow squid, too. That's another dead giveaway. All right, so we got an aquifer over there. We got to dive into and check out. But over here, we got, ooh, sweet, sweet lapis and diamonds, too. Please, please, give me a lot of diamonds. And lapis, too? Yeah, sure, I'll multiply you. I used a lot of you up on enchanting. It was painful. They didn't want to talk about it. It was deleted anyways. Ugh. With subtitles on, sometimes we'll see titles like water flows, and other times we'll see things like glow squid swims. A glow squid swimming is a dead giveaway that you got a deep cave. Glow squid will only spawn inside of deep caves where it's completely dark. Once I place a torch up there, it's not gonna be able to spawn again. Now it's a little bit hard to see in some of these deep dark caves. A smart way to make your eyes a little bit uh, more acclimated to it is place torches at the top of it. The light will flow down and hopefully reveal diamonds or other tricky blue rocks. Now I was hearing glow squid swims, but I'm not seeing any glow squid swimming, so it's gotta be over here then. Usually inside of a cave, what I like to do when breaking into an aquifer or a suspected one is dig down a little bit. That way the water will hopefully end up just flowing straight down into that and not ruining all the torches that I put. Hey, yeah, 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 beautiful. Just like that. Glow squid swims somewhere inside of this cave. Oh, there you are, my friend. I'm sorry. This is going to be the first glow squid I'm taking out of this world, but I, I got to take you out. I want those ink sacks. Give me your sacks. Wait, that sounds weird. Anyways, we're going to swim up to the top again and place a torch. That's going to make it a whole lot brighter, and now I can see. Hopefully, I'll be able to find diamonds. All right, now look at around inside of this cave here. It is dark. It is deep. It's kind of hard to see. We're going to try and strategically place torches on the ceiling here and slowly move down this whole aquifer. Also, by digging a hole in the ceiling and putting a torch up there, it gives you another spot to move up to and breathe, if you need to breathe. What I'm going to do here first inside of this aquifer is move along the ceiling here and place torches so I can kind of start to like light it up and see a little bit. Now, ideally here, this aquifer being in the stone range, it is definitely possible to find diamonds up high, but it's going to be more likely to find diamonds the deeper you go. Meaning, if we can find an aquifer that goes even deeper than this, that would be beautiful. Also, instead of aquifers, you'll find magma blocks. Stop in these things to get a little bit more air. If you're a little bit more late game and you have options like sea lanterns, frog lights, anything like that, you could totally swim around in here and just drop those things down on the ground. That would be way, way more effective. But uh, unfortunately, I'm not to that point yet. Ah, diamond, diamond, come out wherever, wherever you are. I can't really see down here, so I can put a door next to a wall like that and then put a torch. Then all of a sudden, I can see a whole lot more. And I can see that there is nothing but disappointment here. Now, when moving around inside of these sunken caves, especially if they get smaller, you gotta be really careful. It is so easy to get lost inside of these things. That's why it's a great idea to keep things like doors on your hot bar. If your breathing gets low, which it probably shouldn't too much, at least with the enchantments, but if your breathing gets low, you drop a door down, no big deal, take a break, breathe, and then keep looking for diamonds. Ah, so diamonds, diamonds. I, I'm not really ready to call it fully quite yet, but it's looking like this cave doesn't really get anywhere like deep enough to expect to find a ton of extra diamonds. I think what we might do is kind of call it good here and move back up to the surface because there is another method and it might be a little bit safer. Back up on the surface of our world in the middle of night where this guy has continually stalked me. <clears throat> Anyways, back up on the surface of our world in the middle of night Let's roll it over today, drop off these materials, and move on. Back up here on the surface, there is another beautiful way that you can do a little bit of diamond diving, and it might be a little bit more safe too. I mean, we're still going to be fully submerged under the water, with the risk of drowning at any given second far higher than it would be up on land. But except only this time, we don't have to cut through any dangerous caves to find the diamonds. The other way to execute diamond diving, maybe even a little bit more flawlessly, involves a giant body of water. 
known as the ocean. You see, usually, if you can find an ocean that gets pretty big and wide, sometimes it'll start to get a little bit deep. Using a boat, if I lower my point of view in third person just right, eventually I can basically like x-ray through all the water and actually find an ocean ruin. <laughs> like right there. Anyways, getting my FOV just right, I can sail around inside of this ocean and scan the bottom of the floor with my eyes. I'm looking for a side of a cave that cuts deep. Kind, kind of like that right there. You see? It looks like, from the looks of things, right down below me somewhere, I have a cave that gets a little bit deeper. One of the things that can give it away is down at the bottom of the ocean, if it looks really, really deep and you have magma blocks like far, far away, then you might have hit a cave. Jump into the water, watch out for drown, and sink it down as quickly as you can. As soon as you hit the bottom, either land in a magma block or place a door down. You're gonna need a little bit of air so you can breathe. Now, it's so hard to see right now. If I had night vision, it would be a whole lot easier, especially inside of this door trap right here, but... It looks like I've landed myself inside of a cave. If I go ahead and replace this door right here, move into the door, break a block on the side, and place a torch, then all of a sudden I'll get a little bit of light down here, and I can look up and definitely see that land over me, 100%, I've left the ocean and entered into a cave. Now that I'm inside of a cave, and oh my god, oh, now that I'm inside of a cave, and it keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper, all I need to do here, my friend, is get as deep as possible. Maybe breathe a little bit and look, uh, oh. Look around for sweet, sweet diamonds, just like that. Oh, it's beautiful. This wall is diamond diving. Oh, diamond diving. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. We're going to move over to these diamonds. I'll breathe right here. And you know what? I want to I wanna take this on and celebrate it with light. If I place the blocks, break the blocks just right, I get a torch right there. And uh, diamonds, beautiful diamonds. I see you in full, shining bright. Oh, we only get one. I kind of figured being on a pillar and all, but... Oh, it's more. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, I, I shouldn't have doubted you one single second. We're up to like 15 diamonds total for the full episode, and oh, it's wonderful. I feel like I've barely even done a thing. Yeah, with the right enchantments, the right setup, diamond diving is 100% the way. See, the thing that would make this even more crazy, too, is if I was able to see, like if I had a light source. Oh, have I just found a cave? <laughs> I put a door down and found a deep cave. Oh, that's amazing. Let's check it out. While we're down here inside of the deepest, deep, deep cave, we might as well pop around. Because of how aquifers generate, this isn't actually uh, too uncommon. You could, ooh, whoa, whoa, find a big, deep cave with a skeleton, skeletor, and water, and lava, and fire, and terribleness inside of it. Leave me alone, spider. Not now. We're leaving. We're leaving. We go into the water. It's safer in the water. Never thought I would say it. <laughs> but you gotta be careful. Oh, you gotta be so careful. <clears throat> so anyways, <laughs> I was saying the diamond diving if geared up correctly is absolutely beautiful And it's nowhere near as dangerous as a cave <laughs> Clearly so next up my next plan of action is to maybe just hey keep it inside of the cave for now and I've got a door on the side of an aquifer somewhere that'll lead me into a cave It is a great idea to check random flat areas inside of these flooded caves because you never know Maybe they do lead into cave systems you just have to be careful because I clearly as I can hear here I swear this is probably the skeleton that was getting me, but you probably stepped in the fire good you get what you deserve Hmm. Oh, yeah 100% it was the skeleton. Yeah, you get what you deserve vile creature. Is it a bad idea? Is it a greedy idea to move back into the cave though? Hey, probably <laughs> I'll right, leave it for another time. Oh Whoa, no way. Oh, that's crazy. I was looking at this water saying like hmm in my head like oh, that's weird looking no way, it's a flooded geode. Oh, that's so amazing. If I was going to build... And is that more diamonds? Bruh. No, it's a glowing sack. That's okay. If I was going to build a water base, this would be beautiful, though. You got the geode right there. Oh, that's like a once-in-a-lifetime find. What about right here? Do I see diamonds? No, it, it's so dark. I can't see anything. It's just water. Yeah, so wow. Honestly, the hardest thing about this whole diamond diving experience today is actually being able to see things. Without the lack of like proper light that I can place under the water, I have to get pretty close to things to actually see if it's a diamond or if it's a glow like and tricking me. All over this thing though, this is huge. This is one of the biggest underwater caves I've ever seen. For the most part, we're probably going to want to try and stick down low by the deep slate range, but diamonds can generate anywhere up to Y16. Just because diamonds generate more down low though, don't sleep on the higher up part of the cave. You never know, you might be able to find some extra diamonds side pocket right there with a little torch inside of it and diamond diamonds now at this point finding a few extra shiny blue rocks or maybe even another cave system with a creeper inside of it and yeah you're finding a few extra things oh uh, it's just a flex it's just a nice added bonus to the wonderfulness that happened today oh but actually look at this i move into the cave system and very very dangerous in here oh and a mine shaft 
I was gonna say very, very dangerous in here. Mm, yeah, just like I was saying earlier on, sometimes you'll find an aquifer, and then you'll find more aquifers next to those other aquifers. And sometimes in those other extra aquifers, the bonus ones, you'll find diamonds. Not this time, but uh, sometimes. You never know. A smart way to move around these big flooded ocean caves is kind of like following the walls, if you will. It's going to be kind of tricky to do, but if you can find a border and kind of move along it and maybe like stop every once in a while, place a door, a torch behind it so you can like see a little bit better. But yeah, pick one direction and basically move around the side of the thing. Is that another? Oh, <laughs> it is. It is another cave. Wow. This giant aquifer has led to like caves all over the place. And every single time I, I find more and I feel like I definitely shouldn't be going in here. Like it's dangerous, but at the same time time but at the same time like i mean you never know <laughs> no, you find the deep cave you dig a hole to, to like make a torch and then you end up finding even more caves wow this caving luck is absolutely insane today this is crazy i'm trying to look around inside of that big cave aquifer thing that i found but i just keep finding even more deep caves and i can't help but resist to check out every single block inside of these aquifers anyways aquifers deep caves and <laughs> <laughs> aquifers, deep caves, water in general. Look, I don't know if you see what I see right now, but deep caves, aquifers, and water in general. One of the best ways to find diamonds quickly and easily inside of Minecraft 1.20 and beyond. All right, well, we don't want to push our luck too much here. With a total of 14 diamonds here and then like 15 or something back over at the base, I think we're golden. We got all the diamonds that we need for more armor and even a diamond sword as well. And uh, yeah, we're not gonna push our luck. There's a drought with the trident. Uh, yeah, trying to hit me. I'm just gonna slowly swim into the abyss and swerve left and right. You can't hit me if I'm curving and swerving. No, you can't. I'm not worried at all because I have found the land. Yeah, it's the middle of the night. I don't care. Trident, drought, leave me alone. Watch out for those things. Oh boy, let's get back home. And uh, oh, oh, yeah, I, 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 okay, they're all over the place. They're all over the place. They hate me. Why are they doing this to me? <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. We're going to get back home. But before I'm going to get back home, I'm going to take a nap. To wrap up today's episode on our slow march home, I'd like to take a look at today's comment of the day that actually totally blew my mind. It basically involves like a bunch of math and technical things dealing with enchantments. But apparently, if this is true, <laughs> this has blown my mind. I, I guess I need to do an enchantment deep dive. This is insane. I love comments like this. Well, take a little bit of time and gear yourself up with the right water enchantments and finding diamonds. Oof, it's gonna be easier than ever before. With all these extra diamonds properly ours, we're a huge part of the way closer to taking on that sweet dragon. Patron gang, big shout out, Ape Marie 23 Autumn BC 1117, MinecraftMojo.com, Arlo, AKA Bobby Bobby, and Nick C. Thank you. Thank you all so much for watching. It has been me, Waddles. I will see you all tomorrow. Goodbye. Well, 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 visitors. And before the opening sequence, too. Hey, hey, wait up, wait up. How are you gonna just show up at my house and then just leave? Like you don't even stop to say hi or anything? It's so rude. Come on, man, cut me a break. You only knock at the door once you don't give me a second to get over to you. Have I got the boat for you? Get in a boat. Oh, you with the magic crossbow over there. Funny looking fella. <laughs> I got a boat for you. No, no. Hey, oh, yeah. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. No, this is my property. This is my property. You don't act like that here. This is not how we do it here. All right, don't hear you, Bonzo. Sick him. Sick him, Bonzo. Go get him. Come on. I'm not doing too high right now. Go get him, Bonzo. I am just going to get a little bit, a bit of beauty sleep, and I'll talk to you in the morning. Hey, Bonzo, come on, boy. I thought you were my best friend, a guy's best friend, and you're letting a grumpy visitor <laughs> wander all over the property here. Come on. Come on. You're supposed to you protect the real estate. How you doing, everybody? It's me, Waddles, and welcome to the next banger of an episode. In this episode, we're going to talk how to find every single biome in the nether, and maybe, if we're lucky, every single structure, too. It's all in preparation for something big we're gonna take on next, but I guess I'll be taking it out alone. Doesn't look like Bonzo's gonna help me out with anything. Come on, man. Hmm. Visitors, visitors. For only the second time in the world, surprisingly, a pillager patrol has visited. What I was gonna try to show off here is boats. Boats are beautiful for containing and controlling pillager patrols. Like, they will come at you and maybe be annoying, problematic. Put them in a boat and <laughs> then take them out and seal their tools. Always beautiful. Uh, hey, hey, I thought I saw something in the river over there by the portal. <laughs> Another crossbow, too. <sighs> Off to a great start. Hey, uh, there, Bonzo, get out of the boat. The boat's not for you. The nether, 
It is a scary, evil, dark, fiery dimension. If you're planning on heading out to the nether in search of something, it's a great idea to prepare a little bit first. You may remember, earlier on we been in the nether in this world, but oh, friends, these days are a little bit different. Times have improved, very, very much so. We got a bow now, that's gonna be huge help. When heading off into the nether, the number one tool to have is preparation. Well, hey, preparation and a general knowledge of things and how they're gonna work. When inside of the nether, ideally, most of the bad mobs that we're gonna encounter, if we could encounter them at a distance, that would be beautiful. To encounter them at a distance, a great bow, like this one right here with these enchantments, oh, it's gonna help out a huge time. Now, I would like to spice this bow up a little bit with a beautiful name. Jack Harlow. I, I don't know. I feel like it has a nice ring to it. So we'll go with that. Bow enchantments, bow enchantments. Let's do a quick rundown real quick here. Unbreaking, it's gonna save the durability a little bit. Flame, ooh. I don't have anything I think I really want to flame right now, but when I take this bow and I shoot something with a flame, if it's not in the water, it's gonna catch on fire. When I shot that fish, it didn't say on fire because it's in water and it doesn't have enough health, but it sure got cooked with that spicy arrow. Power is gonna make our bow even stronger, and then finally, infinity always beautiful. With infinity, our arrows are infinite. All I need to have for this bow to work continuously is one single arrow. Other nether supplies that are a must have when looking for specific bios, extra blocks. A saddle, this is a beautiful thing to have. Sorry Camelot, I'll bring it back later. More than enough extra food. After all, it's never a fun thing to get stranded in the nether without enough food. Decent armor, if possible, with maybe even a little bit of fire protection. That'll help save you from the fire a little bit. A couple of extra potions, including fire resistance and night vision. But hey, just like it was in last episode, we don't have those quite yet. So uh, we'll skip them today. One single plain old fishing rod. I think that's the first of the world. We'll bring our trusty spyglass. The fellow's been helping out a lot. And definitely a gold helmet too. And finally, last but not least, even more extra building blocks so we can go even farther than we could have ever before. Let's go to the nether. Wait, what's that, Bonzo? Whoa, whoa, hey, you want to go to the nether? No, you're not old enough to go to the nether yet. That's so dangerous in there. No, after what you did with the boat a little while ago, no chance you go to the nether. You wait here. You got to watch over the base. You never know what Camelot will get something. Now, uh, off to the nether, off to the nether. Previously, when we went into the nether, well, uh, let's just say previously, we went into the nether, we didn't exactly have the best luck. We absolutely didn't have the worst luck, but our spawn here is not very good at all. When going into the nether, looking for every single biome, step one, put on a gold helmet. You don't want to have to deal with the piglin. They're going to get mad at you if you don't have gold on. Step two, pop a portal down, make it a little bit safer, and then look around. 100% of the time, you're going to be in one of the five nether biomes right from the start. This biome that we're currently inside of is the Crimson Forest Biome, one of the most dangerous ones. Now, as we start to find the different nether biomes in today's episode, we'll talk a little bit about the specifics of each one. The Crimson Forest Biome is dangerous. It's got crimson all over the place. The crimson is basically like these tree things. All over the ground, sometimes you will find piglin, zombified piglin like that guy right there, and hoglin. We've seen a hoglin or two before, and they're absolutely terrifying. If you can find one of these mushrooms right here really quick, the blue ones, it might save your life. And actually, because there are a couple over here, we'll grab as many as we can. And that's a hoglin right here. If I place this mushroom down, the hoglin should follow the rules and be, uh, be afraid of me. This thing is basically going to make like a, almost like a safety net, if you will. Ah, uh, you're going to really be over here. Well, if you unfortunately eventually find these things, one of the greatest ways to deal with them, like stay away from them, is pillar up. If you can get like four blocks up and use like an overpowered bow like mine right here, you can take them out. You can cook them. Take them out, cook them, and you'll get a little bit of leather. And ooh, some delicious food too. Before we get too far into things, I would like to backtrack a little bit. When exploring inside of the nether, it's all about the subtle details. You see the nether, it's all about the mood, the ambiance, the vibe. It's got a whole feeling going on here. Inside of the Crimson Forest, the feeling is red hazy fog in the far distance. If we zoom in over here, you can kind of see. It's hard to see, but definitely more so when you're out in the open, like over here. In the far distance, things get a little bit red, and we got these red particles bumping around. Other than be careful and don't lose your wave, my number three nether exploration tip is pay attention to the subtle things here. The fog. If I move over here, it gets a little bit more blue up by the ceiling. Instead of like red, when I move over here and look far away, you see? It's kind of hard to see. The fog, the particle effects, or even the sounds inside of the nether are a dead giveaway as to what's going on when it comes to the biomes. Earlier on, when we came to the nether for the first time, we found our second out of five nether biomes. This biome is insanely, insanely dangerous. It's called the Soul Sand Valley Biome. 
Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, I can't really get into the proper soul sand valley by I'm kind of trapped inside of a big ravine here. You'll find soul sand all over the place, slowing your movement down. To make matters worse, you're going to have skeletons on the ground, and then in the sky, you're going to have to watch out for ghasts. The fog is a cool blue hazy fog. Typically, when starting out here inside of the nether, you're probably going to travel by land. You run around inside of the biomes. If possible, maybe stick on top of trees or at high vantage points. If you're in a dangerous biome like this one right here, absolutely don't get yourself cornered. You get yourself cornered, that could possibly be the end of you. When looking for more biomes, the first thing we're kind of hoping to find here is somewhere that's a whole lot more open than where we dropped into the nether with our portal. If we can get out into the wide open, like let's say over here on this peninsula, and definitely keep the hoggling away. I see you, buddy. I see you. Go away! If we can stay far enough away from the hoglin, it won't see me. I can take it out nice and easily, move over, pick up the drops, and continue exploring. Now you gotta be careful with hoglins because sometimes they tend to spawn in packs. Staying out in the open or up high will hopefully minimize the damage hoglins will deal to you. But anyways, out of the open. Ah, the open, the open. Biome number three, check just like that. Once you made it to an open air area in the nether, you can finally see around. There are multiple things that'll give you clues as to what's going on with the biomes here. Biome number three, that biome over there, that's gonna be the plain old nether waste biome. It's just got netherrack all over the place. This right here is a lava ocean. Not technically its own biome, but definitely a huge generation feature of the nether. If we look around in the far distance at like the fog and the ceiling blocks, we can see if the biome changes. I don't think we are here, but if we were able to say spot basalt on the ceiling or soul sand, that would be a dead giveaway that there's a different biome off in the distance. However, at this point, problem. Right now we're traveling by land, but the land, it has kind of run out here. This is a lava ocean. I only have fire protection four on my boots, and even if I had more fire protection on this armor, it's not really a great idea to swim around in the lava ocean. We need to get somewhere. And to get somewhere, Oh, it's our beautiful, stringy-haired friend. So remember this fishing rod that we built? Well, we're gonna take that fishing rod and combine it with one of these blue mushrooms inside of the table. Then we're gonna put that on the hot bar, put that on the hot bar, and walk over near our strider friend. Strider, sweet strider. We're gonna have to be careful here. We don't wanna fall down into lava or anything, but if we can get close enough to a strider down low in the ocean and show him this rod, it's gonna actually run over to me, quickly. Strider, 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 come on, come on, come on. Uh, you guys are all way too far from me. No, 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 no. So if you get in this situation, you might have to end up using blocks to block out near the strider, but hey, hey buddy, look, look at me, look at me. Can you see me? Hey, maybe you see me? At least, oh, yeah, you definitely see me. Hi, friend. The strider. The strider is one of the many nether mobs, and also, I think it might be actually the only nether mob that isn't just inherently hating you. The Strider is amazing for traveling across the lava ocean. You see, the Strider here, our friend, is wearing like netherite boots or something, which means it can cruise cleanly across the lava. It doesn't hurt it at all. It can walk on land too, but when it walks on land, it'll be a whole lot more slow. This fishing rod is essentially the steering wheel. While we hold this thing in our main hand or on job of the offhand as well, we can basically change the direction that we want to go. We got to watch out for things like that in the distance, though. So. Ooh, the first gas to this world. Now, while on the strider, on the lava ocean, do not get off of the strider. 100% is dangerous to do that. If you can find another strider nearby like that, hey, my friend, you're going to come with me. We're going to do a little, um, nice little trick. Farming a saddle real quick. Using these two striders that I have found, we're going to walk carefully back over to land. We're going to get off of our strider. We're still holding this. We need to get your attention. Hey, buddy, come back. Hey, buddy, hey, buddy, uh, you follow me. Walk with me cleanly over to the land while it's nice and quiet and safe. <sighs> because I need to show him something. So over here on the land, we're going to go ahead and put that away and turn on hitboxes. The strider's going to walk back towards the lava. If I'm quick enough, I can hit this strider. And it, it's kind of cruel what I'm doing here. Ethics ain't questionable, but we got to keep you on the land here. You walk over here. It doesn't have too much health. Maybe we'll hold that for a quick second. Anyways, friend, I hate to do this. It's so sad. But my friend, you have to go away. We hit you and take you out. The piglin doesn't care right there. And it has dropped the second saddle. I turned one into two. And just like that, in one of the most tragically cruel moves of all time, I've taken one strider and kind of turned it into two. Now it's back to the lava rocks. It's time to cruise.
In our search for everything and anything inside of the nether, the lava ocean is basically like our best case scenario here. If I were able to move inside of this lava ocean with a night vision potion, I could see like, well, uh, you won't be able to see very far. The nether has this whole fog effect limiting your distance, but things would at least be a little bit brighter. Moving around in the nether while avoiding gas in the lava ocean is by far one of the fastest and easiest early to mid game methods to get around this place. So the nether waste biome, this is a wonderful biome for building farms, like a gold farm specifically, but for today, it's not that interesting. Doesn't really have things that we're looking for other than maybe structures. If we use this fishing rod one time, check this out. Our boat, it has legs. All of a sudden, the strider is going to pull out sprint here. We do have to be careful, though, because this is going to use up the durability on the rod a little bit. Now, cruising around here, it seems like I wrapped back around to the nether crimson forest bound that I was in initially. It's wonderful, but I don't care about it. We're looking for two more bombs. Basalt deltas and a crimson forest bomb. War warp force, warp force. When it comes to the placement of the nether biomes, unlike the overworld, there's not really like a specific uh, type of spot that you will find. For example, the Soul Sand Valley could generate next to anything in the world. It could be the crimson forest, the nether waste bomb, the blue forest, doesn't matter at all. When traveling with a strider inside of the Soul Sand Valley bomb, you gotta be careful. Gas spawn here all over the place, skeletons spawn all over the place. If you can avoid uh, getting close to the land and having to deal with skeletons while on top of a strider, on top of lava, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be beautiful. Ah, so nether, nether. The soul sand valley biome, I don't really like to try and hang out inside of this biome. If possible, I would like to cut through this biome and maybe find something else new and beautiful. Like, uh, like a structure. Woo, buddy, like a beautiful structure. I didn't think we were going to buy a structure today. You never know. But structure number one out of like two major nether structures, the nether fortress. When on a lava ocean with a strider, you need to be careful if you find another fortress. You're gonna have rage mobs called the Blaze all over this thing. They'll shoot at you from a long ways away. They got like aimbot or something. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, as you can see here, I paused the game with the coordinates on screen. This is a beautiful moment for me and you both, and a moment we're gonna remember forever. I'll cherish the coordinates of this structure instead of a Minecraft guide diary. Hey, journal, journal. Is it? When exploring in the nether, obviously, if you end up finding the thing that you've been looking for your whole life, then great, great news, you're done exploring. Go check that thing out, like the nether fortress. But if you weren't, say, looking for that thing specifically today, write the coordinates down somewhere, take a screenshot, something, and keep moving. Wow, so this thing is beautiful. One of the easiest ways to find a nether fortress is out of the lava ocean. You cruise around for a little while, it's nice, wide, and open. Generally a little bit safe, too. You don't gotta worry about a hog lens, just like the sky and everything like that. But yeah, nether fortress, that's beautiful. Right next to the Nether Fortress, coincidentally, we have our next biome. Ho ho ho! The Basalt Deltas biome. This is gonna be a great biome for farming a little bit later on. For today, there's really not too much here. Inside of a completely different world here, so we can check out the characteristics of the Basalt Deltas biome. Oh, it's interesting. This was actually the final biome that was added to the Nether update, and it was actually kind of a surprise as well. Added later on in the cycle. The Basalt Deltas biome is a difficult biome to travel across. Magma cubes are going to spawn all over this place and jump at you, try and damage you. The big ones are really dangerous too. Also, all over the biome, you have random like pillars sticking out, and then sometimes you'll have magma blocks and lava in between the pillars. Traveling through this biome in the nether is sort of like a parkour maze extravaganza. You got to do a lot of jump, but you got to watch out for a whole lot of lava, and you probably got to place more blocks to actually like, you know, get around inside of this biome. Definitely be careful here. Oh, <laughs> it's so easy to fall. Wow, so inside of our world here today, four out of the five nether biomes have been successfully located. And they're all like relatively close so far too. That's so good. I'm personally so tempted to, to stop and check out all these biomes, but we have to stay moving. Because actually coincidentally, the biome that we need the most for the project that I'm kind of slowly trying to work on is going to be the blue biome. The only biome that we haven't found quite yet. So our little adventure, the project that we're working on, I would like to play a little game with you guys. I'm not going to say specifically what it is or why we're looking for the blue bile, but I'd like you to, to maybe try and take a guess. If you call it down in the comments below, well then, <laughs> oh, well then my friend, you have successfully found out the next episode before I even made it. I like crazy. Is that, is that, what am I seeing over there in the distance? <laughs> oh, I'm seeing... I'm seeing netherrack. Okay, that makes sense. Another thing I like to talk about real quick here, in case we don't find one, is a piglin bastion. Finding a piglin bastion, in all honesty, is pretty similar to locating another fortress. Right now, today, if I was going to find one, the best way to do that would be cruise around in the lava ocean with a strider. 
Other great ways to find a bastion, though, are the other great ways to explore the nether. Run around on land, or maybe set to the sky. Ah, the Elytrum. This is kind of like our first introduction to it in the series. Obviously, it's not something we have in our world quite yet. We'll get it way later on, but the Elytra is an amazing way to travel around the world and find things relatively quickly inside of the nether. Once you find a wide open spot, like I found inside of my world or inside of this random one, if you're careful, you can use an elytra to cruise around this open space. The elytra, it moves pretty quick when paired with rockets, so it's pretty easy to dodge a lot of the big dangerous things inside of the nether. If you're watching this video in search of finding something inside of your world and your way later game and you have an elytra, consider bringing that thing with you to the nether, because it's actually like really, really great. Hmm. <laughs> so I think at this point in the journey, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I'm pretty sure I've circled all the way back around to the nether way spot. What we could do here, if we had a map, is check the map. Let's say you go ahead and swap some stuff really quick, open the map up, and... Oh. Well, that's awkward. Yeah, so if you didn't know, inside of the nether, maps do not work at all. If you try and make a map in the nether, you get this really cool pattern. Maybe you could use that for, like, a fancy, expensive wallpaper or something, but maps 100% do not work. You can kind of use them for the approximate direction, but as you can see, my player icon thing, it's just spinning in a circle, even though I'm definitely not spinning in a circle right now. It's something I was always kind of hoping they would do inside of the nether update, but like add a different type of map, like maybe a new type of paper that you would find inside of the nether, and it would like exclusively map the nether at a certain Y level. Maybe the Y level you made it at or something, but yeah, unfortunately, maps in the nether, 100% and absolutely really cool looking, but also a no-go. There's no help. Oh, blue forest bomb, blue forest bomb. Come out, come out, wherever you are. I desperately need the blue forest bomb. Even more importantly, beautifully, if I could have the uh, blue forest bomb, it maybe pop up really, really. Hey, <laughs> what you doing, wise guy? Right in front of your child, too. I should feel bad. You got a small family. <laughs> you had a family. Oh, I'm sorry about that. It really wasn't my fault. I feel terrible. Okay, we'll move on. Whoa, uh, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, wait a second. Either I went in like the biggest circle in the world, or, haha, <laughs> and I think it's definitely the or, uh, or I have gone and found myself a second nether fortress, baby. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. Nether fortress number two of the day. Wow, this, this is so great. We're gonna have to come back to the nether and check out fortresses soon. But a little bit less wonderful here. I think I need to leave that lava ocean. At this point in the search today, uh, my luck is not going insanely high. I do have two other options. Alternative option number one, not an option I'm gonna use, but you should know about it. Ah, well, would you take a look at that? They're good old trusty bread. Chunk Bays, we're back again. Over on Chunk Bays, I'll drop a link to it down in the description. We've got a couple really, really powerful tools here. There are specific tools for things that you could find, but one of my favorite things is the Seed Map app. From our world, we would need to grab the World Seed. After that, we need to pick the version that we're playing this game on, whether it's Minecraft Java, Minecraft Bedrock, a really, really old update, or maybe a newer update. We find our specific version, which is going to be this one, and then we will go ahead and pick the dimension that we're looking at, say the nether. After that, we scroll down and we got a map of the entire nether dimension. In here, as we zoom in, we'll see different structures located around whatever world this one is right here, and we'll see different biomes. The nether only has five biomes, so you don't really need to use the biome filter. But if you wanted to, you could filter out everything and say only look for the Soul Sand Valley. Move your mouse around and find the Soul Sand Valley that looks like the one you're looking for, get the coordinates, and move over there. So, now this spot right here, I definitely recognize this 100%. I think this is where I was moving along inside of the first time we went to the nether. I moved along until I found a strider off in the distance, and I saw a structure too. Let's check it. Ah, no, it's actually a little bit unfortunate. I didn't bring my diamond pickaxe. I wanted to be like really, really careful here inside of the nether. But this thing, it's a ruined portal. Ruined portals are one of the structures you can find inside of the nether. Ah, uh, strider friends, just give me one second. What kind of loot? Ooh, I mean, some beautiful golden horse armor. I'll take it. A flint and seal, I guess. Okay. I'll admit it. It's not the best loot. At least there's a gold block. When exploring in the nether, keep your eyes out for the ruined portal. It's definitely one of the structures of all time. Oh no, sweet strider. I think the lava ocean has ended. <laughs> We're out of luck, basically. It's the end of the line, sweet strider friend. I don't you so well, but I think we're gonna have to cross the land somewhere to hopefully lead us to new adventures. Uh, strider friend, I need the saddlebag. <laughs> when exploring inside of the nether, it's sad, but it's true. The only way to get a saddle bag from a strider to unfortunately remove that strider from all existence. 
Crap. But you know what? No, you're a keeper. Strider, I could never do that to you. Let's try and move back this way and take a look at this land. It almost looked like I could maybe walk this Strider up the land. And sure, it'll be slow and dangerous. But I could walk the Strider up the land right here on this hill. And maybe I could find more. After all, using the subtle clues of the nether here, we can take a look at the ceiling. And it definitely doesn't look like it curves down. If the ceiling doesn't look like it curves down, it might curve up. And if it curves up, it might be a new lava ocean. So let's see. The Strider can only walk up one block at a time, and it needs to have like a block to start on. So that means if I dig this one out right here, then I should be able to walk right up this block. Mm -hmm. Walk up to the land, and hopefully no hoglins. And... Aha! Uh -huh. Aha! Uh -huh. Alright, so with the Strider, you can actually jump down a couple blocks. We gotta be careful here. If you fall too many blocks, the Strider will lose its health. And by the way, the Strider's health is on that side of the bar. Probably should have said that earlier. Now, at this point in the game, all that I'm going to do is instead of heading to the middle of the lava ocean, try and travel along the border of this lava ocean, and hopefully, eventually, the biomes will lead me to the correct biome. We can use this speed boost thing every once in a while to give ourselves a little bit more speed, but we got to be careful. We don't want to overdo it. Look, I, I, I hate to do this. I really do. I'm not that guy. Oh, my strider and you. Oh, no. That was a mistake. All right, well, I've left no option. You have to go. You officially have to go. You're mad at me. I'm going to have to deal with that. And one strider, one of you. No, not both of you. I got to be careful. All right, look, at this one, I don't remember who's who. It was saddle, you're mine. I am so, so sorry about that, strider. Oh, I took the wrong one. Hey, whoops. Well, let's just say my strider... Oh no, I magically despawned. I need to find another one. Oh, this is so sad. Aww. As I solemnly build out into the lava ocean in search of a second strider. Uh, just, we, uh, a sad memorandum. Our first strider, sweet, sweet Sally. Sally never knew. She was just trying to help. She just wanted to stride and stride and, and stride for, forever. Truly, sweet, dear strider Sally. Just always was going for greatness. I wanted to find every biome in the nether and, and explore and find a blue one and be happy together. But unfortunately, the reality, the sad reality of this cold, cruel world had something different in mind. Let's keep moving. Yeah, oh, hold up, hold up. Strider be chilling. <laughs> what are you doing? You're just like climbing a waterfall. It's like a theme park or something. Ah, oh, man. Strider are such sweet, innocent creatures. It's actually beautiful. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> exactly what I was saying. No. You gotta watch out for gas on the strider. That's dangerous. <gasps> and so, after traveling beautifully for like a million trillion thousand blocks, as lava slowly pours in. <laughs> as lava slowly pours in, we find the sweet, the beautiful, the amazing final biome that we were looking for today. Oh my friends, we did it. To find the biomes inside of the nether, you might have to travel high. But if you can travel low, like as in Y32, Lava Ocean Low, oh, it's by far easily the best way to find things that you're looking for inside of the nether. All right, so now we've finally done it. I can get off of this strider because we found the biome that we needed. It is, I think, really far from the portal. Like, we're at, like, approximately 0, zero for the portal. But this biome is a beautiful, useful place, and even better, it's got a big ocean nearby. This is gonna be wonderful for what we're gonna want to do next. And how did you see me from so far away, or, or did you? I don't care, I'm not taking a chance. So with the coordinates, the location of this biome successfully located, we would have two options at this point. We could either, option one, dig a big tunnel all the way back over to the base, but I, I think it's gonna be a little bit far. Option number two, if I had the supplies, I can make a portal then get out of here right away. But I don't have obsidian for a portal. So option number three here, taking a look at this, but I'm just seeing how big it is. And wow, this place is so big. This is wonderful. But option number three here is we just slowly make our way back home. Now that I have the coordinates of this place, I run them down in my journal. I could get back to this place anytime. On our slow track back home, I would like to answer today's question, the comment of the day. It's a simple one for me. It's right now. It's nothing new. I don't know. It's just so good. It's such a good song. Ah, so, one successful nether trip down, and here we are, back over at home sweet home, yeah, basically. Now, this strider, inherently, is going to want to go to the lava, because that's where it's most comfortable. And temporarily, for now, before this thing walks too far away, hey, come back here, come back here, come on. I didn't even do anything to you. 
before this thing he walks too far away. <laughs> stop it, stop it. Oh, no, you are not. Stop walking away. Why is it? He's just leaving me. How do you do anything to him? For all the journey that we went on, the times and memories we made together, you want to just run away from me. Just leave me. We're nothing out in the lava ocean. Oh, Strider, you're on my bad side. <clears throat> Anyways, I was trying to say, before this Strider just wanders off into the abyss and leaves me for nothing. Before all that happens, we'll make a small cell that looks something like this. We'll put blocks in there like that, and it's trapped there forever. <laughs> Anyways, nether biomes, finding them, that's how it's done. Back inside of the overworld, one final thing that we didn't really get to talk about today is the other nether locating method. You see, let's say you had a really, really bad nether spawn. You know, uh, kind of like our spawn inside of the nether there. Well, long story short, basically because of how nether portal works, if you have a bad spawn, like you don't like the area that you're in, all you would need to do is go to a different spot in your world, like far enough away, and essentially make a second portal. You go far away, like as far as possible. You make a brand new portal, jump into the portal, and check it out. But portal travel, hey, it's a topic for another time. That's all for today's episode. If you enjoy this one and this beautiful bow, make sure you smash like on this video and subscribe. Next up, check out this one. Ape Marie 23 Nick C and Autumn BC 1117. Big shout out, thank you. The bonus other tips, throw them down below, and I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, everyone. Hey, what's up, guys? Scarce here, and welcome to the next Minecraft guide episode. By the end of this episode, we're gonna have a nice Ender Pearl farm inside of this world, and it's gonna be so easy too. To kick the episode off properly, if everything is how it was yesterday, right down below this video, there should be a button that looks a little bit like a like a thumbs up. Do me a quick favor and tap that button. By leaving a like on these little guide episodes I make for you here, it'll let me know that you're still enjoying the series. It'll let YouTube know that, hey, it's not that bad. Maybe send it to somebody else too. Now the toad is which is up dramatically very quickly here. I sure hope I'm not about to regret what I'm going to do here, but so touch, respectfully, trash. I don't like you at all. I think I could roll the enchantments over and maybe get a little bit luckier from the start here. Now speaking of lucky from the start, that's what I'm hoping for. I'm looking for a very specific enchantment, and every single time I do that, the perspiration from my forehead, it starts dripping all over the keyboard. It's not good at all. I need looting three. I, I, I Ideally, uh, my friends, I would like looting three. However, I'm a man of compromise. <laughs> looting two. I mean, technically, I'll take it. Looting two. I'm not of the looting enchantments. It is like the second best sibling. It's achieving, but it's not like fully achieving, like his big brother. Oh, looting two, looting two. Not to brag or anything like that, but considering the fact that I'm in an excess of diamonds currently, I think what I'm gonna do is I'll make an extra sword. I'll swing over to the table. I'll throw this in here. I'll throw that in there. Then I'll back out of the setup and, okay, look, I, I doubt that this is gonna work. Lowering the amount of bookshelves around the enchantment table will probably make the enchantment worse, but you never know. Okay, looting two still. Very, very interesting. We'll go ahead and take that back, throw the sword in here, put the lapis there, take it, and... Ah! I mean, it's not bad. I'll take it. Wow, and so just like that, a smite looting sword. I know one day for sure we're going to build that up to smite five and make that sword be really, really good. Alternatively, looting three? Yeah, I kind of thought so. I can't believe that. On the second enchantment that I try to roll right there, we get second best. And I mean, today, for what we're gonna do, second best is really not bad. Now, all I'd like to do is maybe get back up to level 30 real quick. Hey, yo, 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 actually, this enchantment right here, that was absolutely trash. Let's re-roll it really quick. We'll check the sword again. Hmm, Bane of Arthropods, very nice. And this one, efficiency four. Whew, that looks a little bit better. Anyways, we spent a little bit of time and get our way all the way back up to level 30. Thank you, Zombie Sword. You will come in handy. You're beautiful. And then the moment of truth is upon us. This axe, is this going to be a beautiful keeper or is it absolute? Oh, baby, it's a keeper. Oh, <laughs> that's a keeper for sure. You coming with me? We check for looting. Maybe, just maybe. Yeah, okay, fine, figured. Looting too is gonna be gorgeous for what we need to do. Now let's get back up to the surface and move on. In our slow march inside of this world towards the Ender Dragon and also day 100, this is currently day number 95. It kind of like, well, it didn't really just begin. It's like halfway over. Bonzo, sweet Bonzo, what do you say we uh, ask him a question, eh? Today is time for a little game. Out of all of the combat weapons in the game, sword, axe, crossbow, you name them all. What is the single best one? Like, do you like the sword the best, the trident? Or is it perhaps today's comment of the day? Jack Harbo. How did I miss that? You guys are genius. 
Then so, friends, for today's farm build, this is it's actually going to be really different. This is going to be like basically the only farm in our entire world where we don't really need to bring anything. I mean, because we're going to be in the nether and it's a little bit dangerous, like just in case we'll bring a couple stacks of extra blocks. The spyglass for, you know, spying things in the distance is beautiful. Bonzo, oh, you want to come so bad. Ah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Soon, we'll be back in the overworld really, really soon here. And you'll be the star of the show, I promise. We'll grab our extra nether supplies like this rod and the helmet, but other than that, we're like good to go. Flashback, rewind. In the last episode, we spent a lot of time exploring the nether. We talked about the best way to explore the nether and how to find specific biomes. In that episode, eventually, after like, what felt like a million years, we found the most specifically Pacific biome that I needed. The warped biome. Ah, the warped biome. The warped biome is going to be our ticket to success, the dream that we need for today's episode. Step one for today's build is going to be reunite with our ancient strider friend who should be sitting... <sighs> You're down there. Oh, my, 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 ha, ha, you're down there, but there's also some bad things up here, some bad things up here that are gonna stay far away from me, don't do that, no, oh, my, 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 Petunia Strider, Petunia Strider, what have you been doing while I've been away, seems you've made a new friend, and your friend is simply not gonna be my friend, no, 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 I really hate to do this, and I hope you heard nothing, but stop it with the friends, all right, so farm schmarm, Fans of the finer things, the more technical things in life, I got great news for you. Because today, this episode, is actually super technical. We got a lot to talk about. Oh boy. You know the rules, this is the Minecraft guide. Every single time we get a brand new gem in our world, we gotta break it down and talk about what it does specifically. In our world, we got our sword with smite 4 on it. It's pretty wonderful. In this one, I got smite 5 on the sword. If I can land a critical hit on the skeleton, an undead mob, oh, it's one shot gone. There's actually a big debate within the Minecraft sword community as to which enchantment is better, sharpness or smite. But smite, it raises the damage your sword is going to deal against any undead mob in the entire game. It's actually pretty beautiful. And a mechanic that we kind of already talked about a little bit, every single Minecraft mob has its drops. If I were to viciously and cruelly take out one of these poor unsuspecting endermen without any looting at all, I might get anywhere from one to zero ender pearls. Not too hot. To make a relatively advanced mechanic way shorter, if you put looting on your sword, typically, you can expect to see more drops. This effect is going to translate to basically every single mob you take out in the game. Without looting, I took a cow out and I got two raw beef, that's it. With looting, I took a cow out, I got four raw beef and two leather. That's way more. If I had looting three on my sword and I took out a single enderman, instead of zero to one ender pearl, I could get up to four ender pearls from one single enderman. That is absolutely beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful, and hey, Strider buddy, listen, you're not gonna walk off. You cannot abandon me out here. If you move away from me, then I am trapped here forever. I hope you understand the ethics of that move. That is terrible. Go in a hole, go in a hole, Petunia, and don't make any hoglin friend. No hoglins here at all. Now, uh, Enderman, Enderman. Enderman is a very tall mob. Here's one right there. If we look the Enderman in the eye, as you probably know, the Enderman will start screaming and not like you. If you look at his feet, it, do it doesn't matter at all. The Enderman is one of the strongest Minecraft mobs, you need to be careful. One of the best and safest ways to take on Enderman inside of Minecraft is by building something that we will call an Enderman tree. This is what we'll call an Enderman tree today. We got a pillar, and then we got a 3x3. Three three. With this small but essential structure created right here, I could then safely move out into the open, stare at an Enderman, watch it start screaming and run over to me. Because the Enderman is so tall, if I stand under this platform, well, if I stand under the platform and swing the sword, <laughs> I'm like basically safe. And just like that, one pearl down, 31 more to go. So here we got what we're calling an enderman tree. This thing is gonna keep us nice and safe. Over here, we've got a beautiful, beautiful blue biome, kind of matching the enderman's aesthetic. Over there, in the distance above the fiery lava, we got what we like to call a gas, and I don't like to call gas at all. Go away, good buddy, goodbye. So this blue biome is very interesting. It's one of the strangest nether biomes. Inside of the warped forest biome, you're gonna find blue trees all over the place, just like the red biome. Except, unlike the red biome, it's a whole lot more devoid of life. Unless you're an ender. So here's what I'm thinking, lads. We need to get up high. I was thinking maybe to get up high, we could use these trees to our advantage. Maybe we build like a small bridge, help you out. There you go, the ladies first. Then we could go ahead and go over this way, and maybe make like a staircase or something. Of course, we're going to want to be able to preserve and maintain some kind of way to get back down to our strider friends so we can leave this place. I did highly consider setting up some kind of like convenient nether tunnel. It would cut diagonally that way, but... 
Then I considered the fact that, <laughs> well, after we take on a dragon, we're going to be moving to space. And truthfully, I'm not too sure what we're going to end up calling our forever home, but 100% it's not going to be spawn. If I were to make some kind of big tunnel going back to spawn, it's like basically kind of pointless. So moving into this biome a little bit farther, here we see what I was talking about with no life at all. It's like nothing here. Piglin don't spawn, Hoglin don't spawn, nothing. Nothing. Other than sweet, sweet Enderman. And we can use that to our advantage. Enderman number two, Enderman tree number two. Hey friend, how you doing? How you doing? What's wrong? Oh, you're too tall. <laughs> you should have stopped growing when you were younger. You fool. You fool. Come out, come out wherever you are. <laughs> so we got a problem. Sometimes when you hit Enderman in Minecraft, they will teleport away. And when they teleport away, they like go away, but they're not really ever gone. I don't know if you heard that scream, but that means it's somewhere close. Typically, when the Enderman is not getting over to you, it's like stuck on something. Something probably nearby, and then you listen to the sound, and oh, there he is. You stop it, you leave me alone. Buddy, buddy, oh, buddy, I don't like you. Get back over here and stop it. No more hitting me. Ender Pearl, thank you. Oh, basically, thanks to looting, too. Actually, not smite at all. The three Ender Pearls. Check down. 29 more to go. So early to mid-game Minecraft, or in other words, like any time before you actually have access to the end dimension. When looking for Ender Pearls, this biome right here is by far the best and easiest place to go. Enderman, Enderman, you gotta stay back. If you build a small Enderman tree like this, the safest spot to stand is in the middle. If I'm not careful and I accidentally walk a little too close to the side, I guess because this guy's arms are so long, they could get you easily. Now, uh, so looking around here, unfortunately, it looks a little bit barren, a, a little bit dry. On one hand, it is really, really nice that only one type of mob can spawn inside of this biome. But on the other hand, this specific warp forest biome that I found, that is like mainly a lava ocean, uh, it's not exactly ideal for what we're doing, but we can make it work. Over here inside of the Everything Series world, check this out. I built a small setup for, well, actually not for Enderman or any mobs at all. It's actually for beacons. So this isn't technically exactly exact, but it will work for what we're about to talk about. Mob spawning, specifically hostile mob spawning inside of Minecraft, is kind of complex. Let's say that beacon is the player, in other words, me. If I'm standing right there, anywhere within 24 blocks is basically safe. This is going to be a spherical radius, not a square one like this right here. All of that means that if I was standing right here by this beacon and a zombie tried to spawn anywhere basically within this gray box, it's going to fail. It, it won't work. It's too close. However, as soon as we move out of that 24 block radius, like let's say right here on the exact other side of that gray line, then a zombie could spawn. And uh, by zombie, I mean any hostile mob in the entire game. Could be a zombie, could be a skeleton, could even be an enderman today. Now check out this chart. This chart has even more information on mob spawning. Once we start to go farther away from the player, mobs can still spawn, but basically they're inactive. They like essentially stand there unless they're actually engaged with. And then eventually, eventually, once a mob gets far enough away from us, like let's say that building way over there, if theoretically a zombie did spawn right there because it's so far away, it would probably just despawn immediately or not even spawn. Long story short for us here today, if we're looking for Endermen inside of this biome, they're not gonna spawn right on top of us. The shape of the biome is actually gonna like, it's gonna hurt our efforts a little bit. If I wanted to, I could build one central big Enderman platform somewhere and then hopefully like just look around and attract them all to me. But unfortunately, then reality sets in. And due to the sheer size of this biome right here, or in other words, specifically where the wall is located, Endermen actually aren't going to be able to spawn anywhere up here. This is way less than 24 blocks from my platform right there. Meaning, if I set up a farm, like a big platform right here, it's not going to be very efficient. And unfortunately, uh, looking in the other direction here, a giant lava ocean, <laughs> that's not going to work either. Because mobs, they need a valid block to spawn on. A valid block to spawn on. Hmm, this is another really, really complex mechanic, but it, it'll mainly come into play when we take a look at hostile mob farms, or really just mob farms in general. A valid block to spawn on. If we take a look inside of this farm here, you can see the creepers are spawning occasionally. They walk over to the middle because of the snow golem, and then they're tricked. They fall down. The creepers are only spawning inside of this farm because they have enough vertical and horizontal space, but also because the floor is built out of valid spawning blocks. Now, valid spawning block, hey, it's a little bit tricky. The rules, uh, they are a little bit vague here. When it comes to spawning blocks, maybe the glass right there, the leaf right there, it's not it. It's not going to work. If I built a giant platform and waited for mobs to spawn out of glass, it will never happen. Same thing is actually going to go for any kind of block that isn't a full solid block. Let's say maybe a staircase or like a slab. Mobs will not spawn on half slabs. And yeah, at least the lower half. If it's on the top half, yeah, this is where it gets complex because top half will actually work. 
Taking a look at all the blocks of Minecraft, I kind of made up a rule for you here. For the most part, if the block is a solid, normal block, then this is going to be valid. On the other hand, if the block is a little bit more weird, like let's say it has a strange shape, like really, really bizarre, maybe it's not even really a full block at all, and maybe you could like move through the block or something, strange shape, glass, or maybe the block even gives off light, yeah, if it kind of meets any of those random conditions that I just threw at you, then mobs won't spawn on it. Nylium, hmm, the block that makes up the ground all over this biome, Nylium, 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 yeah, you're wonderful, you're definitely a spawnable block, we don't need to change the floor inside of this biome to get Enderman to spawn. Basically, all we need to do is make sure we're not too close to the biome and make sure the biome isn't too light. You see, if we make it really, really bright inside of this biome, then Enderman spawning might actually get caught out. And same with other hostile mobs. It's something we talked a little bit about in the caving episodes and the zombie spawner episode, but if it's too bright, sometimes a mob will just fail to spawn, even if every other condition like a solid block is met. Ender pearls. <laughs> Woohoo! Hey, light block space, light block space, or for short, light block space is basically what you need to make a mob spawn inside of Minecraft. Ah, now light block space, inside of this biome, currently as it stands, we got a little bit of space, we got no light, and we got a block, it's great. But it's also very crowded. Hey, uh, uh, side note, I, I'm so sorry, I feel like it's like packed with information after information, stat after stat, but... <laughs> I mean, you tell me a better way to make the episode, I don't know. I, I think you... I... And what is basically like the final piece of heavy technical chunk of information today this is a warp forest biome inside of the warp forest biome essentially only endermen will spawn as long as all conditions are met to maybe to help us meet all conditions we could free up a little bit more space and make it a little bit more safe hmm hose 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 where are my hose at inside of the crafting table here we're gonna need to make ourselves a nice little hoe this hoe is gonna do all the work for us it's gonna absolutely eat through all these blocks with all of the mob spawning mechanics laid out in front of us, here's a big plan, the grand scheme. We're gonna move as high as we can up inside of this biome and start tearing it down from the top all the way down to the ground. We gotta remove the blocks, the logs, and definitely the light. <laughs> Finally, it is now time to mine, mine, and a little bit more mine. If I can make an area that is way more wide open, then, uh, well, because it's open, I can see any enderman that spawn and look at them, like close to immediately. Minecraft's easiest Ender Pearl farm. Step number one, go out into your world and locate a warped forest biome. More on that last episode. After you've located the biome that you need, inside of that biome, look around until you can find an area that is like at least this size. I mean, ideally, if you could find something a little bit bigger, that would work even better, but this minimum, I mean, we can make do. After that, it's time to clear out the trees. You're gonna need to move around inside of this biome and take out the trees, or at the least, to take out the lights inside of the trees. In a grand scheme of Minecraft, these lights are actually pretty bright and could definitely cut out a whole lot of spawning. As a side bonus, they're also a pretty sweet looking block. They're definitely nice to build with. Continue clearing out trees, setting up an open area that you can see around in easily until you end up with something that is at least this size. Maybe a little bit bigger, definitely not smaller. In here, while I was removing the trees, I left these trees alone because these ones are really, really tall and also not that important. Ideally, when we use this farm, we want to be able to look around and see any endermen that have spawned. Looking out this way, it's like literally an open void of nothing until we're like really far away. These trees aren't really going to block any endermen to spawn, so you don't need to worry about them. And actually, same exact thing is going to go for the trees and the walls over here. The endermen definitely are not going to spawn inside of the walls because there's no room, so we don't got to worry about it. While clearing out and setting up areas inside of your forest, maybe consider making staircases and easier ways to get around to other parts of the forest. When endermen are going to spawn inside of this biome, they're going to spawn all over the biome, not necessarily right by you. If you can travel it a little bit easier and maybe even safer too, using blocks that Enderman cannot pick up, well, that's an added bonus. Eventually, you will find somewhere inside of your biome. It may be centered, maybe off to the side, doesn't exactly specifically matter, but eventually, you'll find somewhere inside of your biome. Start by towering two blocks up off the ground. After that, start building a square. We're gonna need a five by five block square sitting on the ground, two blocks off of the ground everywhere. If you have anywhere on the square that actually dips down a little bit farther, make sure you raise that ground up. If you don't raise it up, Enderman will get in. 
what I'm gonna do here, I think for the simple aesthetics of my farm, I'm gonna swap some blocks out in a second, is maybe push this land back a little bit too. If I push this land back, it'll be like a little bit easier for Enderman to go around this farm and crowd me. On the ground here, to actually make this farm, excuse me, on the ground here, to actually make this farm a little bit better and safer long term, we're gonna swap the blocks out for, again, blocks that Enderman cannot pick up. Inside of Minecraft, Enderman can pick up the Nylum. They can pick up the Netherrack for sure. That's gonna be a little bit dangerous. Let's say I was standing here and then one just grabbed one of the blocks and moved in on me. Yeah, not exactly great. Also, when replacing these blocks here today, I'm going to consider ghasts. The ghasts are not very good at all. I've seen a couple spawn out over that ocean. By leaving this line of trees right here, hopefully they'll be cut off from me a little bit, but ghasts are really bad. If I build this platform out of blocks, the gas could blow up and then what happens is one and blow it up. Well, <laughs> the platform is gone and I'm surrounded by angry endermen. Not good. Now, only for you guys today. So you can see a little bit more, you know, I... I care about you. We're, uh, we're good friends. <laughs> Anyways, only for you guys today, I'm gonna put light on the ground. Maybe when you're using this farm, don't do light. By putting light in this farm, I obviously light it up and I can see more, but the Endermen probably aren't gonna be able to spawn right here once I move away. Maybe not ideal. Set up a five by five thing that is two blocks, like you can't jump anywhere. And then maybe you turn around and Endermen have already spawned. Hey buddy, hey buddy. Once the Endermen spawn, look at them and draw them over to you. Make sure you do not leave underneath this box because it is dangerous now. Now all I need to do uh, for pure profit and for getting to 32 Ender Pearl is stand here basically and use the farm for a little while. We stand here for a little while and keep swinging at the Enderman until eventually, inevitably, they drop their sweet, sweet pearls all over the ground. I've moved out of this farm once it's nice and safe. And look at that, 11 Ender Pearls. So, 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 my friends are not so much a baby hoglet. No, 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 I'm sorry. You're just not the move. You gotta have to get out of here. Stop spawning over there. No. Anyways, by working on this beautiful little farm that we were working on here today, look at this. I'm loaded, fully stacked up with these blue blocks. Great for building, maybe. And then these things, too, the warp stem. Oh, that's amazing. I don't think I ever had so much early on. Anyways, when setting up this farm, if you want to go crazy, you could go all over your entire warp forest biome and remove all of these trees. The more trees you remove, well, the more blocks you're going to be able to see, and the more blocks Enderman might be able to spawn them. For me today, though, the main part of my farm was focusing on the land up here. So I moved away from this land. I went down to the, the chest. When I come back, Endermen have spawned up here. And actually, quite large amounts, too. And I am going to need to be careful. <laughs> Until you're good and geared up with armor, maybe don't get, like, too many Endermen angry at you all at once. Enderman, Enderman, what's wrong? Oh, you're so tall. You're, you're way too tall, in fact. You can't ever get to me. Oh, I feel so bad for you. Please, please. All right, let me take the pearls as a consolation prize. And you, buddy, come on over here. I got to show you something. Enderman, Enderman. <laughs> Enderman, sweet and wonderful Enderman. Now that we have this area cleared out, I can run around and look around and see if any Endermen have spawned. However, I do have a small problem, and that problem is going to be the lights up here. Like I said earlier on, these lights are really, really bright. If you're going to do, like, the lowest effort version of this little farm setup right here that is already insanely easy. Like, come on, just just take the trees out. If you're going to do the lowest effort version of this farm, like, at minimum, at the least, just take out the lights. It'll make it darker. And ideally here, if you make it a little bit darker, more endermen might be able to spawn. If you have a large cluster of these vines like this, it might be smart to take them out. If an enderman ends up chasing you and you get caught in these vines, like, trying to jump and run away, it'll slow you down. And so far, our farm, that's like the most basic, straightforward part. As I start to move around over here, like I get farther from that spot, the spawning space is opened up over there. As I move over here, I find even more Endermen that have coincidentally spawned over here and are all coincidentally really mad at me for some reason. I have no clue. Try and keep track when using this farm how many Endermen you get mad at you at once. If they're mad at you, you're going to hear them from like a long ways away. By keeping track of your numbers when you draw them over to the farm, even once it does eventually go quiet, you'll know if it's actually safe or not. And so, Enderman, Enderman, I'm actually shocked right now, but this farm is producing and producing. I mean, it's gotta be because we're relatively isolated over here. Like, not too much uh, going on land-wise over there, but, like, they're just spawning like crazy over here. <laughs> I did not expect this. This is a beautiful surprise. And now, another thing you might want to keep in mind when building this farm is if you're next to fire, like, I don't know, by the ledge, maybe by a lava fall or something, well, one, lava is light. It's going to decrease spawn. And two, if you send the Enderman to fire, they might, like, teleport all over crazily. Ideally, if you could take these Endermen out without dropping them into fire, that's going to be better. When it comes to a high-efficiency Enderman farm, building it inside of the nether, I mean, technically, it might be possible somehow. You, you might be able to go on the roof and, and build it, but really, it's all inside of the end. Unless you're willing to spend like a bunch of time going up on top of the nether roof and everything like that, I recommend keeping it relatively simple in the low nether. 
Hey, you just, you just take that block and hey, uh, you let me show you my little friend here, the sword. Hey, buddy. Ah, yeah, you like that? That's not bad. Now, if you built this farm in a smaller area, kind of like I did right here, eventually, after using it for a while, Enderman might stop spawning. To fix this problem, the best move is to move away. This is where the shark comes back into play. You see, if we're too close to a certain spot, then Endermen aren't going to be able to spawn. By standing in my farm and waiting and waiting and waiting, I'm probably just generally way too close up there. I need to move away from that open field to hopefully allow more Endermen to spawn. No, I didn't go too far or anything, maybe like 40 blocks or something, but as soon as we've moved back up here, if we're lucky, there might be a couple Endermen waiting around. If we're unlucky, which we're unlucky, we might have to go farther. So this next part here is where it's really dependent on what you actually got inside of your nether. If you have a big lava ocean like I have right here and you happen to have a strider friend with you, then you could definitely use that strider to reset your spawns. If we jump on this strider and sail out into the lava ocean, like far enough away, well, by running away from that area where we've been sanded around for a long time, because of how mob spawning works, we're actually gonna unload those chunks and probably despawn a lot of the mobs that have just been standing around taking up spawns. Like say, inside of that red vial. By moving all the way across the lava ocean over here, definitely like a couple hundred blocks, I've effectively reset all of the mob spawns back over there. Now this is a mechanic that actually translates all the way out to late game Minecraft too. Maybe you built some kind of super creeper farm, slime farm, I don't know, something like that. You've been using the farm for a long time and you've noticed that the farm slows down. Well, if that happened to be the case, that's probably because there are other hostile mobs spawning somewhere. Maybe, say, in a cave and you're buying a biome or something like that. Wherever it is, you probably have mobs that have spawned and are just idling around, taking up your mob spawning mob cap. <clears throat> oh yeah, mob cap. That's another advanced mechanic we still didn't even touch on. I told you it's a technical episode. Long story short, hostile mobs, only so many can spawn at any given time inside of your world. I think to this day, on Bedrock Edition, the hostile mob cap is a little bit lower. Pretty much every single hostile mob in Minecraft, Enderman, Zombies, they're all the same. They share the same mob cap. That all means if I have too many bad mobs spawned and they're all idling around, if I'm already at the bad mob mob spawning mob cap, then no more bad mobs can mob spawn around my spawn. Depending on your bio makeup, not something I would really need to worry too much about here, but depending on a bio makeup, to make your farm even more safe, it's not a bad idea to put a warp fungus nearby. That'll keep hogling away if you're really close to the crimson. And that's it. Armed with our basic knowledge of Minecraft and mob spawning mechanics, we can make a very, very simple Enderman farm that is actually like, well, I, I'll be honest, it's really dangerous like this. Maybe let's say you're not, not, not the most cautious person. If you want to make this farm even more safe than it already is, you can take some slabs and actually line them in here just like this. By lining the slabs right here, you're not going to have to crouch to actually get out of this farm. But keep in mind that you got slabs right there, which means to actually get into the farm, you're gonna have to crouch like that too. But with the slabs right here, there's no chance now that I could accidentally move too far forward and have the Enderman accidentally give me a tap. Hi, <sighs> and so Ender Pearl, Ender Pearl. All I need is like five more Ender Pearls. With this big old flat old open space setup up here, I can see pretty far, but always, if I wanted to, I could come back in and, you know, like start tearing out more trees, expand the view line a little bit longer too. And so, lads, at this point of the episode, today is grind time. The final thing I want to do is take out a couple more Endermen. Let's do this. I, you know, have never been so happy to see two Ender Pearls at least laying on the ground before. Just like that. 33 ender pearls in this inventory. You know what? Because we're here, why not? We'll grab a couple pearls for the road, too. And so, just like that, Minecraft Guide episode number 15 and Minecraft's easiest ender pearl farm. If you enjoyed this episode of the Minecraft Guide, do me a quick favor and delete that like button if you haven't yet. And then subscribe for more episodes. For early access to these episodes every single time, check out my Patreon. There's a link to it down below. Speaking of down below, Berry Merch is down there too. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Next time I see you, I'll be back over at Home Sweet Home with a, with a nice special. A surprise, actually. I'll see you then. Hey, oh, by the way, completely forgot to say, but the Diver's Helmet, <laughs> Breeze a lot, always perfect. That's the name of it. I renamed it. Before we launch into today's episode, a quick reminder that the Berry Merchant's out now. It's fresher than ever. There's stuff for your pet, 
and a tote bag too. How you doing everybody, it's me Waddles, and welcome back to the Minecraft Guide Series. Inside of this episode, oh, it's down to the dark and evil land, and over to one of the best fortresses ever. This episode is going to be packed with tons of hacks for your next nether fortress journey. Let's do this. Do me a quick little favor if you don't mind, tap that like button. And now, hey, let's get magic. So not the flex, but I've been that Iron Man for a long time. Ho 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 ho, but those days are over my friend. Those days, those wonderful sweet days are long gone. It's time to do a little bit of enchanting. We're looking for a good chest plate and a good pair of leggings. On breaking three on both of them, ooh, ooh, which one do I want to do? I think I, I think I want that one. So look, when it comes to enchanting, your chest plate and your leggings from the table is actually like, ooh, that's good, that's so good. When it comes to enchanting these two pieces of armor inside of the table, there's not much you could look for here. So if you see protection four, it's probably worth it. As soon as we beat the dragon, move over to the new base, we're gonna have to dive into villagers and get this sweet mending villager. That's gonna help us keep our level setting good forever. But for now, I'll be right back. Poor chicken. That poor chicken. My friends, bring out the lobster. It's time. Diamond leggings don't curse me. Don't let me down. We have such good luck so far on breaking three. Oh, 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 I'm breaking three. And just like that, our full set of armor is now basically fully built up. All that I need to spend a little bit more time uh, dedicated to is improving the boots with some water enchantments. Just, just one. And then eventually I'm going to have to build myself up a good helmet as well. But at least for now, with almost a full armor bar down there, we're set and ready for the next part of the episode. What do you say we close this trap door, clear these levels up, and talk about today's big project by... But talking about next episode's project. So actually, funnily enough, I did not plan to make this episode right now. But thinking about making potions and what that all entails, I figured we would take a break and dive into the nether fortress real quick. Talk all about it. Real quick, your nether fortress supplies. Before moving into a nether fortress, grab a gold helmet, grab a lot of extra blocks, grab a bow if possible, some light, a spyglass might help, and lots and lots of extra food too. Always dangerous there. With our brand new, beautifully amazing good armor, we're gonna be really, really safe too. Ah, the nether fortress. One of the two major nether structures you'll be able to find generating in every single pile. The nether fortress is by far one of the most dangerous places to go in all of Minecraft. Your typical nether fortress is going to consist of a long corridors, sometimes out in the open, sometimes enclosed. These corridors will connect staircases and rooms. If you're a little bit more fortunate, you will find a nice loot inside of the fortress. However, no matter what happens, you're going to find some really, really dangerous mobs too. I like to play a little game. Right now, down in the comments, drop your best nether fortress hack. The single best hack that I see will be featured in the very next episode. Back inside of our world here, lads, let's roll it back a little bit. Peony Strider, sweet Peony, how have you been? I hope you've been staying warm. I missed you dearly. Like, I couldn't stop thinking about you. Peony, you're gonna have to come with me today. We need you. And so a few episodes back, we headed over to the nether dimensions and scavenged, scoured the entire thing for biomes. But not just biomes, we were also looking for structures. Inside of the nether exploration episode, where we broke it all down, I talked about the number one best way to locate a nether fortress inside of Minecraft. You see, every single fortress raiding journey begins at the same spot the nether and then a little bit more specifically the nether fortress go into the nether and head low down find a strider get on top of it and cruise the lava ocean until you well un until you realize that you charged off in exactly the wrong direction hold on guys i'll be right back with enough patience and persistence eventually you'll relocate the fortress that you previously found and wrote down inside of your diamond journal then the real journey can actually begin so eventually, hopefully, you locate another fortress. The number one first thing that you should do after you find the fortress before moving into it is scope it out. You're going to want to stay at a safe distance from this thing. There are some very bad, dangerous mobs inside of it. If you're on the lava ocean with a strider, until you enter this thing, I recommend keeping like at least 30 blocks distance minimum. The farther you are, the better. So these mobs won't hit you and knock you off the strider. So, a fortress, a fortress. It looks like my nether fortress right here bridges out over the lava ocean, like quite a bit. On one hand, that's going to be nice for, like, farms and stuff, but on the other hand... Well, cruising around this thing, on the other hand, for entry of this fortress, is not going to be exactly the easiest thing in the world. If you happen to find a nether fortress that is, like, fully over a lava ocean, then you're going to have to pick a pillar and make a staircase. Now, you know how Minecraft works. Not every nether fortress is going to be the same. Sometimes they'll be over the land, and that makes it really easy. If the nether fortress is by the land, specifically land that you could just, like, jump right into it from, like up there, then do that. 
No nether fortress, nether fortress. We found it, we scoped it out, we want to enter the thing now. I think I decided that I'm going to enter this nether fortress from like this pillar, specifically right here. To enter this nether fortress, I'm going to grab some extra blocks, hopefully you brought those, and we're going to walk right up to this thing. We're going to get off of the steering rod and start digging into the wall right here. We're going to start digging up high because as soon as we dig down low, the strider is going to be able to walk into this fortress. If we clear out a space that is four blocks tall and like two blocks deep, something like this, this is going to be set. This could essentially act as our strider garage, the parking spot for now. So now that we clear that out, we go ahead and walk over here and boom, we're a little bit safer. Now the blade shouldn't be able to hit me. To make it a little bit easier to keep the strider in, I'll move back out and put some extra blocks right there. We'll jump off the strider while still holding the rod in our hand, put that in the off hand, and do something like that. You're trapped, buddy. I'm sorry. I hate to do it. Now, I want to make sure this strider does not get lost. If I lose this strider, I'm done. I'm trapped here forever. So what I think I want to do is maybe tower back up here, do a couple extra blocks, and make a staircase into this thing right here. If we keep this staircase nice and short, as in like two blocks tall, nothing will be able to spawn inside of this thing. Alternatively, though, the mobs that spawn inside of the nether fortress, well, they're just like all other mobs. We can stop their spawning with a little bit of light. We just need more than we would need in the overworld. Nether fortress, nether fortress. Now we'll go ahead and start making a staircase up. When we're inside of a pillar here, these pillars are actually solid 100% raw nether brick if you're ever looking for nether brick inside of your world like you want to do a build or something i highly recommend maybe come over to these pillars and like clear them out or something like that when making your pillars you're gonna to want to kind of do a little bit of a spiral action i recommend going like maybe 10 or something blocks and then turn and go back up the other way if you're not careful you could definitely send yourself out into the lava ocean the nether fortress is like pretty much one of the most dangerous structures in all of minecraft the thing that's gonna make it so dangerous is gonna be the mobs that are inside of it now that we cracked our way into here, make a staircase, something could find me if I'm not careful. We're gonna carefully move up, get that advancement, and take this thing out into Wither Skeleton. No, you're gone. What did you give me? You gave me coal. Thanks, I hate it. All right, so first things first, inside of the Nether Fortress, you need to watch out for the mobs. As soon as you break into this thing, if you're out of the open, uh, maybe try, to try and not be out of the open. If you're inside of a tunnel like this, place some blocks on the ceiling. By placing blocks on the ceiling, we can move in this area right here, and every Wither Skeleton won't be able to chase you. Hey, it's beautiful. All right, so Wither Skeleton, check this out. With the blocks right here, you can see how tall this guy is. Kind of like we did for the Enderman farm. If you place blocks right above your head, it basically makes a safe barrier that all Wither Skeletons will not be able to cross. With a safe barrier, we can stand over here and swing this looting sword at the skeleton, and hopefully get that sweet loot. Ah, so the Wither Skeleton, it's got a couple different drops. It's gonna drop coal, that's gonna be really, really nice long term. It's also gonna drop bones, maybe we could use that for like bone meal. The real prize here, the icing on a cake though, is gonna be the head that it can drop. The Wither Skeleton can drop its skull, and if it drops its skull, always a wonderful party. We'll be able to summon in Minecraft's next boss, but for today, we're really just worried about blaze rods and a little bit of warp. Over inside of a different world, check out this nether fortress. This thing is quite literally a maze. That's how the structure was designed. We got long corridors, like I mentioned earlier, with staircases. It is so easy to get lost inside of one of these things. To avoid any kind of bad, terrible mishaps when exploring this thing, you gotta mark your way. And to maybe even more importantly, when entering the nether fortress, you absolutely need to mark your way in and out. What I'm gonna do here is gonna make it insanely obvious is put some cobblestone on the hallway right there. That'll stick out really, really clearly. When I'm far away inside of this dark fortress, I mean, like, there's no way I'm gonna miss it. Another thing you could do is definitely write down your coordinates of wherever you enter the fortress. So, uh, another fortress, another fortress. It looks like we're at the far end of this fortress. That means everything that we're gonna check out is gonna be that way. It also looks like the nether fortress might go up a little bit, so we need to keep our eyes out for some kind of staircase as well. With a vague knowledge of the shape of the nether fortress in mind, we need to look for corridors that reach towards more of the fortress, or go up or down or whatever. <sighs> Inside of the corridors, if you're lucky, oh sweet loot, wonderful treasure. Every single time you find a loot chest, before you open a loot chest, make sure it's nice and safe. Like check the corners for wither skeletons, everything like that. If you're at a corner, it's not a bad idea to put some blocks. Imagine how terrible it would be for me to turn a corner and then boom, just like that wither skeleton surprise and it, you know, takes me out. That would be really, really bad. Corners are great spots to put these wither skeleton barriers. That's what we're going to call it today. So, loot, sweet loot. We got some good loot inside of the structure sometimes. Oh, I mean, I mean, I take it back. I take it back. I'm happy. I'm, I'm delighted. I'm dilapidated. I don't know. It's multi-syllabolic words. It's wonderful. We got some good loot. We got the ward right off the bat. That's check done. Now all we need is blaze. That's easy. Armor trim. Oh, man. 
So when it comes to the, the best loot in the fortress, it's kind of up to you and what you desire and dream of. But in my opinion, I, I would love to find the armor trim to make our journey a little bit more enjoyable and make sure we can actually like take everything. We're going to leave a loot chest right by the entrance. Not a bad idea. No, another fortress, another fortress. We got a corridor over here and a staircase. Oh. Why did I think that was a staircase? I guess I'm blind. Another fortress, another fortress. I like me a good another fortress. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. We have the ward, but this would have been absolutely beautiful if it wasn't for the despicable lava. This room right here is one of the best rooms you could find because below the lava, in fact, uh, scoping it out here, how in the world am I going to remove this lava? Who did this to me? This is terrible. We need to remove the lava somehow. Maybe can I... Hey, can I? Oh, no, I can't. Okay, well, you got to be careful with the lava inside of a fortress. Woohoo, boy. Uh, taking a look at this lava flow, it looks like I might be able to tower up over here and break my way into the ceiling. We need to cut the lava out. We got to watch out for the, listen for the wither skeletons too, though. Definitely sounds like I got a couple more, but lava, lava, lava. We need to get rid of you. You're terrible. You ruin it. So usually, in a good and beautiful world, the room that we just found right here, it's a staircase room. You would be able to find nether ward inside of the staircase room, and it, it's really wonderful. Okay, look, I don't know how to, like, really capture that lava. Maybe this is a terrible idea. Like, probably don't do this inside of your world, but we're just gonna tower up all the way to the ceiling and try and block that up. I want that to leave. Lava, lava, real funny. You go away. <laughs> you killed the, You killed all the ward. All right, so that worked out, and thankfully, nothing's spawned up on the top of the fortress and shot at me. When it comes to where mobs can spawn inside of the nether fortress, I mean, it's like literally everywhere. They can spawn inside of the thing, but also on top of it as well. They could also spawn a little bit below if you had a platform or something like that, but but I mean, you would have to like build the platform and yeah, whatever. If you have a lava inside of the fortress or a whole lot of light, then the mobs won't be able to spawn. Please drop the skull. Ah. All right, so anyways, when you can find these big staircase corridors, typically you'll find nether ward growing inside of these things. Unless lava has poured into it and ruined and crushed all of your hopes and dreams, that is by far the best way to find nether ward in all of Minecraft. Oh. Okay, so I start to hear blaze. Blaze are very dangerous. Inside of a nether fortress at spawners or just inside of corridors sometimes, a mob called a blaze will spawn. The blaze is a very, very dangerous ranged mob, but also dangerous if you touch it too. You see, the blaze is flaming hot. A lot of people forget that if you touch it, it's on fire. <sighs> I was hoping that was gonna be on fire with armor trim, but no. Great way to keep track of things in a fortress. When you find the loot, take it and break the chest. And when you find a dead end, block it off. See this dead end right here? It's really dangerous. You gotta watch where I'm running. I could send myself all the way down into the lava. To make sure that never happens, if I block it off, whenever I come back, I don't have to worry about it. All right, so check out this fortress over here. It looks like it goes into an open part. Gotta have to be careful there. And then over here, I see even more loot. Before I check all of that, though, I think I want to backtrack this way because I remember that the fortress doesn't stretch too far out this way. This should be an easy part of the fortress to explore, check done, check the loot, you know, all that stuff, and then move back over to the rest of it. When I explore these nether fortresses, I try and like to, like, if possible, move in one direction around the fortress. Like, start at one end, kind of explore it, check it all out, and then move to the next end. Now, I'm hearing a whole lot of mobs that spawn over here. I just want to check it out really quick. If you want to stop mobs spawning inside of a nether fortress, in these corridors, drop torches down every 10 or so blocks. It'll make it nice and bright. If you don't want to stop mobs spawning like you want to use it to hunt wither skeletons, then skip the torches. Come on, loot, please. A nice little fortress hack here involves your subtitles. Most nether mobs make a whole lot of noise, but if you want to be sure you're actually hearing what you're hearing, turn them up. All right, so let's try and remember what I was doing here. We got this thing with the lava. Then I think to get out of the fortress, was it down this way or? No, it definitely wasn't. That's a dead end. Uh, yeah, no. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, they're very easy to get lost in. Well, I try and refine my way. Maybe you guys notice something completely different going on here. It is subtle, but if you notice it, you probably notice right away. Oh boy, finally at long last, Minecraft 1.20.1 has been out for a minute, and finally, Optifine is fully out, or it may have been out for a minute, but finally I realized that Optifine is out for Minecraft 1.20.1. With the help of Optifine, I have a fancy little thing called Dynamic Lights, or in other words, easier to watch video. Thanks to Dynamic Lighting, I can hold this torch in my hand and basically move around, make it a little bit brighter for you guys to watch it. Now, Optivine and client-side modifications, cool little add-ons, tricks like that, I will probably talk about those a little bit more later on. For now, let's focus on the fortress. Back up this way and over here, I saw another loot chest that's calling my name. Waddles, waddles, sweet waddles. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me check you out. How you doing? Eh. Well, I guess on the bright side, I can't be too mad because everything that we came here for today, Blaze Rod, uh, Ward, everything like that, 
like we're more than satisfied we got all of this stuff but on like the other side of things the side of me that is very greedy and wants a lot of nice sweet profits i need more well 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 look what we have here a whole group of wither skeletons when you have a whole group i never recommend charging and taking them on build a line like this let them pile up and then take them out alternatively if you don't have a looting sword don't waste your time take these things out range if you got like a good bow just use the bow and don't even get up close don't give them the chance at all <sighs> you blaze stop it stop, stop it you're terrible. terrible the blaze they have like crazy aim bot and they have crazy eyes too they'll be able to see you from clean across the fortress you gotta watch out for these things especially out in the open hmm so at this point in the game here i think our end goal for this fortress today is gonna be loot the whole thing check it all out and hopefully if we're lucky come out of it with trim we don't absolutely need to find a piece of trim but if i could find a piece of trim well i'd be absolutely happy so back in the corridors i remember seeing this room this is a proper nether war room one of the most valuable rooms one of the big things that i recommend looking out for inside of the fortress is corners but the other thing is staircases Staircases are kind of tricky. You can't really see what's up there. You never know if a skeleton or three is going to drop down on you and just try and take you out right away. Now, inside of these nether fortress, nether wart room things, if you take the wart out, you're going to find soul sand. If you want to grow the wart back over at home sweet home, you're going to need the soul sand too. But when digging out the soul sand, be careful. If you jump into this spot and dig all the soul sand out, you're technically trapped. Maybe not a great idea. Instead, when collecting your nether wart and all of the soul sand that I recommend taking, break a couple blocks around it, then break the wart, then break all of the soul sand. <sighs> Alright, so going up here, it looks like we have a dead end. Sometimes it will be fake dead ends and the blocks might kind of fill it in a little bit, so it's not a bad idea to dig the blocks out, but 100% that's a dead end. If you find nether bricks like in a wall like this, it might be like another corridor or something, but there's probably a better way through the fortress to actually find that thing. Let's go back this way. What am I seeing over there? Is that netherrack or crimson? Oh, the crimson ward. It enters the biome. Ah, oh, that's interesting. I don't think I want to check out the biome too much today, but I definitely want to check out more of the fortress. It looks like this boy goes up. It's so tall. This is a huge fortress. This is amazing. It's pretty straightforward. The bigger the fortress, the more loot, the more skeletons, the more whatever that you could probably potentially find inside of this thing. Now, what I want to do here is mark this off. This way is going to be back home, sweet home. I checked out that way. That was checked on, so we'll, we'll mark it with, like, a cobblestone. I don't think I went this way, but I don't remember. Let's see. What do we have? Oh. Maybe I went over here. I don't I don't know. Did I? Hey, somebody tell me. I don't remember. Hmm. This is a little bit confusing, though. So, we got the staircase that goes up over here. Maybe this is what I need to do. I need to go over this way. And yeah, yeah, definitely this way to continue out and explore more of the fortress. Ah, oh, yes, yes. You know what this is? This is the lava fountain room. I have no clue what the technical name for this room of the structure is, but this room kind of signifies the entrance to the fortress if you're coming from the outside or the exit if you're coming from the inside. Every single time you find this room, I recommend right below these fences, place some building blocks. Make it safe. Now, this is an interesting situation here. Our nether fortress this time has actually completely smashed into the crimson forest biome. That means it's going to be a little bit more dangerous. Because this is right at the crimson forest, hoglins at any second could jump down and try and get me. We got to watch out for them. So far today in the fortress, we've been in what I would call the corridors. But it's not all just corridors. This is a more open spot. In the more open spot, it could be a little bit more dangerous. Because sometimes, depending on how it generated, you'll be like above a lava ocean. You could fall off. You got to be careful. Wither skeletons, we wither skeletons. I can hear you all over the place. Stop leaving a fortress and come back over to me. Oh, it, <laughs> oh, that's right. That's perfect. Wither skeletons hate biglins too. It's not usual that you'll actually see them fighting in the wild. This is a pretty unusual fortress, but yeah, it can totally happen. Please, somebody give me a skull. I want your head. Now, inside of the corridors, you need to be careful. Because it's so open, it's not really easy to build the wither skeleton barriers or anything like that. That's why I recommend setting them up by the entrances or the exits to the corridors, whatever you want to call it. It's also smart to use the wither skeleton's pathfinding a little bit here and lure them over to you. Never run out to the wither skeleton. Make it come to you. If a wither skeleton touches you, you're going to get the wither effect, but don't worry, not for very long. The wither effect is really dangerous, though. It's kind of like poisoning, except not really. Like, it's hard to see your health, and you'll keep taking damage. The wither effect can definitely remove you from the world if you take too much damage from it. Rib, wonderful rib. Let's move back over here, and I didn't even see you. How did I not see you? So the one thing to know about these whole open parts of the fortress is you're not typically going to find any chests generating out in the open. If you're looking for the chests, you're looking for the rooms that are fully encased in nether brick, typically. Unfortunately, that means over here, when it comes to rib trim, it's so sad. It's bad news. 
If we want to find the rib, we got to find parts of the fortress that go back inside. So the nether fortress, when generating, it doesn't really always have a proper end. Sometimes it'll just go down to netherrack and then kind of just end. If you dig out into the netherrack a couple blocks, like say, more than five blocks and it's all just netherrack, you have indeed found the end of your nether fortress. In my opinion, the only thing these long corridors that it reach straight into netherrack are good for is... Well, actually, they're actually amazing for nether brick. Check this out. The floor is all the way up there and basically almost like a small pillar forms. The nether brick keeps going and going and going quite a bit of a ways down. If you're ever planning on doing a build using nether brick, instead of like smelting it up in a furnace and crafting it with nether rack or anything, consider going to these fortress hallways all the way at the end and just slowly dig this stuff out layer by layer. But if you're going to do that, before you do that, wither skeleton brace. So that part of the corridor checked on. It's marked off by the blocks I removed and that thing. This part of the corridor. Let's go there next. Let's see what we got. It almost looks like this goes out into, well, definitely a completely different biome. Soul Sand Valley. We're going to need to be careful. But also just more corridor. Oh, I was going to say, aha, it is. I do more of the fortress that I've already seen. But Skeleton, no, you got to get out of here. Skeleton will spawn here too. Obviously, range mob dangerous. You know the deal. Anyways, before I was so rudely shot in the eye a couple of times, I was going to say I put blocks here. It's going to tip me off that I've already been there. This is another type of staircase you'll find in the fortress. You gotta be careful. And because of the shape of this type of staircase, I find that it could be really dangerous. Like, sometimes you'll miss a wither skeleton and it'll jump down in you, or the other way around, it'll be waiting for you. Aha, well, well, well. What was I just telling you about wither skeleton hiding in the staircase here? It looks like our friend has done it. Not so fast, buddy. And now, from a million trillion billion miles away, uh, Blaze has successfully found me. Well, I was trying to heal up. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's great. Try and keep all rage mobs as far away from you as possible. Use the nether fortress to your advantage. Hide behind things. And also, the Blaze, they don't got the best aim. They could definitely make the other mobs in a fortress mad. Now, we have found something very significant. It's significant because it's really, really good if I want to build a farm. Significant because it's really, really bad if I'm just not very careful. Over here, we got a blaze spawner. If I get close enough to the thing, excuse me, sir, stop it, no more. Before I was so terribly rudely interrupted, I was trying to talk about this spawner right here. The spawner right over there that I don't really want to mess around with, get too close to, is a blaze spawner. The blaze spawner will obviously spawn blaze, and then it'll pop into the world and try and take you out. It's really, really bad. The blaze spawner acts as a normal spawner. So, like, if you're within 16 blocks of the thing, it's active and it's going to spawn blaze. However, the thing that makes the blaze spawner a little bit different than the overworld spawner is the light level that you need to get the blaze spawner to to stop the blaze from spawning. If you want to stop the blaze from spawning around the thing, you essentially got to spam torches. It's pretty crazy. It's not worth it. Instead, in my opinion, the safer move, when you find a blaze water in any of these open corridors or anywhere, they could be enclosed too, try and just stay away from the thing. I mean, of course, this is going to vary with how your fortress actually generates, but as long as you don't see the flame particle effects, you're going to be safe. Try and carefully move away from the thing. It looks like down here I have another blaze water. It's good to know that there is no loot ever by the blaze water, like no chest or anything like that, so if you don't want to deal with the blaze, all you got to do is just not go by the thing. Maybe write their coordinates down so you can come back later. But yeah, you know, just generally avoid the blaze water so you don't get floating bad mobs. I do recommend never taking the spawner out, though. Once you break it, it's gone forever. And the experience that you get from breaking it is really just not worth it. A blaze XP farm is an absolutely amazing farm that I would love to build later on in the world. So we'll keep them in mind and move on. So now, at this point, moving back into the inside of these corridors, to make sure I remember that I've already been over there, I'll place blocks right there. Here we've got a small crossroad. Another crossroad right here with nothing there and nothing right over there. You can tell because it just kind of like drops off into the void. It's probably not worth checking out. So that means I got that marked right there. I'll go ahead and mark that right there. That means everything over there is checked on, not interesting. Now I've got two options. I can't remember which way I came from. I think it's that way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely that way. I can see those things down there. So now, that's going to mean if we go out this way, we're in the Soul Sand Valley, out in the open, the good old open. We got to be really careful here. Watch out for gas, you know, things like that. Using a spyglass or the handy Optifine zoom right here, I can see that this is just more open corridors. There's nothing that's going to spawn out here other than dangerous problems. So I don't need to worry about it. So a little bit of a common theme that you're starting to see here. The spyglass and just kind of knowing how the fortress generally generates is very, very useful for exploring this thing. Over here, again, this thing kind of just cuts off. That means this, I mean, we're all the way down here, so we could obviously see. It's the end of the Nether Fortress. One thing that I'm learning more and more from this season of the God that I never thought I would actually say is, well, well actually, this Spyglass is like a pretty useful tool inside of Minecraft. Like, it's great for looking at things that are far away, just to make sure you're seeing what, like, you actually think you're seeing. And whoa, wait, actually, speaking of seeing things, I don't know if I'm seeing this right, but it looks like we've cleanly rolled into a time lapse that's going to wrap up the rest of this episode. 
before we leave this fortress today, we already found the wart, but I don't have anywhere near enough blaze rot. What I'm gonna do, using my knowledge of the fortress, now that I've basically seen it all, is run around this thing and hunt blaze. The safest way to hunt blaze inside of a nether fortress is probably gotta be inside of those rooms because it's confined, controlled, and you can take them out. Running around inside of these rooms in the hallways, I can place more blocks at intersections to make safe spots. But when it blocks at every intersection, or at least most of them, it'll keep them nice and safe. Corners are a great spot for safe spots too. Because of how mob spawning works here, if I put a torch dead center in any of this stuff, mobs shouldn't be able to spawn in your safe zone. Another great method for collecting up a lot of blaze rods relatively quickly here is going to be the spawner. You just got to be more careful. If I go close to the spawner and let the mob spawn, take them out, retreat and repeat, well, it's not bad. And speaking of not bad, today's comment of the day. Wow, that's a beautiful idea. A super simple improvement to the Enderman farm that we talked about not last episode, but the one before that. And yeah, that's just genius. That's so smart. Thank you. <gasps> oh, no. No way. No way. Oh, lads, that did not just happen. Oh, it's beautiful. I knew it was bound to happen eventually, but oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the helmet for the rest of the day. No, oh, it's beautiful and wonderful. Mob hunting today in the nether fortress is not going too terribly. Now, one final tip that I could give you for blaze is utilize things like corners and bobbing and weaving. The blaze have like crazy like like range. They can see really, really far away, but they also aren't that accurate. If I could like bob and weave to the side like this, you might be able to dodge the fireballs. Anyways, though, nether fortress, blaze rod hunting. Right now I got 10. If I could get like maybe just a few more, I don't want to get too greedy here, but if I could get a couple more blaze rod and then go back home, like this little herd. If I could maybe take out this small herd of blaze right here, I think we'd be golden. Back over at the temporary base camp, let's take a look, lads. 13 blaze rod plus two more, that's 15. They doubled the powder. Oh, we're good. We're more than good. Let's get out of this place. Oh, no way. And actually, check that out. That's perfect. I don't know how that worked out like this. Maybe the game planned it or something, but five gold ingots, that's just enough for a brand new gold helmet. I'm sorry, Skull. You gotta come on. Now, for today's big journey home, I'm gonna try and bring as many things as I possibly can. But unfortunately, every single thing is not gonna be able to come home with me. I'm thinking for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave some of the blocks right here. After all, I'm pretty sure we'll be back to this fortress at some point. When it comes to raiding, looting, and checking another fortress out, it's all about marking your way so you don't lose the way and being careful. Petunia, sweet strider, I think it's about time we go ahead and head back home, sweet home. Nether Fortress looting, raiding, 101. That's just about how it's done. Patron gang, a big shout out to my patrons. Archangel, Ground Crazy May, Medical Boomstick, Swoopy Loopers, Noodle Pork, and Bill W. You helped me make these guide episodes. If you want to catch the episodes before anyone else, check out my Patreon. You wait right there, sweet lady. I'll be back for you later. Thank you all so, so much for watching. You're the absolute best. This has been me, Waddles, and I will see you all tomorrow. Goodbye. Hi, how you doing, everybody? The name is Markiplier. This episode, it's all about brews, man. Within the next 20 or so minutes, every single one of us will be properly touched up in our potion making mechanics. And we're gonna add a new build to the world. Finally. In honor of the sweet starter base, the base that has loyally carried us to this point in the series right here, tap that like button for me, real quick. Down below, drop the single best potion. And uh, now look, uh, friends, I hate to begin the episode in such a rush, but as nighttime slowly descends upon our base, it's time for a time lapse. Flashback rewind. In the last episode, you may recall, we went to the nether fortress. Inside of the fortress, we went low, we went high, we went left, we went right, we went everywhere. While I was going everywhere inside of the nether fortress, I was also staying up. In order to get an essential ingredient that I need to have by the end of today's episode, and some sort of sick, twisted, demented, no sleep challenge. Basically, we need to stay up the whole time, even while I'm doing my build. In order to stay up the whole time while I'm working on my build, we need to make the starter base a little bit more safe. In a mechanic that I'm sure we talked about at some point, long story short, mob spawn in the dark. If I blaze torches all over the starter base, kind of like I did over here and get the light level above zero, it will be 100% safe from bad mobs. With that final torch placed right next to bone zone, a solid sigh of relief. Let's talk about potions. So as I'm sure you've heard, potion brewing is one of the most important essential mechanics inside of Minecraft. This mechanic is such an important mechanic that the devs haven't really touched it since like 1.9 or something. Wait, what's that, my assistant? Oh, it's actually one of the most neglected mechanics in the whole game. It hasn't been touched in years and it's so out of date. Oh, okay, we'll go with that. 
Ancient mechanic that deserves an overhaul or not, if we want to talk about brews, we got to talk about Brewing Stamp. Every single potion making experience begins at a humble little workstation called the Brewing Stamp. Craft it in a crafting table with a little bit of stone and a blaze rod, or steal it from your local village. The Brewing Stand is an older block in a game and it's also a pretty clean looking block. It's really, really good for decorations and it's also actually great for villager trading too. It's a workstation. But for today, we're just really worried about this. Speaking of thievery in your local villages, when I was exploring the world, you may remember I took a, I borrowed from the village. When I borrowed from the village, I took a cauldron. A cauldron is going to be the key for our next big ingredient. To brew a potion, we need water. Now we got options when it comes to water. We could put the water in the cauldron, or maybe a little bit more efficiently, we could just source it from our local river, or even just a small water source. By placing this on the ground and then milking this water source for water, it'll never run out. It's not true for a cauldron. So I got a water in the bucket, but big problem. As soon as I try and put it in here, I'm hit with an error noise from a distant time in the past. It, it doesn't work. The brewing sand is actually offering me a hint here. So, uh, yeah, definitely, I, I, your guy definitely has a little bit of a glass. I just, you, you see? It's not that I don't have any glass sitting inside of my building waiting, ready to go for me. I, I do. It's somewhere. I, it's secret, though. Instead, I have been keeping all of my sand at the local river. I don't know. I like to keep it placed out, you know? With this small bit of sand that I have sourced from the local river, I'll swing back to my build and throw it inside of a furnace. Then I'll let it smelt up for a second. While I let it smelt up for a second, I'll go outside and ponder. So I've been up for a while at nighttime. I don't know how many nights I've been up now, but sooner or later, because I've stayed up for a very long time, phantom should pop up into the air. Hopefully, before the end of the episode, I'll be able to find a handful of phantoms. You see, in order to brew a potion, we're gonna need some kind of ingredient inside of the table. Now, in Minecraft, these ingredients can come from a lot of different types of places. Some of the ingredients can kind of indirectly be farmed inside of a farm. Some of the other ingredients will be sourced down inside of the caves. Some of the other other ingredients will be found from bad mobs that might spawn in the sky at nighttime. <sighs> yeah, maybe it hasn't been long enough yet, actually. Maybe I need to stay up like one more whole nighttime. I'm not seeing enough phantoms. With a little bit of glass put inside of our trusty founder's tree, check this out. We can make an ingredient called a glass bottle. With a glass bottle in hand, we can walk over to the water, use it, and fill it up with a little bit of water. This is going to be important for making a potion. To brew a potion, we're going to need a brewing sand and we're going to need water. We're going to need water to go inside of a bottle. It's very, very important. And we're going to need a little bit of fuel inside of the brewing sand, actually. We're also going to need an ingredient that we'll talk about later on. And basically, to start every potion, we're going to need nether wart. We need to set up a small farm for nether wart if we want to make potions long term. To set up a small farm for nether wart. Nether wart, nether wart. We don't want to piece it together in this base. So I was taking a look around here at what we built so far. We got a starter house there. We got a farming district right there and the smeltery back there. Of course, over this way, we got the sweet berry ranch. It's very, very wonderful. But then I kind of had this like empty spot where I'm standing right here. I feel like this would be a really, really good spot to set up a, like maybe the final proper building for the starter home not to put so much pressure on it but sheesh the final proper building for the starter house that's a big task i think for this final proper building for the starter house we need to go all out i want to make something that fits the brewing theme really really nicely but is also still a little bit small i was thinking right here maybe what we could do is start with two sections of three that'll be nice we could probably turn that into a clean looking build then i think i want to have the build cut into the land a little bit now this brewing building, we really don't need much space inside of it. Essentially, all I need is a little bit of room for a workstation, the brewing stand. However, with all of that being said, I do also need a little bit of room to actually grow nether wart. Now when it comes to farming nether wart inside of Minecraft, this is one of the easiest things to farm. Aside from sweet berries, it's so simple. Essentially, all you're gonna need to have is a little bit of space here. If we make this small square, we're gonna say four by four, that should be more than enough, and then place soul sands down, we're set, good to go. We don't need like water nearby, lava nearby, anything like that. It would be cool, but no. With soul sand placed on the ground, all we need to do is place nether wart here. Even if we're in complete and total darkness, the nether wart will just grow. At least I, I think it will. <laughs> Not a big farmer, no big deal. Your alternative solution is, well, every time you want to make a new potion, go to the nether and source it yourself. Run around, find a fortress, a bastion, and take the war from there. <laughs> you look. Maybe you should just farm it.
Pounder's tree, sweet Pounder's tree. Look, you're a special tree inside of this world. I will never take you down. However, all of your friends that stand nearby, they're pathetic and small. I actually kind of low-key, high-key hate these trees. They really are not, uh, like, doing any kind of vibe enhancement over here at the starter base. Before we abandon this starter base for good, we definitely are going to come back in and make it look really, really nice and clean. In order to start pushing that ball down the hill here, we need to run around and deforest every single ugly short starter tree. Other than, of course, Founder's Tree. Founder's Tree is the rightful owner of the world, after all. Not only will chopping down every single one of these ugly trees and replacing it with something much more beautiful make the world more beautiful, but it'll also give me a ton of wood for my build today. So we got our nether ward farm right here. I decided to raise it up one more block. I think by raising it one more block, it'll help me set this build up off of the ground. Because set this build up off of the ground, I think that's what I want to do here. I was thinking about this build right here, and... Like, maybe how cool it would be to have a water wheel sitting inside of the build. And then maybe, like, the builders raised up off of the ground. Like, technically, you could crouch or walk under the build if you wanted to. I don't know for sure if this will check out by the time I'm done with the build. But, oh, boy, I, I sure hope so. I hope this will be a really cool way to start the build. Let's say we have our build's floor, like, the proper walking around layer, be, like, even with those logs. And maybe on the inside, I'll do, like, cobblestone floor or something that might be kind of the vibe and kind of cool looking. And wow, look at that stuff go. I planted that stuff like not very long ago. You saw when I planted it. A guy walks away for one second to get some fences and building supplies for a wheel. And he comes back and all of the ward is like popping off. Water wheel, water wheel. Oh boy, water wheel. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I'm definitely not feeling any, any nerves at all. No, I'm not going to let you down. This build is... Yeah, it'll be a wheel. I, I think we start with cobblestone. Then coming out of the cobblestone, maybe we would do like, like a wood spoke or something. Look, I played my, my fair share of this block game, a little game called Minecraft. I know my thing or two around a wheel. I like to drive. Driving's fun. Cars are cool. And speaking of cars, they have a wheel. Speaking of wheels, I'm building a wheel. Speaking of wheels, there's no circles in Minecraft. I think maybe, maybe if I was going to build a wheel, I would start with something like this. Staircases. It's artificially creating like a round shape out of square blocks. Very quite quaint and beautiful, right? Now, after that, obviously on the side to connect the part of the wheel that needs to connect to the middle part of the wheel, where we do that? Maybe. Something like that. It, you know, like, no, it, it's something like, like that, yes. Always strong. As the Phantom Nighttime descends upon the world to look, I think I have a genius idea. Instead of putting trap doors at the bottom and clogging this whole thing up, it looks really full. What if maybe we just pull the fences out on the top and the bottom? We put some slabs. Ooh, yeah. That's some solid rotational action going on there. I like that. Me like it, me like it. It looks nice. Then to finish it off and make it a proper circle. Ooh, the trap door sits in the water. Ooh, it's clean. This thing is a water wheel. Fully essential for any potion brewing setup. Just trust me. Not to float myself up too much, but I'll pull these corners out and make it even more wheel. With tang. Oh, <gasps> Oh no, oh, epic fight sequence and shoes. Listen, phantoms, you get out of here. No, no, listen, you're trash, you're garbage, vile, scum of the sky. So look, I took him out on instinct, instinctually, with a bow. But ideally, we want to take him out with a looting three sword. I got a looting two, it'll do. If we can take the phantom out with a looting sword before it soars back up to the sky, we might increase the amount of membrane that I get from one of these guys. Three phantom membrane. Oh, it's beautiful. We did it. I'm a humble king, but look, I'm also a champion of them all. Just like that, I called it. I said by the end of the episode right here, we wouldn't. We would actually have all of the membrane that I could ever dream of. The king. Me. Yes. Yes. I. I've done it. All before I even finished the build. I just wanted to see my wheel, I guess. Because I'm feeling real good about this build and, you know, everything like that, I think what I'm going to do is just let nighttime continue to roll out here. And maybe we'll be able to collect us up a couple more phantoms before the end of the day. Now, not to get ahead of ourselves here, but welcome to my beautiful interior. As you can see here, this is the inside. We're going to have a workstation-y thing right there. We're going to have another workstation-y thing sitting on the table right here. Ooh, it's, it's going to be beautiful. And actually, I can store those inside of there for now. It's nice. The inventory is much more clear. The inventory is clear and I need trees. Real quick, we take a pause from building to place some trees. 
And while I'm planting the trees, it looks like my friends from the sky have soared down and tried to touch me. They tried. They missed every time. Pathetic. Pathetic. I bob and weave. You can't hit me. Leave me alone. Right here. Nice drive, buddy. You get stuck under the tree. Exactly why you don't fly around in my base. No reckless flying here. It's a no fly zone. You hear that, buddy? A no fly zone. You go away. No fly. No flying. Yep. You. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Got him. So just like I'm trying to do at my IRL house, when a tree sapling pops up, I, I seriously like nurture this thing and try and bring it to life. Well, yeah, just like I'm doing uh, over there, I'm also going to try and do it over here. Got a little bit of cherry, got a little bit of oak, and I got a couple more buddies from the sky coming to visit me. All right, so anyways, back to the build. For the build today, I have a very solid vision from this point on. With a wheel properly constructed inside of the water, now what I'd like to do is build a simple one-story build. We're gonna have the main door of the house be right there. I walk up the stairs. Then I was thinking, because I have so many phantoms around here. I got so many, this is crazy. Guess it's been a minute since I slept, huh? Then here's what I was thinking. Because we have so much birch wood over here in excess, I might as well like put this stuff to good use. Maybe we build this building out of mainly birch wood, but not like entirely birch wood. Then I think I also know that with the corner view of the swordle over there, maybe a nice open view instead of walls right there, maybe we do like a balcony or something. To add a little bit more detail to this build, I already know it's all about depth. Now, speaking of depth, a little bit of a time lapse enters right here because building. <sighs> It's actually kind of crazy, but we haven't really talked very much about building in this entire series. You see, my goal this time around with this guide season compared to the last one, guide season three. Objectively, I do think I did a pretty good job overall with guide season three. Like it's probably my favorite series ever, but I do think that I could have done like some things a little bit better, including explain nether fortresses and break down some of the more like explorey aspects of the game, if that makes sense. To make a long story much, 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 much shorter, the main reason we haven't done, like, really any building inside of this series is because I feel like there's so much to explain early game and check out. Don't worry, when it comes to building, when we move to this sweet new base, we'll be building a whole lot more farms and a whole lot more beautiful buildings. All right, so moving on up on our build here today, I have an idea. This might be a dangerously terrible idea, to be honest, but the build is kind of cool looking. I got a shorter part on the front. I was thinking maybe on the back part, we could go a little bit higher up and then maybe even mix in some color. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be honest, okay? Tell me if this makes the build like terrible, please. See, earlier on, when we were building, I think it was maybe the smelter, where we talked about when you build builds in an area to make it feel really cohesive, use similar blocks and try and keep things like within a theme, you know, if that makes sense. I've been trying to do that, right? And uh, we, we kind of have like the oak, the, the birch wood, all that kind of stuff, but what about, because this is like a potion -y build, what about like we mix in something a little bit like more spicy? Like say some blue nether wart, because I don't really have enough red. <laughs> and then what if, what if maybe, uh, instead of just making it all like flat, blue, cool, warty block stuff, we mix in a little bit of planks as well. By mixing in uh, something that is very similar, but a different color and texture, it'll add a little bit more detail to your build. That's definitely something we're going to talk a whole lot more about later on. It's kind of what I did up front with the mossy cobblestone. So like, you know, we end up with like a tall tower and maybe we'll continue these oak pillars all the way up to the very top of the build. You know, something kind of like that. Hey, hold up. Is this like literally the worst looking cherry tree to ever grow? That, that's what you give me? I really hope this could work out because I think it'll be really, really cool on the build. But what if maybe we do a little bit of blue and then I'll put like maybe like birch fences as the window up top to pull that color from you know, lower down in the build, up to the top of the build. But, yeah, what if maybe we do a small blue part of the build? I'll slap some more details on it. And then, yeah, I, I think it's looking dreamy. To be honest, I, I think it's dreamy. It might work. Anyways, and what has got to be one of my favorite build hacks ever? If you ever find yourself a building with oak logs, don't forget about spruce. See, I was thinking here, what if maybe to create a, like a proper blend, a border, whatever, we could do like spruce strap doors over there, then we could do a line of spruce signs. Maybe with something like that, it'll make like the transition to blue a little bit less abrupt, you know? Like, I don't know. I think it just kind of hits. One hour later. Start of a brand new day and the build is coming along beautifully. But friends, I got a problem. Bones will come with me. So I got a beautiful cherry tree it grew in, but it also kind of blocks the whole view. I mean, I guess I can't tell if it's actually going to be a problem, because eventually we're going to have a bunch of other trees, but like, whole view kind of squashed to the build before I could even show you. Here's what I came up with. I've got a small domed roof. I got a smaller roof right there. 
This is kind of like a tower section of the build. They got to come back in and add a couple more things to it. But like, not bad. Over here, I kind of went crazy with like staircases and slabs and tried to make a cool looking platform for the ward. I think it's nice. Up here, I was thinking very open for the build. So like a fence gate instead. Then maybe over here, I could like pull that down and maybe even make like a, like a spruce awning or something. I think that could be kind of cool. Over here, ooh, check it, I got a vision. We're gonna put a torch right there, put a fence coming off of it. We're gonna do three fences right there. Then I'm gonna turn and do this. I want that wraparound view. So I gotta turn around and look at the beautiful water. We're gonna come outside of the build here and put a trap door right there and close it. Because we close the trap door, the fence connects. It's kinda cool. Then we're gonna go right underneath this thing with even more trap doors and essentially make a small platform with a trap door and with the fences. Ooh, it's good. For a small low-key little awning, I think, hey, maybe something like that. It's not too bad. At this point in the game today with the build in tip-top shape, I think it's finally time we get to brewing. So inside of our build here today, they kick off the brewing extravaganza. The very first thing I want to do is put our brewing stand on a proper table. After all, right now, logically, by the laws of all physics and everything like that, aviation, this makes no sense. We'll set that up like that. Next up, the windows, they're wide open. Oh, clean it up like that. That looks good. Now, potion brewing. We kind of got a lot to it, but at the same time, there's not too much to it. If we take these... <laughs> uh, yeah, that'll happen. You don't have to get a potion to get the advancement. Anyways, if I have this water bottle, and let's say it was empty, if I use it on a cauldron, I will fill it up, but the cauldron will also drain out a little bit. It's not exactly too great. Once I start draining the cauldron, I can't pull water back out of it. Instead, it may be a more efficient way to do things. Right next to your potion brewing setup somewhere, put a water source. Every single time I use this potion on that, I get water, but the water doesn't go away. It's kind of perfect. It's infinite water. Now, instead of our brewing stand here, we're going to throw our three potions. Every single time you brew a potion, you got options. You could brew one, you could brew two, or you could brew three. The more potions you brew at a time does not consume more materials. So long story short, always make three. Now, with our potions thrown in here, we need to put an ingredient in here. But problem, if I put this in here right now, nothing will happen at all. Same with the nether wart. Nothing. That's because I'm missing the fuel. There's a hint on the icon. When brewing a potion in Minecraft, you need to fuel the brewing stand with something called blaze powder. Blaze powder is from the blaze rod. One blaze rod equals two blaze powder. That'll probably be more than enough for now. The blaze powder will actually last quite a bit of time. Next to any setup of anything, let's say smelting, brewing, whatever, it's a great idea to have extra storage. So we'll throw a chest up there for any kind of extra materials that we have, like ward or something. Now back inside of the potion stand, if we go ahead and move the blaze powder over, it'll bump over and then immediately fill up into this spot. This is kind of like our fuel consumption bar. So now, after this, if we took an ingredient, like let's say a phantom membrane and just threw it in here, still nothing is happening. Nothing's happening because that's not the potion recipe. Instead, for most potions in Minecraft, not all, but a whole lot of them, we need to begin with nether ward. We're gonna put nether ward in there and then we get bubbles right there. No sound effect, but that would be really cool. The bubbles are going to brew up, and this arrow is going to slowly fill in. While this arrow is slowly working its way to the bottom of the thing, do not take anything out. You're going to need to leave everything in. And by the way, these are just plain old water. Eventually, that's going to finish up, and just like that, you got your very first potion. It's called an awkward potion. If I took this out and drunk this right now, I will get nothing. And that's kind of a explained to us right there. No effects, you see? So instead, I'm going to move back over and put that inside the brewing stand, put this away, and actually go outside. Check out the nether wart. While I've been working on a build today, I have not harvested once. This nether wart is fully grown. When we harvest fully grown nether wart, we'll get more than just one wart. It's pretty beautiful. Nowadays, in Minecraft, crafting things, whether it's inside of a crafting table or a furnace, is pretty easy thanks to this whole recipe knowledge book. The crafting table, if you hit this thing, you can see every single recipe you've ever unlocked, even uncraftable ones. Over here, if we open this book up, we can see everything that we can smell. It's pretty much the same thing, every recipe we've unlocked before. However, the brewing stand, it's like essentially the final workstation where there's not like an, an easy pop-up as to how to craft every single thing in the game. Long story short, with these awkward potions made, and next up it's time for an ingredient. Now earlier on I mentioned a couple different ingredients, it could be many different things. For this potion that I would like to brew right now, it's gonna be Phantom Membrane. You could put a golden carrot here for maybe a potion of night vision, you could put something else for a potion of a... something else? Mm hmm hey, anyways, this arrow is gonna fully fill in, and then, once it does, check this out. Right in the bottom we got three brand new beautiful potions. Slow falling for a minute and a half, slow falling and slow falling. Every single potion is always going to be exactly the same. They're going to be identical. Now from this point, we could take the potion out and, and drink the potion if I wanted to and get the effect. I don't want to do that though, because instead we got one more step that we could do to our potion and that's going to be buff it up somehow. 
Now, my favorite way to buff a potion up is going to be redstone dust. Redstone dust. What is redstone all about? Well, redstone, it's it's all about power. If you go ahead and power the redstone, it powers. And then that power, what happens to it? Well, it carries out for like a little bit of a long distance, up to 16 blocks. Redstone, when hooked up to a wire, travels some distance. And speaking of travel some distance, if we put redstone dust into the brewing sand and let this thing brew up. By the way, every single step takes a little bit of fuel, not much though. Anyways, we put redstone in here to let it brew up all the way. And we went from 130 all the way to 4 minutes. Redstone dust takes your potion and carries it the distance. But in Minecraft, redstone dust is definitely not the only kind of dust. In fact, there's a couple other types of dust in the game. What if we were to put the different dusts inside of the brewing sand back there? What would happen? Well, if you put sugar inside of the brewing sand, nothing will happen. You're crazy. What, what do you mean? A sugar potion? What do you want? Like, it'll rot your teeth. If we go ahead and take any of these other dusts and go into the brewing stand, we could add this plain old potion that we have not leveled up quite yet. So plain potions, we haven't leveled it up quite yet. Redstone will make the potion last longer. We already checked that out. What about glowstone? Well, glowstone is going to glow up your potion. Now, every single type of potion is different. There are different rules for different potions. A slow falling is a terrible example because there's only one layer of a slow falling potion. But what about something like, let's say, strength? With the strength potion, we got a couple different levels. If I took a potion that has more than one level and put it inside of the brewing sand and then put glowstone inside of it, this potion will be able to be glowed up. Like glow up, like, like it gets better. That's a memory trick. By putting glowstone dust right here, your potion will go from a level one potion to a level two potion. However, the duration is cut way down. This effect is absolutely amazing if you're looking for like, let's say a little bit more extra strength. Maybe you're trying to take on a boss fight or something like that. That's great. Last but not least, the other type of dust. In Minecraft, we got creepers. You get creeper dust from the creeper if, it, if you take it out. What happens if you don't take a creeper out? Well, it blows up and stuff kind of gets everywhere. Inside of a brewing sand, we put gunpowder in the top spot and a plain old potion in the bottom. I'll let it brew up. Well, that potion is now going to become a splash potion. The potion basically gets everywhere. When we throw it on the ground, the effect like you know, splashes out. It's how you can put an effect on other mobs, like let's say a cow. Another cool thing you can do involving potions has to do with automation. This is something we're going to talk about later on once we do like an automatic potion setup. I hope to get to it in this world, but long story short, you can use hoppers, something we haven't really talked about yet, and load brewing sands up with these things. You can put ingredients in from the top, and then actually you can pull potions out from the bottom too. You might have to get some fancy redstone timer and hopper locking situations going on, but it's actually like really, really cool. It's a nice machine to build. Now, technically speaking, there are even more cool potions that you could make. For example, Dragon's Breath, a lingering potion that's really cool. Or maybe negative potions by mixing in bad ingredients. But in long story short today, for the basics of potions, that's essentially it. Your ultimate potion brewing setup should have a handful of things. Absolutely, it's going to need to have a brewing stand. It's great to have some kind of nether wart farm nearby too. When the wart grows up, you harvest the wart. It'll keep you good to go forever. Water source. Maybe skip the cauldron. It's kind of expensive. Iron after all. Maybe just put like water in a waterlogged stair or slab. It'll be fine. As always, with any setup in the game, having a crafting table is a great idea too. That way you're able to craft like more glass bottles and other things that might be useful to you. Now actually, kind of coolly, you can store things inside of this brewing stand. Let's say I didn't want to like lose my potions or something. I could keep them inside of the brewing sand. They'll stay there. Instead, what I'm going to do is queue this up for my next run. You know, I do think it's kind of funny though, because out of everything in the game that could use a recipe book, definitely the crafting table, a lot of recipes in the game, but the furnace, eh, yeah, maybe not so much. I mean, I feel like things in the furnace is pretty straightforward. Maybe it's just because I played so much, but yeah, I don't know. But the brewing stand, <laughs> like what? Like there's literally a spot for it. You can put the book over here on this side this time. And yeah, I have like a guidebook to brewing potions. I feel like it would help out huge time. Another great thing to have by every brewing setup, extra chests for potions and wart. Maybe what I'll go ahead and do is actually keep my ingredients over here too. We'll keep some fuel right there and then phantom membrane. Maybe to spice it up in here aesthetically, we'll put a, like a stone cutter that'll be cool and check out the view. <laughs> I think the build turned out really, really nicely today. I cannot wait seriously to like go over to the new base and add more builds. I had so much fun building this thing today. I think it turned out like pretty nicely too. And eventually once more trees fill in beautifully, like this tall one right there. Ah, uh, yes. Eventually once more of these things fill in in here, this is going to feel like so whole and finished and like complete there is a couple things that i'm gonna have to come back in and add to before we leave but like tall trees cherry trees every once in a while and uh, one final building over at world spawn well i think that just about does it as the rain sadly and slowly sets in that's just about it for minecraft guide episode number episode number 18 it is now time for today's comment of the day 
In the last episode, I said the best Nether Fortress trick would be the comment of the day for this one, but then I kind of, I kind of forgot. I have some stuff going on in life, and I, I actually had to pre-record this episode a little bit. And so instead, today we're gonna go with this comment: the best Nether Fortress hack will be the comment of the day next time. Another great thing to do before day 100: villagers. Oh, hands down, 100%. I mean, I haven't had, like, the worst enchanting luck inside of this world, but if you're looking for specific enchantments ever, villagers in, like, a proper trading hall, it's gonna be the way to go. I got a little personal goal that inside of this world, by the end, I would like to actually finally build a villager trading hall. It's not something I've ever really built inside of a world, uh, or at least, like, not in a long time. Anyways, though, this has been me, Waddles. Thank you all so much for watching. If you love this series and you can't get enough of it, you want the episodes early, check out a Patreon. And speaking of Patreon, big shout out to my patrons who make this content possible. Tanner B, Austin B, Andrew H, Gabriel Y, Fire Dragon 19 and Infra MC. Thanks for watching. This is me, Waddles, and we'll talk more about potions later in the series. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Hello, friends. It's me, the handsomest there ever was. Welcome back to Casa Mojo Dojo. And more importantly, welcome back to the guide series. In today's episode, we'll be departing the Mojo Dojo and search worldwide of a stronghold. While looking for a stronghold, I got some tips and tricks I guarantee you didn't know. Eventually, once we find that boy, we're gonna crack it cold open and jump down into it. Loot it all. In honor of the very final episode on the first leg of the series, before we take on the end, I need you to smash that like button. It will ensure a smile on Bonzo's face, my face, and... And, well, I just think it will be mighty nice of you. Let's do this. Last episode, we had a busy one. We got the building, finally, at long last, and we actually did the very final big project that we had to do over at the starter base. We built a brewing stand with a blaze rod that looked very similar to that one right there. Inside of that thing, we ended up cooking up a couple potions, all thanks to this fuel right here. Mm -hmm. Early game, mid game, late game, I don't care where you are, blaze rod and blaze potter, they are some of the most useful things in all of Minecraft. Like we talked all about last episode, you use them to make potions. Like we will talk about eventually at our great Minecraft journey, blaze rods are also one of the best fuel sources in the entire game. And perhaps most specifically important for us today, if we take blaze rods and a couple other ingredients and smash them at a sonic speed together inside of the crafting table, we'll end up with a handy little item called the Eye of Ender. Today, the Eye of Ender, well, it's really gonna be our ticket to everything, to be honest. If you're looking to go to the end in Minecraft, you know, open up a whole dimension, explore, take out a dragon, all that stuff, then you need to find a structure called the Stronghold. Now, technically, there is a little command that you could run to look something like that to find a Stronghold nice and easily. Run that command inside of your world that if you're on Minecraft Java, tap there, hit enter, and all of a sudden, poof, you're sent to the local Stronghold. Now, this Stronghold, this is one of the older structures in Minecraft. This is essentially the gateway to the next dimension. A stronghold is composed of a bunch of different rooms locked together by hallways. In every single Minecraft to Java world, you will have exactly 128 strongholds spread across the things in a ring formation. Over at Minecraft Bedrock Edition, strongholds are actually a whole lot more infinite. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the finer details of this thing once we find it in our world, but for the first way you can find a stronghold, there you go. Good luck. Not that you need it if you're doing that. Though Stronghold Generation is slightly different on Minecraft Bedrock and Minecraft Java, actually locating this thing is going to be exactly the same. If you're looking to find a Stronghold in Survival without any commands, it's all Eye of Ender. If you've never done this before, I recommend getting more than 16 Eye of Ender. If you've done it before, 16 should probably be fine. Now getting the Eye of Ender, well a couple episodes back we made an Enderman farm in the Nether. That will help out big time. After that, head over to the Nether Fortress, take out some Blaze, get the Blaze Rod, and then you're ready to go. Other end hunting supplies, of course, maybe a bed. We're gonna leave the base, so you might want to be able to like skip nighttime and uh, well, really, that's it. Like, I guess a map if you're if you're mapping, maybe a spyglass if you're you're spying. To be honest, it's all really in those things right there. Now, Bonzo, sweet Bonzo, I know you want to come desperately, but you didn't join me for crafting the thing, so that means you can just stay here and watch over the cows again. Good luck with that. This is an emergency interruption. Before we get too far into the action today, down below, drop your number one stronghold finding tip or looting tip. Ah, the good old fashioned Eye of Ender. Just like the stronghold itself, this is one of the older items in Minecraft. It's also kind of interesting. It's completely unique. Nothing else does quite what it does. We're gonna use the Eye of Ender in survival to locate the stronghold, but also to eventually open the portal too. Step number one to using an Eye of Ender is get an Eye of Ender. 
After that, after you become that overachiever, you're gonna want to find an open space. Now, this open space, it could be like a plains biome, it could be the top of a tree, or if you're situated in a forest like I am, a body of water isn't bad. After you find that open space, hold the eye of ender and use it. When you use it, you want to keep your eye on it. It might go behind you, whatever. Once you throw it, though, it's gonna go up into the air, about 12 blocks away from you, and hover in a general direction. Now, I got lucky that time. The eye of ender went up into the air in, like, this general direction, then popped and fell down. If it falls back down, you're going to want to grab that thing. You got an 80% chance that the Eye of Ender, after you throw it, will pop into an item form. Unfortunately, that leaves about 20%. <sighs> 20% chance it pops, breaks, and it's done so. Gone forever. I threw the all-seeing, all-knowing eye, and it went off in this general direction. The direction that I'm currently backing up in. That's the way we need to go. At least for now. So the Eye of Ender in Minecraft, it essentially works as a locator item, almost like a, a stronghold compass, if you will. The Eye of Ender, when you use one inside of your world, is going to float up into the air in the general direction of the closest stronghold. To be honest, this is getting into the nitty gritty details here, but on Minecraft's Java Edition, strongholds generate in a ring formation inside of your world. Long story short, from world spawn, there should be a stronghold in some direction, within like a thousand to three thousand blocks somewhere. 1,000 to 3,000 blocks. Hey, it sounds like a lot, but I think this will actually probably go relatively quickly. So I've been running for a little bit of a ways, but I kind of lost my way. If you lose your way, no big deal. We stop, we throw the eye of Bender, and I can see that it's still going in this direction. Please pop. Oh, yeah, yeah. You popped. You're beautiful. They're all going to do that for me today. So two things. So take into account the fact that you might potentially have to go like 3,000 blocks, and take into account the fact that you got a 20% chance of losing an eye of Ender. Although that's really going to mean that you don't want to spam these things. Instead, it's a whole lot smarter to cover some distance before you throw another one. Typically, I would say like 100 to 200 blocks, or maybe like a, a better way to measure it is use landforms. I threw it somewhere, like in the forest over there, and I know this way I could see like, I think a village and a swamp. Mm-hmm. I remember you. Instead of just throwing another eye of ender right now to see if I'm still going in the right direction, what I'll probably do instead, in fact definitely do, is move past this village and maybe like over the hill. Then I'll try again. No! So sad and tragic. The wolves, they've all trapped themselves into a pit in a hole. Taking out every single sheep brand, massacring them along the way. How could you do this? Disgusting savages. Oh! Beautiful. Beautiful shimmering emeralds. That's wonderful. So while searching for a stronghold today, every couple hundred blocks or so, when we get a good clearing, like an opening spot where we can see a lot, we're gonna throw an eye event. The Eye of Ender is a very, very intriguing item. Not only does it mysteriously know where the stronghold is, but it can also go clean through items. Check that, that thing somehow, I have no clue how, but it, it went clean through the blocks. So this is an interesting part of the world. It looks like we have yet another village. Never saw that one before. And we have a gigantic swamp biome. 100% I'm gonna have to come back over to the swamp biome at some point and check it out. I like to see if we have a witch hut inside of it. On my to-do list inside of this world, a witch farm is like pretty hot. It's been a long time since I built a witch farm and they're actually like crazy useful. You can get some really good things from them. Oh, whoa, no way, no way. Moving up on top of this hill, looking around a little bit. That's another village over there. Now that might be one that we went to before, but still one village right over there, one right there. I don't know guys. I thought they made the villages generate farther away. That doesn't look very far to me at all. <laughs> I love it. Now, speaking of villages, if you're playing on Minecraft Bedrock and you're looking for a stronghold, all of it's basically exactly the same. Use an Eye of Ender. However, on Minecraft Bedrock, the stronghold is typically located below a village, so that could be a big sign that you are getting close. But on, uh, on Java, it's not really like that. Eye of Ender, you still lead me out this way and off to the great ocean, too. Eh, I hope this isn't buried underwater. All right, so this might be pushing my luck, but before I get to the ocean, I want to see if maybe it's not gonna, oh, come on, you're gonna send me still to the ocean? Oh no, and even worse, from, from the hill over there that I threw it from, they will only go about 12 or so blocks, but I, I lost my eye, and it definitely fell. So this is where the whole 12 block thing comes into play. When you throw an eye of Ender, it will only travel about 12 blocks or so from you. So if you can backtrack to wherever you threw that eye of Ender, and then kind of like start counting 12 or so blocks, you might be able to find a little sneaky lad hiding. 
<laughs> Not so fast. Anyways, oceans. If your stronghold happens to be located under an ocean, it's gonna be good and bad. Bad because, I mean, it's a lot of water. You might have to swim down pretty deep. But also, maybe good news, because if the ocean is deep enough, it might almost be exposed on the, the bottom of the water. At dawn, I guess we sail. Now, searching for a stronghold in a body of water is essentially the same as it is on land. However, I can offer you this boat trick again. Have I told you about this before? I believe this is Minecraft Java only, but if you get your FOV just right, you can kind of see right through the water. If you can see through the water, you can look on the bottom of the water for suspiciously square land formations. If you're looking around for a stronghold and you start seeing weird square boxes basically popping out of the ocean floor, not really seeing any here, but if you do, that could be a big sign. Aha! Uh -huh. Aha! Uh Aha! -huh, uh -huh. I don't know if you saw what just happened. But the Eye of Ender turns straight towards an ocean monument. No! Don't do this to me. No, you better not. Alright, so I don't know if you saw what happened though. But for the longest time, I was heading out like that direction. I threw the Eye and it turned. Once the Eye begins to turn, that might very well mean that you are getting closer to your goal destination. Now, once the Eye turned and went into the water, it probably sunk down to the bottom of the water. Gotta wait for this thing to float back up, hopefully. Any minute now. Well, lads, uh, I don't know. I don't know where the eye went, but I want to see if I need to keep going. Yes, I do need to keep going that way. Okay, and this time... No! That's what I was talking about. No. So now at this point, considering the fact that my eyes of Ender have taken such a sharp turn from the direction they were leading me before, I might want to consider start throwing them a little bit more frequently. Because eventually, it's gonna go the complete opposite direction. Aha! There you are. Not so fast. So now my eye of Ender, it has changed direction, but it still went high up into the sky. What I'm gonna wanna do is turn around, go back over to where that eye went, go a little past it, and throw it again. Let's see what happens. If the Eye of Ender continuously continues to go up into the sky, you're not too close yet, but you are getting closer, considering the fact that it's changed direction. So back in the boat, and we'll move a little bit over. Maybe this kelp patch over here. We throw the eye, and it still goes up. Seems like it's got to be right over here somewhere. We'll go ahead and sail a little bit more, and maybe here? Uh-huh. Still. Okay. No. 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 Backtracking one final time, this has to be it. We throw the Eye of Ender, and this time, it went nowhere except down. Once the Eye of Ender goes down, that means you've found the chunk. On Minecraft Java, if I hit F3 and G, it might be kind of tricky to tell because we're right on the border. So, I'm gonna go ahead and throw another one, but I don't really recommend doing that. I throw it, and as we can see, it's going right on this chunk border right there. That's why I don't recommend doing it. You might lose it. When the Eye of Ender is finding your stronghold, it's going to actually find the entrance chunk or the corner of the chunk where the entrance should be. But did you know there's a specific way to find exactly dead center on the entrance? So at this point, no matter what, what I want to do is not lose the entrance corner. This is going to be a little bit more difficult to pull off because we're inside of water, but we can still do it. Since we're dealing with a little bit of water, something that might not be a bad idea to craft, maybe have a little bit extra, is going to be fence gates. They'll make air. To find the exact entrance of your stronghold, once you found your stronghold chunk, we need to find specific chunk coordinates. Check out this grade right here. You see those parentheses right there? Those are going to be the chunk coordinates. Inside of a different world, a land that is slightly more dry, we have the exact same thing going on. The coordinates inside of those brackets right there are your chunk coordinates. Inside of every single Minecraft chunk, we have a starting spot. The starting spot is going to be marked and those coordinates by zero, a number in the middle, and then zero. So inside of this chunk, this is zero. If I start moving this way, my X coordinate is going to go up, but also the X of the chunk coordinate is going to go up. Did that make sense? I got one. If I move back over to the starting and go the other way, that's going to be the Z coordinate. So inside of this chunk, that spot right there is going to be 0, 0. This is going to be 1, 0. Over here, this is going to be 0, 1. Over here, this would be 1, 1, if that makes sense. And meanwhile, on Minecraft Bedrock, the same system might exist, but it's a whole lot more difficult to check out in specific because you don't have this hook. Back inside of the guide, at this corner where the pearls seem to have been going to, if I check the chunk coordinates, we have 15 something in the middle and then zero. That's wrong. That means I marked the wrong chunk. The eye of enter will always go to a zero zero spot inside of a chunk. Consider the fact that this is zero zero. That means this has to be the stronghold chunk. Eye of Ender always goes to chunk coordinate zero zero. 
entrance of the stronghold is always at chunk coordinate 4 4. That means from 0 0, if we walk 1, 2, 3, 4, and then from this spot, we go 1, 2, 3, 4. If I dig straight down right here, that should theoretically be the middle of the entrance. Another thing you could do is from the 0, 0, you could just go 1 diagonal, 2 diagonal, 3 diagonal, and then a 4th diagonal. That's where we're going to want to dig down. Now, when I dig down, because we're in water here, if I put a fence gate, that's going to stop the water. That'll make it a little bit easier. We'll start it off by digging a couple blocks. So it goes like that, lads. We're set up for potential pure profit. Now, I know me a good Minecraft trick or two. This trick should work every single time, but if it doesn't work this time, that's going to be insanely embarrassing, and we're going to forget that I ever said anything just a minute ago. It never happened at all. From this point in the game, all I should theoretically need to do is dig straight down, or double dig down, which is where you stand on the border of two blocks and dig down, and that'll drop us down into the center of the entrance of the stronghold. But I guess we'll see. So now, at this point, though, I've lost my fence gate, and I've hit Deep Slate. Once you've hit Deep Slate, it's not necessarily a bad sign or a good sign or anything. The stronghold can generate all the way down to the bottom of the world. So, that 4-4 trick that I talked about. If I stayed lined up, I would be right here. If I dig this out or a couple blocks, I should fall right down the middle of the entrance of the staircase. We're in, lads. Lads, we're in. Hey, hey, hey hold up real quick. Let's actually break this fence gate. With the fence gate right here, I'm going to immediately fall into the staircase. But I can set up an easy way in and out. Now that we've made it into the stronghold champions, the tone of the episode, it shifts. Immediately, I need you to mark your coordinates where you came in or dig a staircase out. Back inside of a different world here, the stronghold is composed of a couple different pieces. We're going to have rooms, and then we're going to have corridors to link the rooms together. The chests inside of the stronghold can kind of be found all over the place, in the rooms, but also the hallways. However, the chests, unless you have some kind of weird generation situation going on inside of your world, will never be found inside of the staircases. You're going to have to be careful inside of your stronghold. You're going to have a lot of long, dark hallways. I highly recommend moving through this thing and dropping torches down as you go. Every single time you find a door, what I like to do is either break the door or leave it open. If it's left open, then I know for sure that I've been there before. To help myself later on down the road when I'm trying to leave this place, I'm going to put blocks right there. That's going to make it really obvious that this spiral staircase is the spiral staircase that leaves the fort. Now, loot of this structure. Oh, boy, I have so much fun with this. I like to explore structures. Oh, boy, I'm feeling it. Today, we're going to find a library, and inside of that library chest, we will find the most beautiful thing in the world. Hmm, hmm, <laughs> hmm, so generation of the structure seems a little bit busted, a little bit strange and broken. Over this way, it looks like there's light. If you're looking for good loot, or maybe the portal room, so you can like, ooh, buddy, stop it. If you're looking for good loot, maybe looking for a library, a portal room, something like that, then it's a great idea to head for the light. Hmm, so many mobs down there. Skeleton spawner at a stronghold? Perhaps, maybe? So many mobs, so many mobs, so many mobs, skeleton spawner at the stronghold. No way, oh, no way. Okay, this is a slightly dangerous situation. A little bit precarious, precarious, if you could, if you would. Why do you all have enchanted bows? You're gonna give them all to me one by one. I will move slowly and carefully into this room with food on the hot bar and skeleton spawner. Oh, this is one of the best finds that I could have ever found inside of this structure. Oh, this is truly a dream come true and perfect. And it's completely busted up the stronghold generation. It shouldn't look like that. <laughs> but we just... Lads, I think I'm going to finally make a stronghold base. I think we're going to finally make a stronghold ba base. I'm in awe, shock, and disbelief. All right, so real quick, we'll move down here and make sure this is nice and safe. Considering the fact that I just found one of the literal best strongholds in the world, we need to make sure no creepers will go back over to where that thing is. Inside of the stronghold, you're going to find staircases that will go down, and sometimes you'll find flat walls. Just like we talked about in the Nether Fortress episode. Unfortunately, when you find corridors that lead to walls that look like that, it's most likely a dead end. If you want to, you could like double check mine into the walls a couple blocks, but I mean, I can guarantee it. The stronghold is over. It's done. However, back this way, we have another staircase that goes down. A staircase that goes down and spirals and spirals deeper and deeper. Hmm. So, back over this way, we have a staircase that I went to. Check done, that's good. And then that way, check done, that's good. I think I got that whole wing. Moving back over this way, this is the way to the skeleton spawner. I'll mark that like that. Let's go over here and see what we got. I, I gotta find an altar chest sooner or later. Iron doors. Inside of your stronghold, you're going to find iron doors. Sometimes there is buttons on the walls. You can open uh, the doors with the buttons like that. Jail room. This is a room that you could find inside of the stronghold. The jail room has a couple of jail cells, but unfortunately, unless you're like coincidentally lucky and find a mob inside of the cell, 
There will be nothing inside of the jail cells. And we have another dead end. All right, so at this point, using the map that I've laid out inside of my head of this structure, I've got it. This whole wing is all dead ends. I think that means I can backtrack and go up. When running around inside of a stronghold, you're looking for a small handful of things. Of course, you want to find that sweet loot. But it's not all just loot. You're also probably looking for a specific room, the portal room. You also should be looking for a library. <laughs> oh, we done it. I know exactly what's going to be inside of the library inside of one of these chests. That's right, friends. That's right. I told you I would do it eventually. Armor trim. Sweet, beautiful Minecraft 1.20. Deliciously tasting armor trim and enchantments. The enchanted books that you can find inside of the stronghold can have basically every enchantment in the game other than two on them. Ooh, these are some good books right there. Look at that one. That's good. This one is really, really good. That's going to be wonderful for the trident, actually. Oh, or boots. Ooh, decisions. And that's perfect for the bow. That's going on it. Speaking of bows, these two bows that I found not too hot, and then these books, I mean, those are nice too. Armor trim. Every single time you find the library inside of a stronghold in 1.20, you find a chest inside of it. There's guarantee armor trim in these chests. One in both chests. When it comes to loot inside of a stronghold, there is a handful of good things that you could find. Enchanted books and armor trim being some of them. If you're a little bit more lucky, you could also perhaps find a golden apple and maybe even a music disc too. Another great thing about the stronghold is the blocks it's built out of. All over the stronghold, you're going to have a lot of stone bricks. It's wonderful. And inside of the library, so many books. If you need more books for an enchanting setup, well, this is going to be the way to go. I will leave the library alone, preserve it, and come back later. I love how close this is to the spawner, too. This is going to be such a nice outpost later on. I mean, like, look, I feel like with a, such a good stronghold, we legally kind of have to set up an outpost here, right? What do you guys think? So moving back over here, I, I want to mark the good wing. I mean, the bookshelves will give it away, but a cobblestone right there, 100%. That means spawner and bookshelves over there. Let's go back over this way down the staircase. What do we have? Hmm. Another jail and a crossroads room. Or at least a, a room. Very nice gold door. A room that I'm going to call the crossroads room. I don't know the technical name, but hoo hoo. This is an altar chest. Inside of the stronghold, in the altar chest, you could also, if you're lucky, find armor trim. But the odds are definitely not guaranteed. Whole lot lower chance. Hmm, moving around here, the stronghold gets really busted up and broken. This is quite strange generation, but I think it'll be fine. Let's backtrack and go through this door, door number two. Through door number two, we have even more iron doors and a creeper. Ooh, explosive. Just stay away from me, lad. No, both of you, all of you. Ooh, and silverfish. Let's talk about those. So the stronghold is some kind of strange ancient structure. Inside of this thing, you'll have trap blocks. If you break the trap blocks, which are actually kind of hard to tell, but basically they just break quicker. But if you break the trap blocks, there could be stone bricks all over the place. Silverfish will come out of them. These infested blocks are infested with silverfish and silverfish are not exactly nice. It's a bad mob. It'll deal damage to you, but not very much. The silverfish gets a little bit more dangerous, to be honest, in, like, large numbers. If you have, like, a lot of silverfish swarming you, it could be, like, potentially pretty dangerous. So here we have another interesting room. This one is just, like, this got ominous vibes all over the thing to me. It's weird. It's like a strange altar in the middle of the room with torches. It doesn't necessarily signify anything. It's just weird. And so it looks like down that way, with that weird altar thing, it's just more dead ends, unfortunately. Let's backtrack and go back this way. I know there's more. Moving back over here, I can hear like a million and a half mobs. The mobs sometimes could be a giveaway that there's more of the fortress that you have to check out, or it could always just be a giveaway that there's a lot of caves nearby that are dark and mobs have spawned in them. Hmm, altar chest, please. Trim? Oh, oh, beautiful trim. We're lucky today. Oh, that's amazing. All right, first the Eye of Ender, next up the trim, and third up the second library of the day. Yes, wonderful. By the way, cobwebs, an uncraftable item. It's not a great idea to break them with a sword. Instead, mine them with shears. You'll get the item, then you could use them in a build later on. Use them in a armor later on, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> armor trim, four of them, that's a full set. Now let's take a look at this. Flame and ro ooh, 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 great all over the place. So when it comes to uh, looting the stronghold, taking all the loot home, admittedly, I did kind of forget one giant component. That's gonna be an ender chest. At this point in the game, before the end, the best way to- Oh, that's terrifying. I hate the door breaking noise. Zombies will do that sometimes. <laughs> that, that scares me. Anyways, at this point in the game, before the end, the best way to expand your inventory is with a little thing called the ender chest. I didn't make it. We'll talk about it later, though. Five pieces of armor trim. That's gonna mean enough pieces of armor trim for a full set of armor and one trim that I don't even use up. Like, I just hold it later on. <laughs> that's wonderful. Going back up this way, that thing marks all of the good stuff that we found, which means over this way, I should have the staircase to leave the stronghold. 
What I think I want to do really quick, yes, over here. Eventually, we'll be coming back over to this stronghold, then definitely heading over to the end from this thing. When I come back over to the stronghold to use what it's actually here for, I'll pick up all of these things. So conveniently here, it looks like I have a hallway that I never went down, and it stretches back towards where I just was. Let's go down this hallway and see what's up. We get a staircase that goes down, we get doors and zombies. Hmm, I wonder if that's what I was hearing, like the zombies smashing a door down. Unfortunately, this darkness, oh. Never mind, I take it back. This is not unfortunate. I was gonna say, there, there's lava in that room, and it makes it really bright. Oh, we did it. Oh, we did it, we found the wonderful room. It's gonna always have a spawner, be careful. But it's also gonna have a portal with eyes that we need to load up into it. Looks like I need 11. Mm-hmm. And speaking of 11, oh, no way. Uh, anyway, silverfish spawner inside of this room. It's potentially dangerous. This could cause a large amount of silverfish to break out of the walls. So break it if you want. I think I kind of want to save it, though. After all, I'm going to come back here and set up an outpost for sure. And so just like that, we've done it. It looks like straight off from the entrance if I have known and just went straight out that whole time. <laughs> That's amazing to know, and it's going to make it really easy to get back into the portal next time. But before next time, let's finish looting this boy. Let's go. And so at this point in our stronghold run today, leaving no door left unbroken, no corridor left unlit, and no chest left unbroken, I think we just about done it. I'm pretty sure I've seen every single corner, corridor, and hallway inside of this entire stronghold. All right, so for our loot run today, I mean, I didn't take every single piece of loot here, but the good books, ooh, there's so many good books. I think the most important one for me to take home with me is gonna be that. Armor trim, 100%. I'm not leaving you here, baby. You gotta come with me. Now, just to make sure I don't make any mistakes here next episode and forget to bring these back with me, I'm gonna leave all of my extra I have ender right here in a chest inside of the stronghold. To break my way out of the stronghold, I'm gonna need to break that fence gate, which is gonna let water pour down. If I break this block right here, then when I break these blocks right here, then the fence gate right up here, water should only pour straight down and mess up none of the torches down below. That's gonna make it really easy, or at least a little bit easier, for me to get in and out of the structure. This stronghold, one of Minecraft's oldest structures, but also one of the most important ones. As we talked all about today, it's really not too hard to find a stronghold. Pretty straightforward. Once you find the thing and actually break your way into it, as long as you're careful and maybe use the structure's features to your advantage, closing doors when you get overwhelmed with mobs, it's not that bad to loot too. Considering the fact that our stronghold is out here in the middle of the ocean and could definitely get lost really, really easily, I'm gonna make this pillar. I don't think there's any way in the world that I lose track of this pillar. The pillar signifies that at the bottom of the ocean, I got a tunnel down. My friends, officially, next episode, oh, it's time. Big shout out, patron gang, Austin B, Andrew H, Gabriel Y, Fire Dragon 19, Empress MC, and the Great Vegeta. If you love this world and you want to see the episodes early, check out my Patreon. If you're looking for world downloads, then tap that join button right here on the channel. Oh, and that number one Nether Fortress tip, today's comment of the day. I saw a lot of really amazing tips in a comments of the Nether Fortress episode. Chef's kiss to all of you. One that I saw a couple times though, that kind of blew my mind because I always forget about. Barter with the piglins for fire resistance potion. Oh, that is so smart. Let's make this a trend on any of these episodes where there's a topic. Put more tips down in the comments. I love it. Anyways, it has been me, Waddles, and I will see you all tomorrow. Goodbye. Good morning, everybody. It's me, Waddles, and in today's banger of a guide episode, we're gonna take on the dragon. Then that's it. That's fully and wholly it for the intro today, lads. I mean, of course, I've got some tips and tricks for you that we'll talk about when we talk about them. But today, today it's all over. For good luck, smash that like button and down below, comment what project I should take on first after we take on the dragon. Of course, other than like, go find a better base and, you know, things like that. So, supplies, supplies. We gotta take a look at supplies before we head over to the end. A couple episodes back, we built this set of armor. This set of armor is going to be more than good enough for taking on the Ender Dragon. Like two episodes back specifically, we made these potions right here. Three potions of slow falling. I think hopefully that's gonna be more than enough. Technically speaking, just about every single one of these supplies is optional. But when it comes to potions, I highly recommend getting at least the potion of slow falling. A couple other great potions to have could be night vision or invisibility. They might help big time. 
Oh, and I almost forgot, before we get too far into the episode, this is episode number 20. Usually I do world download every 5 or 10 episodes for channel members, but this episode, there's not going to be a download. For more info on that, tap the join button right next to subscribe, and I, I promise it'll make more sense as to why we're going to do things that way next episode. You'll see. Now, it's actually kind of interesting. When it comes to taking down the dragon, of course, if you could get a good sword, like ideally even gooder than this one right here, well, that'd be whatever's better than good. When it comes to our enchanting luck in this world, look, I'm, I mean, look, I haven't had it the absolute worst in the world, but also I'm not expecting something insanely good. If I could see like a little bit of smite, maybe like smite four, we'll go ahead and roll it over. I have a couple extra levels. If I could get smite four, I could combine these swords together and get smite five. Or alternatively, I could just take fire aspect two. And wow, actually that's not bad. Not great for what I want to do today, but not bad. I think I'll disenchant it anyways. And sadly, it looks like that was a complete total in whole waste. Real quick though, while we're here, let's check out a helmet. And maybe we can finally complete the set of armor with the protection three on breaking three helmet. I mean, it's a start. When taking on the Ender Dragon inside of your world, having a good sword is a great thing, but maybe even more importantly, get a good bow. And speaking of a good bow, oh baby, power five on breaking three flame and infinity. Jack Harbo, my sweet lad, you're gonna carry me through this dragon fight today. And for the most part, if we can just stay away from the dragon, it's gonna make our fight a whole lot easier. Another great thing to have is much better food than sweet berries. If you have something like steak or pork, then that's gonna be absolutely amazing. Chicken could do too. It all gets into the nitty gritty details here, but long story short, different foods restore different amounts of hunger, but also different amounts of saturation. As you start to run around, jump, take damage, do things, your saturation is gonna basically decrease. No offense to the sweet berries, but they're not great for today. Bring a couple stacks of extra blocks with you. Now, sometimes if you're unlucky, the dragon will send you into the air. If you can catch your fall just like that with water, you'll take zero fall damage. Alternatively, a slow falling potion, baby. We're gonna grab a couple more ender pearls for the dragon fight. That'll help us do a dodge move. And then finally, is something that I actually don't have here. Hopefully I'll be able to find it on the way over to the dragon. Now today, as a nice little added bonus, I'm gonna show you a handy little trick that you could call bed cycling or bed bombing today. To pull that one off, we're gonna need a little bit of extra beds. If your hopes and dreams is to take out the dragon all the way with beds, then maybe get a couple more. If you just wanna decrease its health real quick, then like, to be honest, maybe four extra beds should be good. If you're gonna do this whole bed cycling stuff, you will need at least one block of obsidian as well. And so, my inventory, all of the supplies that I'm gonna bring with me to take on the dragon, is gonna look something like this right here. Minus one important thing that's really, to be honest, not that important. Gather these things, and then head off to your local stronghold. Hmm, the map's maps. I need to take a second and figure this map out. Is this map the map with perhaps the stronghold on it? Because if it is, I wanna bring it. Ah, aha! It very well might be. All right, let's do this. Flashback Rewind. In the last episode, we not only located the first stronghold of this world, but I also talked about some handy little tricks that might help you when finding the thing. We looted it, all of that kind of great stuff. Long story short, I found a stronghold and it's like the best one ever. On my long journey back home last episode, I built something handy. Haha, <laughs> well, 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 look at this. I got a little fancy with the lilies over here. I got a fancy bridge cutting right over to the village that we found way earlier on and even better. Whew, clean parkour. I cleared that boy. It was really nice, but I, I think that's also maybe enough showing off for me. Oh, 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 perfect timing. This thing right here. We're going to go ahead and use shears on that, turn it into a jack-o'-lantern, and pick that up. Jack-o'-lantern, sweet friend, you're coming with me. And pumpkin seeds, I don't really need you right now, but you know what, fine. You can come with me too, whatever. Little life hack for you lads, if you didn't know, you could put a carved pumpkin on your head. It kind of ruins your whole FOV. You could remove it with a texture pack though. When the pumpkin is on your head, you could stare at Enderman all the morning, night, day low. They will never get mad at you. It's nice. Nah, but how could I? I haven't even introduced the main star of the show today. The Ender Dragon, aka Gene. Minecraft's first boss, and maybe potentially Minecraft's main boss. The main point of going to the end is, of course, meet the Ender Dragon, take it out, and open up the end for exploration, building, and maybe even more. The Ender Dragon fight, our boss battle today, is going to take place in an arena known as the Central End Island. The Central End Island has a handful of obsidian pillars with life regenerating crystals on top of it. Only these crystals don't regenerate our life, the dragon's life. 
We'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of the fight as we take on the fight. But long story short, as soon as we enter into the end dimension, the boss battle will begin immediately. We'll have a boss bar up at the top of the screen tracking the progress of the fight. Then we'll have an evil dragon flying around in the sky trying to attack us the whole time. There's going to be a couple different stages of the fight. After we take on the Ender Dragon, even more of Minecraft has opened up for us. There's cool new gear, cool new blocks, and a whole lot more to explore and talk about. Kind of beautifully, to be honest. Check out the map. The Stronghold is actually definitely fully located on the second map right here. That's kind of awesome. But anyway, once you've eventually found your Stronghold and are gearing up for the Dragon Fight, the very first thing you're going to want to do is, of course, locate the Portal Room. Inside of our Stronghold here, we actually kind of got really, really lucky. The Portal Room is like straight off from the entrance by Jans. Now, right before the Portal Room, not always, but usually, I find that there's this big open square room right here or something like it nearby. Inside of this large, somewhat echoey, big, spacious room here, there's so much room for so much, including potentially, maybe, a small emergency base camp. Most importantly, with a bed that you lock your spawn at temporarily. Just in case anything terribly unfortunate happens inside of the end here, in a couple minutes, we're gonna have a bed set inside of this stronghold. Inside of this small little stronghold room here, I'm gonna drop a couple different supplies and basically some other things that I don't really need right now. Technically not necessary, but definitely a great idea. Just in case something bad happens, if the dragon takes us out, all of our stuff is gonna be thrown on the ground, as long as they don't fall into the void. If that is the case and my bed is right here, I could easily jump right back into the fight and pick all that stuff up. Maybe if I lose all of my stuff and I wanna take out the dragon still, I have a little bit of extra supplies, so maybe like, I don't know, I guess make a sword or something. Really, to be honest, this isn't enough for that. But really, to be honest, that's not enough for that, and I don't plan for failure anyways. Now, the very next thing we need to do before we go to the end is situate the hotbar situation. On our hotbar right here, 100% have all of the weapons that you'll be using in the fight. Before we enter the end here, we're going to need to get the hotbar ready, but we're also going to need to get the portal itself ready. Over here, the portal. Right now, currently, it's not open. To open up the portal, we take Eye of Ender and place them in all of the open slots. When you find your portal, it could have multiple Eye of Ender, none, or maybe even almost all of them in here. All of them are in there right now, and it's wonderful. We get this ominous boot. Now this is open and ready to go. As soon as I jump into that, the fight begins. When I take on the Ender Dragon, I like to have my inventory looking a little bit something like this. The only reason the Obsidian is right here, queued up next to the beds, is because of a little trick that I'm going to show you. It's potentially dangerous but potentially really overpowered. Wait, what do you mean? Nervously stalling, talking about the inventory? No, it couldn't be me, absolutely none. It's time, friends, let's do this. When you're ready for the fight, walk up to the portal and jump in. As soon as you jump in, advancement, and you're gonna be dropped on a platform. Now this platform is gonna be sitting somewhere. It might be floating out of the open, or if you're lucky like me, very fortunate, it will be closed in a small room. Immediately, what you need to start doing if you're in a small room is dig a staircase up. Hopefully, this staircase is going to go straight towards the center of the island. Mathematically, you're looking for 0, 0. Dead center of the fight is going to be 0, 0. So if you're worried about it, uh, yeah, check out a quartz. But, haha, <laughs> typically I find when you jump into the end, you should be facing the center anyways. All right, now, just in case we get swarmed or anything bad, I'm going to go ahead and leave that staircase alone and put a pillar right there. That's going to show me that if I need to run away, I can run away and hide there. Not that that's really going to do me much good, though. Immediately, as we enter the end, we have Endermen all over the place. We need to not look at them. We also have pillars, and sitting on top of the pillars, as you can kind of see over there, we've got crystals floating. Now, really quick here, I'm going to run over to the center of the island and set up for something big and dangerous. The whole time I'm running around, we're going to have an Ender Dragon in the sky flying around. It will shoot fireballs at me and try and harm me. It's not great. To set up for a handy little bed move, we're going to place a block of obsidian right there. These ones are technically not necessary, so I'll pull them out. To set up even more for this handy little trick, I'm going to put a bed right there. But I'm not really going to want to trigger this bed until I start taking out the crystals. You see these crystals right here, when the dragon gets close to them, they're going to regen this thing's health. And by the way, the health is at the top of the screen. The ender dragon's health is a total of what I believe is 200. Ender dragon step number one. You shoot it if you want, but more importantly, we need to take out the crystals at the top of these pillars. The whole time we try and do this, the dragon's gonna shoot this at us. It's called Dragon's Breath. If you were curious, watch what happens when I touch the Dragon Breath. Yeah, don't touch the Dragon Breath. If possible, for the majority of the dragon fight, to avoid being sent off the side of the island, which is into a dead endless void where you will lose all of your items, try and stay in between the crystals. Staying in between the crystals here, we're gonna wanna run around and try and dodge the dragon, keeping an eye on what it's doing. Currently just flying around and shooting balls of breath at me. 
We're gonna run around and take out every single crystal with our bow here. Which, yeah, by the way, bow. Very important for this fight. If we get our aiming just right, perfectly, the first time, kind of like that, we will take out a crystal streamlessly, seamlessly. Oh, it's beautiful. Um, that's gonna do it? No, okay. Well, this is gonna do it. No, that's not gonna do it. That was a joke. That one's gonna do it. Okay, that's not gonna do it either. Hey, an edit pearl. Thank you. Yeah, so side note, one thing to keep in mind, this dragon's breath will not only damage you, but also damage Enderman. Use that knowledge to your advantage if you want. One dead giveaway is the dragon. When it gets close enough to a pillar, a beam will come out of it. That beam is basically the life-regenerating force. From the looks of things, I think I'm just severely struggling with that pillar up there. Oh, I take it back. Haha. <laughs> All right, so at this point in the fight, I, I guess I got an insanely lucky. The dragon really hasn't circled in the center and tried to land quite yet. That's one of the big things it's gonna do though, eventually. Every single time you move into the end, there will be a total of two crystals that are caged. You got a couple different options when it comes to taking out the caged crystals. In my opinion, the most handy way to take them out, you line yourself up with a corner, something like this, and then you shoot a shot right into the corner. Keep an eye on the dragon, it's doing nothing. You could pillar up to the top of these things, break a couple bars, but if you can get your shot just right, you can explode the crystals just like that. Piece of cake. Now look at this. The dragon is landing over towards the center. Really quick, I'm gonna move in here with all the crystals gone and tap that bed. You see that explosion? I just dealed a massive amount of damage to the dragon's health. That's huge health. When the dragon has landed in the middle, you need to be careful. If you want to deal damage, the bow's not gonna work anymore. You shoot at it all you want, but it's just immune to the bow. You need to get up close and hit it with your sword. To deal the most damage, hit its head. To dodge the dragon, move to the side. All right, so just like that, the dragon sits in the middle for a little bit of time or until you deal about 25 damage to it, and then it flies back into the air. Before it flies back into the air, it will charge you. If you could use ender pearls or just maybe run to the side, you can get away from it. Oh, Gene, oh, Gene, old Gene. At this point in the fight, I think I've taken out every single crystal, which means the dragon's health is stuck at what it's stuck at. I'm gonna go ahead and queue up in the center another bed for whatever Gene, the sweet Gene, he wants to come back to the middle, which is actually not. Now, this little move that I'm doing right here is called bed cycling. If I can hit that bed as soon as the dragon's head is dead center, I'll deal the most damage to it. By hitting F3 and B on Java, I'll see all of its hit boxes. The head box, the most damaged one, is that small one. Eh, now, uh, if I wanted to, if I had a better sword, I would recommend slamming the head. Go over there, do crits and stuff, but the sword is not that great. What I'm gonna go ahead and do is drink the slow falling potion and check that. It sends me into the air, but because I have slow falling, no fall damage, ever. Hmm, jeansy jeansy, sweet sweet jeansy, what's wrong? You fly around, you're a little bit nervous, maybe embarrassed. You've never seen such a handsome lad, you say, Oh, Ah, that's too kind, really, but listen, your flattery is not going to stop me from eradicating your entire species. And look, in matter of fact, I'm gonna queue up the next bed, just to help me out, I'm sorry. If you bring potions with you to the end and you have empty bottles, use an empty bottle on this stuff to collect the dragon's breath. You could use it in potions. Ooh, now I didn't make it back over to the center soon enough. You don't really want to charge into the center and try and hit that bed. If you can't get into the middle before the dragon lands over there, don't try and run to the middle. If you touch the dragon, it'll deal a ton of damage. And to avoid the dragon, I have Ender. Ooh, just like that. Easy side move dodge. It's so nice. And so, dragon, dragon, dragon. When you're shooting your bow, it's the same thing as when it's landing. If you can hit its head, you'll deal even more damage than if you hit its body. But if you hit its body, it's damage is damage. It doesn't matter. Oh yeah, but because I didn't get this bed soon enough, I think the dragon just deleted it. Let's go ahead and wait for the dragon to get real close here. Oh, you broke it. Yeah, I'm too slow. I'm not really a speedrunner. Yeah, you see that bed trick? It's really beautiful, but maybe I need a little bit more practice. It'll deal a lot of damage, but I'm not really exactly a speedrunner. Bed cycling is a wonderful way to take out the dragon really quick, though. Super fast, too. All right, so now with the dragon back in the skies, it's back to the bow for me. All we're gonna do is run around, try and stay near the middle, dodge the fireballs, and try and hit the dragon as many times as I can consecutively. Which, from the looks of things, is like 20 in a row right now. It's not bad. When the dragon starts circling over the center, it's gonna circle, kind of like do a dramatic landing sequence. That's your chance to really flood this thing with a ton of shots. Now look, you do you, I, but me, my track record is when I run up and try and smack the dragon in the head, that's when everything bad happens. Instead, I like to wait around near the side, maybe just line up with the dragon cleanly. It'll flap for a little while, then I throw a pearl and get away without any damage. You're too easy. It's kind of funny, you see, because the Ender Dragon is Minecraft's first boss fight, and maybe like the main one to be honest, but really, it's not that bad at all. I'm taking on this boss fight in hard difficulty. 
If you take it on at different difficulties, the dragon is going to have, I think, different amounts of health and maybe deal different damages too. Sweet Jean, sweet Jean, we want to take it out. When we take out Jean, Jean will be gone forever until I resummon, which you can do as many times as you want. When we take out Jean eventually, though, we'll be rewarded with more experience than we could have ever dreamed of. Specifically from level 0, 68 level worth. Haha, <laughs> very funny. Oh, but even more beautifully, we'll get an item that we can only get from wonderful little G. Ah, uh, so I had a dragon. Once you deal that final shot to the thing, piece of cake. Goodbye, Gene. I will miss you. All of a sudden, the thing's gonna float up to the middle and beautifully experience it rains down from the sky. You run around and pick it up, and if you're at level zero, you will rock it all the way up to level 68. So now, as soon as we take out the Ender Dragon, a couple things are gonna happen. Thing number one, Dragon Egg, right up on the center. If I run up to this thing and punch it... Oh, no way. That wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> if that happens, this is gonna go right back to world spawn. But usually, hold up. Inside of a completely different world, to show you what would usually happen here. When we take out the dragon, we get a dragon egg, front and center. When you hit the dragon egg in survival, mysteriously, it's kind of like an enderman. It'll teleport away. The particles will give you a hint as to what direction it went. So from the looks of things, it looks like the egg teleported off in this general direction. It's now our job to run around and find it. Anyway, never mind it lied. It must have went to like fire or something and then teleported again immediately. I don't know. Anyways, in 100% survival Minecraft, to pick up the dragon egg is pretty simple. Using a pickaxe, we're gonna dig this block out, that block out, and that block. Not the block the egg is sitting on. Then we're gonna put a torch right here, then we're gonna break this block. The egg will fall, hit the torch, and turn to an item. Now the egg is mine, and you get an advancement too. It's kinda nice. What does the egg do though? Ooh, that's a secret for another time. We'll talk about it later. A tip for another time, I didn't even get to talk about him, the carved pumpkin. If we go ahead and put this thing on my head, look at this, I can stare cleanly at the Enderman all day long, right at their eyes. It's kind of hard to see, but yeah, I'm staring at him, and nothing's happening at all. Wait a second, what's that thing? So back inside of our world here, and something that we're absolutely not going to check out today. After we take out the dragon, for the first like 20 times, we're going to get an end gateway, that thing right there. To use the end gateway, we need to take an ender pearl and throw it clean into the portal looking thing in the middle right there. Or we'd use trap doors to crawl into it. The end gateway is the gateway to the rest of the end. Meaning like, if we go into the gateway, we can start exploring and maybe looking for an elytra. Alternatively, did you know though? You don't even have to do that. From the center end island, which is coincidentally where we are right now, about a thousand blocks straight out is going to be the rest of the end islands. Using Optifine, I can raise my render distance all the way to 64 chunks and check this out. You can actually start to see the outer end islands. It's pretty sweet. Ender Dragon, Ender Dragon, that's it though, to take out old trusty Gene, that's all you need to do. Later on, when we feel like it, we'll definitely be talking about some other handy methods that you could use to take out old Gene, and definitely how to respawn Gene as well. When it comes to respawning Miss Gene, it's gonna involve basically like the crystals on top of the pillars, but uh, like I said, we'll talk about it later. Before you leave the end for the very first time, I recommend grab the dragon egg, maybe collect up a little bit of endstone if you want to build with him, and locate your very first end gateway. Before you do anything else though, maybe it's time to head back home sweet home. To go home sweet home, jump into the portal, just like we kind of did to get here, and the credits are going to begin to roll. If we go ahead and hit the down arrow, or S, or hold down, I don't know, there's a way to speed up the credits, but this long dramatic story involves me to play her, and it gets a little bit sentimental, too emotional for today, check it out in a different video. Now when we go back into the portal, we're going to be sent back to wherever we set our spawn most recently, which for us, if you did everything just like I did, it's going to be smack dab back center and south of the stronghold. So we bet you gotta come with me. Now we are 100% because of the things that we found inside of the stronghold going to be back over to this thing at a later date and point in time. For today though, at this point, all we need to do is go find that dragon egg that I can't believe was sent back over to spawn. It's definitely not every day that the dragon egg is going to race you back to your trusty old base that you're about to abandon completely forever. Oh my god, it's actually kind of... <laughs> the final thing that I want to take care of today, friends, before we wrap up the episode is get back home sweet home, which is going to be approximately in this perfect direction. Get the dragon egg. And well, that's it. We've done it. We finished the first leg of the series. Early game is 100% officially over. And depending on your definition of it, we're in mid or maybe even early late game now. It's kind of beautiful. Anyways, emotions, that's enough of them for today. I'll meet you back over at home sweet home. While we make our long trek back home, today's comment of the day is a mind-blowingly genius one. Cram67 Cram, you absolute legend, you need to be hired by Mojang. A recipe book could make a good loot in a witch hut. This is all about the brewing stand. 
Imagine that concept. You go out into your world, you find a book, and then you add it to the workstation and it has all the knowledge. Like maybe for the crafting table, eh, not so much, but for the furnace and definitely the brewing stand 100%. Please, 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 I'm begging. And finally, after a long and treacherous journey back home, it's home sweet home. Starter base, starter base, Bonzo, everything has changed. Very soon, we'll be moving base here, Bonzo. We're gonna have a brand new mansion, a very fancy home. But first, there is something we need to take care of here at home. And also, the dragon egg. It's not likely that it will happen like it happened today, but if your dragon egg does happen to teleport right into the portal, it'll be sent right back to world spawn, which perfectly for me is, is the starter base. Then after that, once you go back to world spawn and find the thing, to actually pick it up, it's the same as it is in the end. We put a torch below it, we let it drop, and just like that, Dragon Egg and that clean advancement is now mine forever. Now you want to be careful with the Dragon Egg because when you place this thing down and hit it, it'll teleport away randomly. So maybe build like a trophy case or something cool for it. Then absolutely don't just like place it down randomly and, and, and lose it. There's only one inside of your world. And so the Ender Dragon, how to take it out, some tips and tricks, and also the very first leg of the series, early game Minecraft, that's how it's done. Next episode, I got a very special project planned in mind, so keep your eyes out for that. Smash like if you liked it, and subscribe. Thank you all so much for watching this episode, and don't worry, this series is definitely not over. This is only the beginning, where things start to get a little bit more spicy. World Download next episode, tap the join button for more information, and big shout out Patron Gang. Kaleas, Nick C, Arlo, aka Bobby Bobby, MinecraftMojo.com, and Steve M. Next up, check out last episode. It's been me, Waddles, and I will see you all tomorrow. Goodbye, friends. Lads, I can't believe it. The day is finally here. Home sweet home, but not for much longer. Cozy cottage, you carried me so far. The small farm setup, the smeltery, the beautiful brewery, and even sweet berry acres over there. <sighs> you, you've all done me so well. Sword, I love you so much. But friends, I think it's about time to move on to bigger and better things. Members, there's a world download out right now, and everybody, welcome to the next Minecraft Guide episode. In today's episode, to properly close up chapter one of the series, we're gonna finish up the base. While I finish up our base, I'm gonna talk things you need at your base when you're just about ready to move on to. Down below this video, two quick favors. There's a like button, annihilated, and down in the comments, drop one thing that you think every single base needs before it's finished. Maybe that's like lighting it up, mob proofing it. Maybe it's some beautiful buildings. Or maybe it's just maybe. A little bit of roads. Paths, they're an essential part of a base. In order to make your base easily feel a whole lot more finished, you need to put some roads in. Now we kinda got a lot of situations going on over here at our base. We got the starter house, very important. We got this building and we got the smelter. We also have the berry acre and the farm. If I could somehow come up with a path design that is simple, but connects everything, this will feel finished. Minecraft path, tips and tricks. Today we're gonna keep it simple, but honestly, we'll be talking a whole lot more about paths as we go on in this series. One of the biggest tips that I can give you for making a nice looking road is make sure it's not too straight. You see, if you make a, a road that is just like a straight shot in here, it's immediately probably gonna look a little bit less detailed than it would if you like, maybe curved it around a tree. Maybe like, I don't know, built a boulder or something and have it go around the boulder. Honestly, this is probably the biggest road hack that I could give you of all time. In Minecraft, when setting up a path, instead of having to go straight over to something, have it wind, weave, and curve a little bit. And also, before you set it up, maybe mark out that path with something like a shovel. It's super easy. If you use a shovel on a grass block, you'll get these little dots. Then you can make these like dots like wind and kind of start to get a vision as to what you want to do with your road. Vision, it's an important one. Depending on what you have going on over at your base, you're going to want to match your road to the vibe of the base. If you're building like a city, go with gray blocks. If you're going for more of a rural, humble setup, kind of like me, maybe go with that classic Minecraft path. I mean, it's trusty after all. And maybe, I don't know, maybe you want to spice it up, mix some dirt in, maybe some wood too. You got options depending on your feel of the path that you're trying to make. If you want to make it look like a proper constructed Minecraft village, make it clean, three blocks wide everywhere. Even if it's winding or whatever on the turns, keep it like, I don't know, three blocks somehow on your diagonal, I don't know, whatever you want to do. If you want to make your path feel a whole lot more alive though, instead of making it perfectly straight, maybe break some blocks out or in. So check this, this is going to be the move here. Back here we got the smeltery. We need a road coming out of the smeltery. It's going to wind over this way to something we're going to set up in a quick second here. That'll connect it to the berry farm. Then I'm going to have an eventual beautiful tall tree right there. I want to have the road curve around the tree, something like this right here. Maybe get a little bit close, but not too close, and then go this way. 
When you're setting up your path, maybe don't worry about the details too much in an area. First, figure out the shape of it by making small dots, then come back in and make it a little bit wider. After that, finally, come back in here and add the details, meaning like the parts of the path that cut out, the stuff that cuts in a little bit. So lads, you probably noticed, but if you haven't by now, you walked dead into the first of what is eventually going to become much more building episodes inside of this series. During segment one of the series, we were kind of like laying out a lot of the early game, talking about how you do things like find diamonds, maybe like, I don't know, take out a dragon. We did that last episode. There are honestly, obviously, so many different ways you can play Minecraft, but building, ooh boy, it's building and farming is one of my favorite things. Moving forward here, I keep seeing so many questions about it, but yes, in the next section of the series here, once we move over to our new base next episode, we're going to do a whole lot more building and cool things like that. I can't wait. When you're building your path, it's inevitable. Probably, most likely, for certain, at some point, you're going to want to step the thing up a little bit. A great way to step your path up if you're doing this classic Minecraft path is these slabs right here, the oak ones. They blend in like almost perfectly with the color palette. It looks really nice. When I have a step up, what I like to do is make sure my path goes all the way around that step up. Now, I think what I want to do here is I have the step up, but I also have this like cut over here. I'm going to have the path get close to the edge, but not all the way to the edge. See, it's totally your call. You gotta set a vibe of your own base. But I mean, you're also watching my video on building and detailing. So, in my opinion, paths next to the edge, big no. To fix it, all we need to do is a little bit of terraforming. Next up, we gotta step up. In order to make our step up a little bit more luscious and luxurious, Bones will be the judge, but instead of a straight step up, we'll do like a diagonal or something. I find that it looks a little bit better. Hey, correction, straight spots, I mean, they're not bad but I don't think it'll look as good as a diagonal over here. And so, for now, we're gonna go ahead and keep it simple. I just about done it. A full path that links just about all the way around the starter base. Hey, also not so fast. When doing these steps up, fill in the block down below too to make it feel even more complete. I mean, you don't have to, but it's all about the finer things, the small details here, right? If you've got a base built in your world and you want it to feel a whole lot more complete, one of the easiest things you could do is add a road that connects every building to each other. Add a road that connects every building to each other. Hi, ah, lads, we got a problem. A small little issue right here. So the road, it's in here and it's feeling pretty good until I try to go to the berry farm. When I try to go to the berry farm, I hit water, which means it's time for the first bridge of the world. First bridge of the world, look, I am unreasonably excited for this first thing. I don't know why I'm so happy and ecstatic for this moment, but bridges, something to bottom of all, they're beautiful. I got a little bit of a golden rule when it comes to bridges. If I'm building a bridge inside of my world that is five blocks or less, I limit that bridge to be one block wide or maybe two blocks wide if Bonesaw wasn't in the way. If I have a bridge that is maybe like five to ten blocks, maybe then I bump it up to two to three. If it's longer than ten blocks, I always recommend at least three blocks wide Maybe even wider, depending on how major of a bridge it is. Step number one to building a bridge is figure out where you need that bridge. I definitely need one right here. After that, you're going to want to line up your start and end points. We're going to start right over there with those pillars, and we're going to end somewhere over here with these pillars. You want to make sure your bridge lines up perfectly straightly in order to make it like look a little bit better. Bridges can be a little bit tricky to build if you're not too cut a sewer into the bridge life. To make the bridge building experience more enjoyable, start and end on the same even land. So we're gonna start right there on like, what, Y64 and end on Y64. I'll have the bridge go from there to there, then I'll pick up the path again and link it up to the path that I already set up a long time ago, right over here. Once we figured out where we need our bridge and where it's gonna go, how wide it's gonna potentially be, we need to figure out the building blocks. Make the blocks that you build your bridge out of match the buildings in the area around the bridge to make your bridge feel like it's intentional. After that, we need to figure out the shape of our bridge. Shape of our bridge. The best way to figure this out is start by marking out potential pillars. So we got the starting spot right there. Then we're gonna go maybe say two blocks out and have another one. Over on the other side of the bridge, we'll do the same thing. We wanna keep it symmetrical. We go two blocks out and have another one. After that, we got the middle, and I think almost, oh no, actually, exactly perfectly. We could go three blocks on that side, three blocks, and have the central pillar. That's gonna mean this bridge is like kinda decently long, but I think that'll work out. When setting up your bridge, try and make everything symmetrical, and also try and keep your gaps like scaling upwards, if that makes sense. So like, we start with a gap of two, and between those two, then we step up to three. We don't do like three, and then two, and, and then one, or something like that. Stripped birch, I don't know what it is. There's something about this area, but I think I kind of, I've low-key fallen in love with this stuff. 
After that, I think what I want to do is maybe like set this up with staircases, but we have a problem. If you're going to set your bridge up, definitely don't have your side pillars be even with your staircases. Doesn't necessarily have to be like a full block though. Could be like a slab or something. After that, what I think I want to do with my bridge here is have it gradually step upwards. So we start with a, like a big step. We do staircases. Then we could do like slabs or something. Maybe to like this pillar and I can step up again. Then I could do like, I have a step of two. Maybe this will be a step of three. After that, if I stepped up again, I would have a middle step of three. Don't really love that. So instead, we'll do this one as like maybe five blocks long and this will be two. So we'll go staircase, then two, then two, then five. Then keep it symmetrical and do the same thing on the other side. So at this point in our bridge build today, I would say we have something that looks quite nice. I mean, it's still lacking a lot of the finer details, but it's not bad. I got some cross supports in the middle connecting these pillars that are going up and down, and then I have the shape of the floor. But up here on the floor, instead of just fully filling it in with slabs, which would definitely technically work, I think we could do maybe a couple trap doors in here to maybe spice it up a little bit more. However, if we're gonna come in here with trap doors, we need to take into account how like slabs actually work. That'll mean, unfortunately, on this first step, maybe a trap door will look a little bit weird, unless, of course, we want to pull that out and put a staircase right there. If I did a staircase, the trap door looks a little bit better. But, oh, baby, 100% for certain. Top of this thing, in the middle, it's trap doors. Trap doors look so good on bridges. So, for today, an intro to bridge building, there we go, that's just about it. As I finish up this bridge, the vital pointer that I have for you is to not worry about safety too much. It sounds like it might be a little bit weird, but trust me, if you're overly fixated on making it so like it's impossible to fall off the side of a bridge, then it might kind of ruin the aesthetics. If you want the bridge to look good, maybe just build what feels good and try to not step off the side. To see if I was trying to make this bridge 100% safe, I would have to come in and do even more fences higher up. And to be honest, I might kind of kill the vibe. So for aesthetics, don't overly fixate on safety and to fully finish up the bridge, don't forget those blocks right there. For today, for this simple bridge to get to the sweet berry farm and the road over to it, that's just about good. A huge part about finishing a base up is making sure you can get to everything easily. Then get to everything easily. We got a portal out there on an island. Instead of building a big bridge connecting this spot to that spot, I think what I'll do is I'll build a couple docks. Building a simple dock is really simple, and if you could build a bridge, well, great news. All you have to do is really build like half of the bridge here. What we're going to do is uh, same thing. We're going to start out with some pillars going out into the water, maybe something like that. I'm going to go ahead and strip these pillars because that is a horrendous looking texture. Can't use that. Then after that, I'm going to come up with some kind of block that I want to use as the proper footing, the walking part of the dock. I'm going to have this footing go out to where bones are like to stand. Bruh. We'll have our boards go out this way, of course, into the water and then continue. Now I've hit a predicament because unfortunately I need one more uh, pillar right there. It's two right there. It's going to go two more, but I ran out of birch logs. I'll be right back. On my docks here, when I'm building them, I like to keep them nice, small, and simple. I find that they look a little bit better. Kind of a fun thing that you can do with your docks if you have to add one to your base is if you have like a beach, kind of like I have here, instead of having like maybe terraform the land over to the water, have the dock run across the beach a little bit. I found that it could look kind of cool and maybe add a little bit of detail to your beach line. When building a small dock, fences are a great thing that you could add to it to make it look nice and detailed. Though really for any build, to be honest. To finish off my small little dock over here, just like I did for the one over there, I'll add a couple torches to it, those look nice. Maybe to hit that fishing dock vibe, a barrel. And then finally, to finish everything off, a boat as well. If you end your dock one half slab above the water, it's really easy to use. Let's say I was like sailing around and I wanted to come back over to the base and land. All I have to do is sail the boat up right against this thing, jump out of the boat, I'll be standing on the boat, and you can walk right over to the dock. It's like streamlined, seamless, perfect. Now next up, we got a great opportunity for something really cool looking here at spawn. Over there, we've got an island with just a nether portal on it. What if we had the nether spill out of the portal? And like a nether themed dock over there too. Ooh, that looked good. And so that's it. Friends, 100% that's what we're gonna do. Over here on the island, to make this portal look a little bit more intriguing, especially from a distance, let's change the land. Now this, to be honest, it starts to get into a little bit more like terraforming and advanced detailing techniques, but long story short, I'm gonna take nethery blocks, the blocks that I actually wanna have here, and swap out the exact blocks in the land. That's how I'm gonna start at least. Not necessarily entirely, but for the most part here, I'm going to try my best to stick to the exact shape of the land that we already have here. 
I only want the nether to spill out into the overworld, though. I don't want it 100% to convert over. So what I'm going to do is kind of taper it out. Meaning, like, at some point here, probably once we start to get a little bit farther away from the portal, the nether blocks are going to stop, and the overworld blocks are going to stay. I'll also have it hang into the water a little bit. This is not something I'll notice very much, but I think it'll look cool. For the nether dock, oh, it's easy. No, almost too easy. We got all this nether wood I haven't used quite yet. And finally, to finish it up, we got nether brick as well. I think nether brick fences could look really, really good here. And this time, we'll have them curve and maybe cut right down into the water. Now, only because we don't really have any trees over here, I think we could do with a little bit of fire too. Because of that, that's going to be the closest tree. If I keep like maybe a couple sources of fire, if I could do like maybe one final one right there, I don't think anything will be able to burn down. I don't want any forest fires here. Now over on this side of the island, because we do start to get a little bit farther away from the nether portal, I don't want to put too much. Maybe like a couple geodes, like rocks that were maybe harvested over from the nether and brought here for like, I don't know, science or whatever I was doing before. To mob proof the rest of this island, we'll put a torch. And then actually, speaking of mob proofing, that's huge. So we've got docks, bridges, and paths all over the place. I gotta add one more dock, I'll do it a little bit later on. But now it's nighttime. If you want to talk about one of the single biggest things that I think every base needs before you fully finish it and leave it, that's going to be mob proofing the entire base. To mob proof the base, wait until it's nighttime. At nighttime, grab torches and something to put the torches on. It could be walls, it could be fences, it could be whatever you want to do. I think cobblestone walls would add a nice touch of gray into the base. What we'll do here is start by running along the path and dropping a torch down on top of a wall every once in a while, specifically when it starts to look a little bit dark. Nowadays, Minecraft 1.20, all you need to do is make sure the light is not zero anywhere inside of your base and no mobs will spawn at all. That's going to make it actually like really, really easy. If you find an area of your base that looks suspiciously dark, like maybe on top of the bridge over here, place the torch down, it lights up a little bit, and then you're probably good. That's like basically all you need to do. The areas of this base that I would like to make sure are 100% mob proof, no mob spawns are going to happen, is going to be anywhere along the path, really where I'm like moving. I'd like to, if something unfortunate, oh, that's beautiful tree. <laughs> that's so good. I'd like to, if something unfortunate happens, be able to pop back over at base and, like, not worry about a creeper doubling up on me and tag teaming me, you know? The good old-fashioned torch sitting on top of a wall. I, I will be honest, it's not, like, the fanciest way to light up your base, but it is by far the easiest early game before you have an iron farm way to light up your base. If you'd like to, like you want to make things extra safe, you could even go a little bit beyond, like off into the forest near your base too and light that up. I think for me personally, because I don't really plan on running around very much here at nighttime, or really even being here too much in general, really what I just lit up should be more than good enough. There's a couple stray torches sitting on the ground that I want to pick up and put on a wall, just make it look nicer, but I think that's pretty good. There are, of course, so many other lighting tricks, but those are things we'll talk about later on. Finishing a base in Minecraft is one of those tricky things because realistically, a base could theoretically never be over. Like, you could finish everything at your base and come up with another idea and keep adding to it and adding to it and adding to it. I went ahead and added another docket over there right next to our zombie farm. I think that's a great build opportunity, so I'm not going to do too much else over there. I'll just keep it in mind and maybe come back over to it later. With all of this stuff set up over at our base, the docks, the roads, the bridges, and even all of the lighting, we're actually just about done. At this point in the game, the very final thing left to get in around the entire base is going to be more like the minor details. You see, one of the greatest ways to make a base feel fully whole and finished and complete is to make it come alive. You can make this base come alive in multiple different ways. One of my favorite ways to make a base come alive and feel fully done is with plants. I personally love plants. In real life, in the game, anything. Plants are great. They're wonderful. Not only are these buddies all over the place going to help purify the oxygen a little bit, making it better to breathe and maybe like, I don't know, I guess our health will feel faster. But also, depending on the type of plants you come in around your base and add to it, they might add a little bit of color to your base, or at the least, a little bit more detail. Take this empty field, for example. This is like pretty plain, kind of boring looking. What if I like made it a small flower garden? Or like maybe the areas out front of my house, kind of like I already did. I put some leaves. Bushes are a great detail to add into an area. Then I put flowers and now I'm running around and putting the actual bush in the game. If you're going to add sweet berries to your base, a little pro tip, uh, maybe don't like put them too close to a path or like in the way or anything because the damage is really annoying. When I add things like bushes specifically, I kind of like to cluster them around things that I already have going. So like I have a tree, maybe I have a couple bushes by the tree or like a building, a couple bushes by the building, the dock, you know, that kind of vibe. 
bone meal, specifically bones. I was so fortunate to find a skeleton spawner a couple episodes ago, and from that spawner, I got a couple skeletons. With a little bit of bone meal, we can level our base up big time. Right back here, I have a little bit of roses. We bone meal them. After that, we could take these roses, the tall flowers, and sprinkle them in. Again, maybe next to trees or just in other open areas that don't have much. It's going to add color to your base. When adding flowers or other decorations to an area, I recommend not going too crazy, though. Don't, like, pick every single type of flower in Minecraft and drop it down. Maybe pick a couple colors that you want to add. So for me, I'm doing, like, red. So sweet berries, maybe roses. A little bit of white in there, that's cool looking, too. Another beautiful little one that I always knew the importance of, but really realized more recently, as in like in the survival series, is trees. Put trees around your base, whether it's like the natural tree or a different type of tree that you grow in the area. Try coming in and adding some trees to your base, specifically, like if possible, get them to cover your path up a little bit to make it feel a whole lot more vibey. Now the tree one, it could be a little bit of a trial and error. First cherry tree, it went the wrong way, didn't really like it. Also, to make sure your trees aren't in the way, maybe like build up a couple blocks and then try and grow your tree. I mean, usually it's not really much of a problem with the cherry trees. They're pretty tall as is, but with other trees, like maybe birch trees, if you're adding those into your base, those could be like a little bit too short. This is a handy little tree hack that we talked about earlier on. If you're short on bone meal, maybe place an oak sapling with this little brace right there and give it a little bit of time. Hopefully, eventually, that tree will grow into a big, strong, beautiful oak tree like that one right there. If not, it might end up being like a little bit smaller like that. Uh, you can always chop it down and try again. Or if you have a lot of bone meal, you can just bone meal it like crazy until it grows. But I don't want to do that. Speaking of bone meal, though, if you've got big, empty areas, run around with a little bit of bone meal and maybe bone meal those areas. Get the grass back in there if it went away. Adding a tiny bit of grass to an area will add so much detail to it and also make it feel more done. Now, one thing is, when you bone meal, you might get other random colors of flowers. Uh, if they're killing the vibe, you know, pull the flowers out, but I don't really have too much color going on. It's not like an overload, so I think a couple yellow daisies in here. Yeah, like, that'll look nice. It's cool. When it comes to detailing your base, oh boy, this is something we're going to talk about in every single episode where I'm building. Another nice detail that you could add is rocks. These rocks could be big, giant boulders, or they could be a little bit smaller, just like a slab every once in a while. Make it out of cobblestone, andesite, maybe even smooth stone, and it'll look nice, kind of blend in. I think that adding rocks to an area makes it feel a whole lot more real, too. Like, you walk around for one second outside, you're, you're bound to see a rock or something. Adding things like this in occasionally, every once in a while around your base, maybe even making them a little bit mossy, too. Whew. A couple of other things that you could add to your base to add more detail. Random blocks, like workstations specifically. They're so interesting looking. Maybe do like a compost or spice it up with signs or even like a chest. Chests are cool too. Speaking of random blocks and chests and stuff, I guess it wasn't really a good segue, but like labels. This isn't really much of a label. It's more of a gateway. But if I... Well, hold on. Let me show you. Or kind of like this. There's a label, a sign. Hmm. Interesting. The berry collection. Nice. The signs, whether it's hanging or normal, are a relatively interesting looking block. Like, you place it down and the model itself is already pretty cool looking. You can put it on the side of something and label it. Like, let's say, zombie spawner dead ahead. Then we can spice it up with a couple little dashes and equals. And yeah, you know, not too bad looking. The signs are a pretty cool way to not only label things if you're going to have other people check out your stuff, but also just add more subtle, minor details here. I got them over there. I got it over here. And I even got it over here too. Honestly, when it comes to the details, that's where you could really go crazy. There are so many different things you could do to detail your base and bring it up to make it a little bit more alive. <sighs> so back to spawn for one final time, home sweet home. Going forward in this series, next episode, we're going to set out on a big adventure and find a brand new spot to live. This spot, though, I hope to hopefully eventually come back over to it. I wanted to spend a lot of time detailing in today's episode to make it feel good so it feels fully finished for you guys in the download, but also, like, I, I want to do things differently this world. I don't want to, like, pick one proper base and only build there forever. Instead, I'm thinking maybe we'll build, like, a main base, of course, but also maybe some more outposts with useful things by it. For example, this one, the big use here, this is going to be the berry farm, but also that zombie spawn. And, of course, that cool portal. That's what I'm thinking, but anyways, today's comment of the day. For today's comment of the day, we're over to the most beautiful subreddit, r slash waddles. Lego waddles. I was born and built this boy, and he watches on the desk. Oh my gosh, chef's kiss. This thing is magnificent, marvelous, and beautiful. I don't think I've ever seen a more better, more beautiful Lego creation ever. That's perfect. Thank you. Down below in the comments, drop one thing that you think every base needs to be fully finished. And thank you all so much for watching this episode. 
Chapter 1 of the Minecraft Guide, the very early game, all the way from the start, the scratch, founder's tree, up to the dragon. And we made some friends along the way, so we'd bone so. Camelotl over there, Camelot. I can't wait for this next chapter. What would you like to see in the next leg of the series? Humble spawn starter base. I think it's just about checked on. Other than that tree, if it would ever grow. And thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed. It's Ben B. Waters. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye.